Section one of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January two thousand fourteen. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume two. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century. By Jules Verne. First part, chapter one, part one, astronomers and cartographers. Cassini, Picard and La Hire, the Arc of the Meridian and the Map of France, G. de Lille and Danville, the Shape of the Earth, Maupertuis in Lapland, Condamine at the Equator. Before we enter upon a recital of the great expeditions of the eighteenth century, we shall do well to chronicle the immense progress made during that period by the sciences. They rectified a crowd of prejudices and established a solid basis for the labors of astronomers and geographers. If we refer them solely to the matter before us, they radically modified cartography and ensured for navigation a security hitherto unknown although galileo had observed the eclipses of jupiter's satellites as early as sixteen ten his important discovery had been rendered useless by the indifference of governments the inadequacy of instruments and the mistakes committed by his followers in sixteen sixty jean dominique cassini published his tables of the satellites of jupiter which induced colbert to send for him in the following year and which obtained for him the superintendence of the paris observatory in the month of july sixteen seventy one philippe de la hire went to uraniborg in the island of huen to take observations for the situation of tycho brahe's observatory in that spot he calculated with the assistance of cassini's tables and with an exactitude never before obtained the difference between the longitudes of paris and uraniborg the academy of sciences sent the astronomer jean richter the same year to cayenne to study the parallaxes of the sun and moon and to determine the distance of mars and venus from the earth this voyage which was entirely successful was attended with unforeseen consequences and resulted in inquiries shortly after entered into as to the shape of the earth richter noticed that the pendulum lost two minutes twenty eight seconds at cayenne which proved that the momentum was less at this place than at paris from this fact newton and huygens deduced the flatness of the globe at the poles shortly afterwards however the computation of a terrestrial degree given by abbe picard and the determination of the meridional arc arrived at by the cassinis father and son led scientific men to an entirely different result and induced them to consider the earth an elliptical figure elongated towards the polar regions passionate discussions arose from this decision and in them originated immense undertakings from which astronomical and mathematical geography profited picard undertook to estimate the space contained between the parallels of amiens and malvoisine which comprises a degree and a third the academy however decided that a more exact result could be obtained by the calculation of a greater distance and determined to portion out the entire length of france from north to south in degrees for this purpose they selected the meridian line which passes the paris observatory this gigantic trigonometrical undertaking was commenced twenty years before the end of the seventeenth century was interrupted and recommenced and finally finished towards seventeen twenty at the same time louis the fourteenth urged by colbert gave orders for the preparation of a map of france men of science undertook voyages from sixteen seventy nine to sixteen eighty two and by astronomical observations found the position of the coasts on the ocean and mediterranean but even these undertakings, because computation of the meridional arc, 
the calculations which determined the latitude and longitude of certain large cities in france and a map which gave the environs of paris in detail with geometrical exactitude were still insufficient data for a map of france as in the measurement of the meridional arc the only course to adopt was to cover the whole extent of the country with a network of triangles such was the basis of the large map of france which justly bears the name of cassini the result of the early observations of cassini and la Hire was to restrict france within much narrower limits than had hitherto been assigned to her despro cooley in his history of voyages says quote, they deprived her france of several degrees of longitude in the length of her western coast from brittany to the bay of biscay and in the same way retrenched about half a degree from languedoc and la provence End quote. these alterations gave rise to a bon mot louis the fourteenth in complimenting the academicians upon their return remarked i am sorry to see gentlemen that your journey has cost me a good part of my kingdom so far however cartographers had ignored the corrections made by astronomers in the middle of the seventeenth century peresque and gassendi had corrected upon the maps of the mediterranean a difference of five hundred miles of distance between marseilles and alexandria jean mathieu de chazelle who had assisted cassini in his labours was sent to the levant to draw up a coast chart for the mediterranean it was sufficiently clear say the memoirs of the academy of sciences that the maps unduly extended the continents of europe africa and america and narrowed the pacific ocean between asia and europe these errors had caused singular mistakes during m de chaumont's voyage when he went as louis the fourteenth's ambassador to siam the pilots trusting to their charts were mistaken in their calculations and both in going and in returning went a good deal further than they imagined in proceeding from the cape of good hope to the island of java they imagined themselves a long way from the strait of sunda when in reality they were more than sixty leagues beyond it and they were forced to put back for two days with a favourable wind to enter it in the same way upon their return voyage from the cape of good hope to france they found themselves at the island of flores the most western of the azores when they conceived themselves to be at least a hundred and fifty leagues eastward of it they were obliged to navigate for twelve days in an easterly direction in order to reach the french coast as we have already said the corrections made in the map of france were considerable it was recognized that perpignan and collioure more especially were far more to the east than had been supposed to gain a fair idea of the alteration one has only to glance at the map of france published in the first part of the seventh volume of the memoirs of the academy of sciences all the astronomical observations to which we have called attention are noted in it and the original outline of the map published by sanson in sixteen seventy nine makes the modification apparent cassini was right in saying that cartography was no longer at its height as a science in reality sanson had blindly followed the longitudes of ptolemy without taking any note of astronomical observations his sons and grandsons had simply re-edited his maps as they were completed and other geographers followed the same course william de lille was the first to construct new maps and to make use of modern discoveries he arbitrarily rejected all that had been done before this time his enthusiasm was so great that he had entirely carried out his project at the age of twenty-five his brother joseph nicholas who taught astronomy in russia sent william materials for his maps at the same time his younger brother de l'ile de la Cayère, visited the coast of the arctic ocean and astronomically fixed the position of the most important points he embarked on board the bering's vessel and died at kamchatka that was the work of the three de l'ile but to william belongs the glory of having revolutionized geography 
he succeeded says cooley in reconciling ancient and modern computations and in collecting an immense mass of documents instead of limiting his corrections to any one quarter of the earth he directed them to the entire globe by this means he earned the right to be considered the founder of modern geography peter the great on his way to paris paid a tribute to his merit by visiting him and placing at his disposal all the information he himself possessed of the geography of russia could there be a more conclusive testimony to his worth than this from a stranger and if french geographers are excelled in these days by those of germany and england is it not consolatory and encouraging to them to know that they have excelled in a science in which they are now struggling to regain their former superiority delisle lived to witness the success of his pupil j b d'anville if the latter is inferior to adrian valois in the matter of historical science he deserved his high fame for the relative improvement of his outlines and for the clear and artistic appearance of his maps it is difficult says m e desjardins in his geographie de la gaule romaine to understand the slight importance which has been attributed to his works as a geographer mathematicians and draughtsman the latter more especially do justice to his great merit d'anville was the first to construct a map by scientific methods and that of itself is sufficient glory in the department of historical geography d'anville exhibited unusual good sense in discussion and a marvellous topographical instinct for identifications but it is well to remember that he was neither a man of science nor even well versed in classic authorities his most beautiful work is his map of italy the dimensions of which hitherto exaggerated extended from the east to the west in accordance with the ideas of the ancients in seventeen thirty five philippe bouache whose name as a geographer is justly celebrated inaugurated a new method in his chart of the depths of the english channel by using contour levels to represent the variations of the soil ten years later the pre de manvillette published his neptune oriental in which he rectified the charts of the african chinese and indian coasts he added to it a nautical guide which was the more precious at this period as it was the first of the kind up to the close of his life he amended his manual which served as a guide for all french naval officers during the latter part of the eighteenth century of english astronomers and physicists halley was the chief he published a theory of magnetic variations and a history of the monsoons which gained for him the command of a vessel that he might put his theory into practice that which d'apre achieved for the french alexander dalrymple accomplished for the english his views however bordered on the hypothetical and he believed in the existence of an antarctic continent he was succeeded by horsberg whose name is justly dear to navigators we must now speak of two important expeditions which ought to have settled the animated discussion as to the shape of the earth the academy of sciences had dispatched a mission to america to compute the arc of the meridian at the equator it was composed of Godin, Bouguer, and La Condamine. It was decided to entrust a similar expedition to the north, to Montparteuil. If, said this scientific man, the flatness of the earth be not greater than Huygens supposed, the margin between the degrees of the meridian imperfection of instruments. But if the observation can be made at the pole, the difference between the first degree of the meridian nearest the equatorial line and for example the sixty-sixth degree which crosses the polar circle will be great enough even by huygens hypothesis to show itself irresistibly and beyond the possibility of miscalculation because the difference would be repeated just as many times as there are intermediate degrees the problem thus neatly propounded ought to have obtained a ready solution both at the pole and the equator 
a solution which would have settled the discussion by proving Huygens and Newton to be right. The expedition embarked in a vessel equipped at Dunkerque. In addition to Maupertuis, it comprised De Clairaut, Camus, and Le Monnier, academicians, Albé Autier, canon of Bayeux, a secretary named Sommereux, a draughtsman, Herbelot, and the scientific Swedish astronomer, Celsius. When the King of Sweden received the members of the mission at Stockholm, he said to them, I have been in many bloody battles, but I should prefer finding myself in the midst of the most sanguinary rather than join your expedition. Certainly it was not likely to prove a party of pleasure. The learned adventurers were to be tested by difficulties of every kind, by continued privation, by excessive cold. But what comparison can be made between their sufferings, and the agonies, the trials, and the dangers which were to be encountered by the Arctic explorers, Ross, Perry, Hall, Payer, and many others? Damiron, in his Eulogy of Maupertuis, says, the houses at Tornia, north of the Gulf of Bosnia, almost in the Arctic Circle, are hidden under the snow. When one goes out, the air seems to pierce the lungs, the increasing degrees of frost are proclaimed by the incessant crackling of the wood, of which most of the houses are built. From the solitude which reigns in the streets, one might fancy that the inhabitants of the town were dead. At every step one meets mutilated figures, people who have lost arms or legs from the terrible severity of the temperature. And yet the travellers did not intend pausing at Tornia. Nowadays these portions of the globe are better known, and the region of the Arctic climate thoroughly appreciated, which makes it easier to estimate the difficulties the inquirers encountered. They commenced their operations in July 1736. Beyond Tornia they found only uninhabited regions. They were obliged to rely upon their own resources for scaling the mountains, where they placed the signals intended to form the uninterrupted series of triangles. Divided into two parties in order to thus obtain two measurements instead of one, and thereby also to diminish the chance of mistakes, the adventurous savants, after inconceivable hair-breadth escapes, of which an account can be found in the memoirs of the Academy of Sciences for 1737, and after incredible efforts, decided that the length of the meridian circle, comprised between the parallels of Tornia and Kittis, was fifty five thousand twenty three fathoms and a half thus below the polar circle the meridian degree comprised a thousand fathoms more than cassini had imagined and the terrestrial degree exceeded by three hundred seventy seven fathoms the length which Picard has reckoned it between paris and amiens the result therefore of this discovery a result long repudiated by the Cassinis, both father and son, was that the earth was considerably flattened at the poles. Voltaire somewhat maliciously said of it, Courrier de la physique, argonaut nouveau, qui, franchissant les monts, qui, traversant les eaux, ne ramenez les climats soumis aux trois couronnes, vos perches, vos secteurs et surtout de la pône. Vous avez confirmé dans ces lieux pleins de nuit ce que Newton connuit sans sortir de lui. In much the same vein, he alludes to the two sisters who accompanied Montperteuil upon his return, the attractions of one of whom proved irresistible. Cette erreur est trop ordinaire, et c'est la seule que l'on fit en allant au cercle polaire. M. A. Maury, in his History of the Academy of Sciences, remarks, At the same time, the importance of the instruments and methods employed by the astronomers sent to the north afforded a support to the defenders of the theory of the flattening of the globes, which was hardly theirs by right, 
and in the following century the swedish astronomer swanburg rectified their involuntary exaggerations in a fine work published by him in the french language meantime the mission dispatched by the academy to peru proceeded with analogous operations it consisted of la condamine bouguer and godin three academicians joseph de jussieu governor of the medical college who undertook the botanical branch senerguet a surgeon godin de audonnet a clockmaker and a draughtsman they started from la rochelle on the sixteenth of may seventeen thirty five upon reaching st domingo they took several astronomical observations and continued by way of portobello and carthagena crossing the isthmus of panama they disembarked at manta in peru upon the ninth of march seventeen thirty six arrived there bouguer and condamine parted from their companions studied the rapidity of the pendulum and finally reached quito by different routes condamine pursued his way along the coast as far as rio de las esmeraldas and drew the map of the entire country which he traversed with such infinite toil bouguer went southwards towards guiaquil passing through marshy forests and reaching caracol at the foot of the cordillera range of the andes which he was a week in crossing this route had been previously taken by alvarado when seventy of his followers perished amongst them the three spaniards who had attempted to penetrate to the interior bouguer reached quito on the tenth of june at that time this city contained between thirty and forty thousand inhabitants and boasted of an episcopal president of the assembly and numbers of religious communities besides two colleges living there was cheap with the exception of foreign merchandises which realized exorbitant prices so much so indeed that a glass goblet fetched from eighteen to twenty francs the adventurers scaled the pichincha a mountain near quito the eruptions from which had more than once been fatal to the inhabitants but they were not slow in discovering that they could not succeed in carrying their implements to the summit of the mountains and that they must be satisfied with placing the signals upon the hills an extraordinary phenomenon may be witnessed almost every day upon the summit of these mountains said bouguer in the account he read before the academy of sciences which is probably as old as the world itself but what it appeared was never witnessed by any one before us we first remarked it when we were all together upon a mountain called pamba marca a cloud in which we had been enveloped and which dispersed allowed us a view of the rising sun which was very brilliant the cloud passed on it was scarcely removed thirty paces when each of us distinguished his own shadow reflected above him and saw only his own because the cloud presented a broken surface the short distance allowed us fully to recognize each part of the shadow we distinguished the arms the legs the head but we were most amazed at finding that the letter was surrounded by a glory or aureole formed of two or three small concentric crowns of a very bright colour containing the same variety of hues as the rainbow red being the outer one the spaces between the circles were equal the last circle the weakest and in the far distance we perceived one large white one which surrounded the whole it produced the effect of a transfiguration upon the spectator the instruments employed by these scholars were not as accurate as more modern ones and varied with changes of temperature in consequence of which they were forced to proceed most carefully and with most minute accuracy lest small errors accumulating should end by leading to greater ones thus in their trigonometrical surveys bouguer and his associates never calculated the third angle by the observation of the two first but always observed all three having calculated the number of fathoms contained in the extent of country surveyed the next point was to discover what part this was of the earth's circumference which could only be ascertained by means of astronomical observations after numerous obstacles which it is impossible to give in detail 
after curious discoveries as for example the attraction exercised on the pendulum by mountains the french inquirers arrived at conclusions which fully confirmed the result of the expedition to lapland they did not all return to france at the same time jussieu continued his search after facts in natural history and la condamine decided to return by way of the amazon river making an important voyage to which we shall have occasion to refer later end of section one Section 2 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 1, Part 2. Voyages in the 18th Century expedition of wood rogers adventures of alexander selkirk galapagos island puerto seguro return to england expedition of george anson staten island juan fernandez tinian macao taking of the vessel canton river results of the cruise the war of the spanish succession was at its height when some privateers of bristol determined to fit out ships to attack the spanish vessels in the pacific ocean and to devastate the coast of south america the two vessels chosen the duke and duchesse under captain rogers and courtenay were carefully equipped and stocked with everything necessary for so long a voyage the famous dampier who had acquired a great reputation by his daring adventures and piracies did not disdain to accept the title of chief pilot and although this trip was richer in material results than in geographical discoveries the account of it contains a few curious particulars worthy of preservation the duke and duchesse set sail from the royal port of bristol on the second of april seventeen o eight to begin with we may note one interesting fact throughout the voyage a register was at the service of the crew in which all the incidents of the voyage were to be noted so that the slightest error and the most insignificant oversights could be rectified before the facts of the case faded from memory nothing of note occurred on this voyage till the twenty second of december when the falkland islands previously noticed by few navigators were discovered rogers did not land on them but contented himself by observing that the coast although less precipitous resembled that of portland all the hills he added with their well wooded and gradually sloping sides appeared fertile and the shore is not wanting in good harbours now these islands do not possess a single tree and the good harbours as we shall presently see are anything but numerous so we can judge of the exactitude of the observations made by rogers navigators have done well not to trust to them after passing this archipelago the two vessels steered due south and penetrated as far as south latitude sixty degrees fifty eight minutes here there was no night the cold was intense and the sea so rough that the duchesse sustained a few injuries the chief officers of the two vessels assembled in council agreeing that it would be better not to attempt to go further south and the course was changed for the west on the fifteenth of january seventeen o nine cape horn is said to have been doubled and the southern ocean entered up to this date the position of the island of juan fernandez was differently given on nearly all maps and wood rogers who intended to harbour there take in water and get a little fresh meat came upon it almost unawares on the first of february he embarked in a little boat to try and find an anchorage whilst his people were awaiting his return a large fire was noticed on shore had some spanish or french vessels cast anchor here would it be necessary to fight for the water and food required every preparation was made during the night but in the morning no ship was in sight conjectures were already being hazarded as to whether the enemy had retired when the end was put to all surmises by the return of the boat bringing in it a man clad in goatskins whose personal appearance was yet more savage than his garments it was a scotch mariner alexander selkirk by name 
who in consequence of a quarrel with the captain of his ship had been left on this desert island four years and a half before the fire which had attracted notice had been lighted by him during his stay on the island of juan fernandez selkirk had seen many vessels pass but only two both spanish had cast anchor discovered by the sailors selkirk had been fired upon and only escaped death by the agility with which he managed to climb into a tree and hide he told how he had been put ashore with his clothes his bed a pound of powder some bullets a little tobacco a hatchet a knife a kettle a bible with a few other devotional books his nautical instruments and books poor selkirk provided for his wants as best he could but during the first few months he had great difficulty in conquering the sadness and mastering the horror consequent upon his terrible loneliness he built two huts of willow which he covered with a sort of rush and lined with the skins of the goats he killed to satisfy his hunger as long as his ammunition lasted when it was likely to fail he managed to strike a light by rubbing two pieces of pimento wood together when he had quite exhausted his ammunition he caught the goats as they ran his agility had become so great by dint of constant exercise that he scoured the woods rocks and hills with a perfectly incredible speed he had sufficient proof of his skill when he went hunting with us he outran and exhausted our best hunters and an excellent dog which we had on board he easily caught the goats and brought them to us on his back he himself related to us that one day he chased his prey so eagerly to the edge of a precipice which was concealed by bushes that they rolled over and over together until they reached the bottom he lost consciousness through that fall and upon discovering that the goat lay under him quite dead after remaining where he was for twenty-four hours he with the utmost difficulty succeeded in crawling to his cabin which was about a mile distant and he was unable to walk again for six days this deserted wretch managed to season his food with the turnips sown by the crew of a ship with cabbages capsicums and allspice when his clothes and shoes were worn out a process which occupied but a short time he ingeniously constructed a new ones of goatskin sewing them together with a nail which served him as a needle when his knife was useless he constructed a new one from the cask hoops he found on the shore he had so far lost the use of speech but he could only make himself understood by an effort rogers took him on board and appointed him boatswain's mate selkirk was not the first sailor abandoned upon the island of juan fernandez it may be remembered that dampier had already rescued an unfortunate mosquito man who was abandoned from sixteen eighty one to sixteen eighty four sharp and other buccaneers have related that the sole survivor of a crew of a vessel wrecked on this coast lived there for five years until he was rescued by another ship saint in his recent novel alone has detailed circuit's adventures upon the fourteenth of february the duke and duchesse left juan fernandez and commenced their operations against the spaniards rogers seized guayaquil for which he obtained a large ransom and captured several vessels which however provided him with more prisoners than money this part of his voyage concerns us but little and a few particulars only are interesting as for instance his mention of a monkey in the gorgus island who was so lazy that he was nicknamed the sluggard and of the inhabitants of tecames who repulsed the newcomers with poisoned arrows and guns he also speaks of the galapagos island situated two degrees of northern latitude according to rogers this cluster of islands was numerous but out of them all one only provided fresh water turtle doves existed there in great quantities and tortoises and sea turtles of an extraordinary size abounded thence the name given by the spaniards to this group sea dogs also were common one of them had the temerity to attack rogers i was walking along the shore he says when it left the water his jaws gaping as quickly and ferociously as a dog escaping from his chain three times he attacked me i plunged my pike into his breast and each time i inflicted such a wound that he fled howling horribly finally turning towards me he stopped to growl and show his fangs scarcely twenty-four hours earlier one of my crew had narrowly escaped being devoured by a monster of the same family 
in december rogers repaired to puerto seguro upon the californian coast with a manila galleon which he had seized many of his men penetrated to the interior he found large forest trees but not the slightest appearance of culture although smoke indicated the existence of inhabitants the inhabitants according to albi Presort's history of voyages were straight built and powerful blacker than any indian tribe hitherto met with in the pacific ocean seas they had long black hair plaited which reached below the waist all the men went about naked but the women wore a garment either composed of leaves or of stuff made from them and sometimes the skins of beasts and birds occasionally they wore necklaces and bracelets made of bits of wood or shells others adorned their necks with small red berries and pearls evidently they did not know how to pierce holes in them for they notched them and joined them by a thread they valued these ornaments so highly that they refused to change them for english necklaces of glass their chief anxiety was to obtain knives and useful implements the duke and duchesse left porto seguro on the twelfth of january seventeen ten and reached the island of guaham of the marians in the course of two months here they revictualled and passing by the straits of bhutan and selayer reached batavia after a necessary delay at the latter place and at the cape of good hope rogers cast anchor in the downs upon the first of october in spite of rogers reticence with regard to the immense riches he brought with him a good idea of their extent may be gathered from the account of ingots vessels of silver and gold and pearls with which he delighted the ship owners we now come to our account of admiral anson's voyage which almost belongs to the category of naval warfare but with it we may close the list of piratical expeditions which dishonoured the victors without ruining the vanquished and if he brought no new acquisitions to geography his account teems with judicious observations and interesting remarks about the country then little known the merit of them however if we are to believe nichols's literary anecdotes rests rather with benjamin robbins than as the title would appear to indicate with the chaplain of the expedition richard walter george anson was born at staffordshire in sixteen ninety seven a sailor from his childhood he early brought himself into notice he was already well known as a clever and fortunate captain when in seventeen thirty nine he was offered the command of a squadron it consisted of the centurion sixty guns the gloucester and severe each fifty guns the pearl forty guns the wager twenty eight guns to it were attached also the sloop trial and two transports carrying food and ammunition in addition to the crew of one thousand four hundred and sixty a reinforcement of four hundred and seventy marines was added to the fleet leaving england on the eighteenth of september seventeen forty the expedition proceeded by way of madeira past the island of st catherine along the brazilian coast by st julian harbour and finally crossed the strait of lemer terrible said the narrative as the aspect of tierra del fuego may be that of staten island is more horrible still it consists of a series of inaccessible rocks crowned with sharp points prodigiously high they are covered with eternal snow and etched with precipices in short it is impossible to conceive anything more deserted and more wild than this region scarcely had the last vessels of the squadron filed through the strait than a series of heavy gales squalls and storms caused the oldest sailors to vow that all they had hitherto known of tempests were nothing in comparison this fearful experience lasted seven weeks without intermission it is needless to state that the vessels sustained great damage that many men were swept away by the waves numbers destroyed by illnesses occasioned by the exposure to constant damp and want of sufficient nourishment two of the vessels the severe and the pearl were engulfed and four others were lost sight of anson was unable to reach valdivia the rendezvous he had selected in case of separation carried far to the north he could only arrest his course at juan fernandez which he reached upon the ninth of june the centurion had the greatest need of rest she had lost eighty of her crew her supply of water had failed and the sailors were so weakened by scurvy that ten only of the remaining number were available for the watch the other vessels in an equally bad plight were not long in regaining her 
the first care was to restore the exhausted crews and to repair the worst injuries sustained by the vessels anson sent the sick on shore and installed them in a sheltered hospital in the open air then putting himself at the head of the most enterprising sailors he scoured the entire island and thoroughly examined its roads and shores the best anchorage according to his report was in cumberland bay the southeastern portion of juan fernandez a little island scarcely five leagues by two in extent is dry rocky treeless the ground lies low and is level in comparison with the northern portion it produces watercresses purslin sorrels turnips and sicilian radishes in abundance as well as oats and clover anson sowed carrots and lettuces and planted plums apricots and peaches he soon discovered that the number of goats left by the buccaneers and which had multiplied marvellously had since decreased the spaniards eager to deprive their enemies of their valuable resource had let loose a quantity of famished dogs upon the island who chased the goats and devoured so many of them that at the time of anson's visit scarcely two hundred remained the commodore for so anson is always called in the narrative of this voyage reconnoitred the island of mas afuego which is only twenty-five leagues west of juan fernandez smaller than the latter it is more wooded better watered and possessed more goats at the beginning of december the crews were sufficiently recovered for anson to put into execution his projected attack upon the spaniards he commenced by seizing several ships laden with precious merchandise and ingots and then set fire to the city of paita upon this occasion the spaniards estimated their loss at one and a half million piastres anson then proceeded to kibo bay near panama to lie in wait for the galleon which every year transported the treasure of the philippine islands to acapulco then although the english met with no inhabitants in the miserable huts they found heaps of shells and beautiful mother of pearl left there during the summer months by the fishermen of panama in mentioning the resources of this place we must not omit the immense turtles which usually weighted two hundred pounds and which were caught in a singular manner when a shoal of them were seen floating asleep upon the surface of the ocean a good swimmer would plunge in a few fathoms deep and rising seize the turtle towards the tail and endeavour to force it down upon awakening the creature's struggles to free itself suffice to support both the man and his prey until the arrival of a boat to receive them both after a fruitless cruise anson determined to burn three of the spanish vessels which he had seized and equipped distributing the crews and cargo upon the centurion and the gloucester the only two vessels remaining to him he decided upon the sixth of may seventeen forty two to make for china where he hoped to find reinforcements and supplies but this voyage which he expected to accomplish in sixty days took him fully four months after a violent gale the gloucester having all but foundered and her crew being too reduced to work her was burned her cargo of silver and her supplies were transshipped to the centurion which alone remained of all that magnificent fleet which two years earlier had set sail from england thrown out of his course far to the north anson discovered on the twenty sixth of august the isles of atanacan and serigan and the following day those of saipan tinian and agnigan which form a part of the marian archipelago a spaniard a surgeon whom he captured in a small bark in these seas told him that the island of tinian was inhabited and abounded with cattle fowls and excellent fruits such as oranges lemons limes breadfruit etc nowhere could the centurion have found a more welcome port for her exhausted crew now numbering only seventy-one men worn out by privations and illness the only survivors of the two thousand sailors who had manned the fleet at its departure the soil of this island says the narrative is dry and somewhat sandy which makes the verdure of the meadows and woods more delicate and more uniform than is usually the case in tropical climates the ground rises gently from the english encampment to the centre of the isle but before its greatest height is reached one meets with sloping glade covered with fine clover and many brilliant flowers and bordered by beautiful fruit trees 
the animals who for the greater part of the year are the only lords of this beautiful retreat add to its romantic charm and contribute not a little to its marvellous appearance thousands of cattle may be seen grazing together in a vast meadow and the sight is the more singular as the animals are all of a milk-white color with the exception of their ears which are generally black although it is a desert island the sight and sound of such a number of domestic animals rushing in crowds through the woods suggest the idea of farmhouses and villages truly an enchanting description but has not the author rather drawn upon his own imagination for the charming details of his description after so long a voyage after so many storms it is little to be wondered at if the verdant woods the exuberant vegetation and the abundance of animal life profoundly impressed the minds of anson's companions well we shall soon learn whether his successors at tinian found it as wonderful as he did meanwhile anson was not altogether free from anxiety it was true that his ships were repaired but many of his men remained on land to recover their strength and but a small number of able-bodied seamen remained on board with him the roadstead being lined with coral great precautions were necessary to save the cables from being cut but in spite of them at new moon a sudden tempest arose and broke the ship loose the anchors held well but the hawsers gave way and the centurion was carried out to sea the thunder growled ceaselessly and the rain fell with such violence that the signals of distress which were given by the crew were not even heard anson most of his officers and a large part of the crew numbering one hundred and thirteen persons remained on land and found themselves deprived of the only means they possessed of leaving tinian their despair was great their consternation inexpressible but anson with his energy and endless resources soon roused his companions from their despair one vessel that which they had captured from the spaniards still remained to them and it occurred to them to lengthen it until it could contain them all with the necessary provisions for a voyage to china however after nineteen days the centurion returned and the english embarking in her upon the twenty first of october were not long in reaching macao putting into a friendly and civilized port for the first time since their departure from england two years before macao says anson formerly rich well populated and capable of self-defense against the chinese government is greatly shorn of its ancient splendor although still inhabited by the portuguese and ruled by a governor nominated by the king of portugal it is at the mercy of the chinese who can starve the inhabitants or take possession of it for which reasons the portuguese governor is very careful not to offend them anson was forced to write an imperious letter to the chinese governor before he could obtain permission to buy even at high prices the provisions and stores he required he then publicly announced his intention of leaving for batavia and set sail on the nineteenth of april seventeen forty three but instead of steering for the dutch possession he directed his course towards the philippine islands where for several days he awaited the arrival of the galleon returning from acapulco laden with the proceeds of the sale of her rich cargo these vessels usually carried forty-two guns and were manned by a crew of over five hundred men anson had only two hundred sailors of whom thirty were but lads but this disproportion did not deter him for he had the expectation of rich booty and the cupidity of his men was sufficient guarantee of their courage why asked anson one day of his steward why do you no longer give us mutton for dinner have we eaten all the sheep we bought in china pray excuse me commodore replied the steward but i am reserving the only two which remain for the captain of the galleon no one not even the steward doubted of success anson well understood how to secure it and the efficiency of his men compensated for their reduced numbers the struggle was hot the straw mats which filled the rigging of the galleon took fire and the flames rose as high as the mizzenmast the spaniards found the double enemies too much after a sharp contest of two hours during which sixty-seven of their men were killed and eighty-four wounded they surrendered it was a rich prize one million three hundred and thirteen thousand eight hundred and forty two pieces of gold and thirty five thousand six hundred and eighty two ounces of ingot silver 
with other merchandise of little value in comparison with the money the booty added to others amounted to nearly four hundred thousand livres without taking into account the vessels goods etc of the spaniards which the english squadron had burned or destroyed and which could not be reckoned at less than six hundred thousand livres anson convoyed his prize to the canton river where he sold it much below its value for six thousand piastres he left on the tenth of december and reached spithead on the fifteenth of june seventeen forty four after an absence of three years and nine months he made a triumphal entry into london the half million of money which was the result of his numerous prizes was conveyed through the city in thirty-two chariots to the sound of trumpets and beating of drums and amidst the shouts of the people the money was divided between himself his officers and men the king himself could not claim a share anson was created rear admiral shortly after his return and received important commands in seventeen forty seven he captured the marquis de la jonquiere tafanel after an heroic struggle for this exploit he was made first lord of the admiralty and admiral in seventeen fifty eight he covered the attempted descent of the english near st malo and died in london a short time after his return End of section two. Section 3 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter two part one captain cook's predecessors one a as early as sixteen sixty nine brogevine the elder had petitioned the dutch west india company for three armed vessels in order to prosecute his discoveries in the pacific ocean his project was favorably received but a coolness in the relations between spain and holland forced the batavian government to relinquish the expedition for a time upon his deathbed roggevine forced from his son jacob a promise to carry the plan he had conceived into execution circumstances over which he had no control for a long time hindered the fulfillment of his promise it was only after several voyages in the indian seas after having even been judge in the batavian justice court that at length jacob roggevine was in a position to take the necessary steps with the west indian company we have no means of finding out roggevine's age in 1721 or of ascertaining what were his claims to the command of an expedition of discovery most biographical dictionaries honor him with but a slight mention perhaps of a couple of lines and fleurieu in his learned and exhaustive account of the dutch navigator was unable to find out anything certain about him moreover the narrative of the voyage was written not by roggevine but by a german named behrens we may therefore with some justice attribute the obscurities and contradictions of the particulars given and their general want of accuracy rather to the narrator than to the navigator it even appears sometimes and this is far from improbable that roggevine was ignorant of the voyages and discoveries of his predecessors and contemporaries upon the twenty first of august seventeen twenty one three vessels set sail from texel under his command they were the eagle of thirty-six guns and with a crew of a hundred eleven men the teenhoven of twenty-eight guns and one hundred men captain james bowman and the galley african of fourteen guns and a crew of sixty men 
Captain Henry Rosenthal. Their voyage across the Atlantic afforded no particulars of interest. Touching at Rio, Roggevine went in search of an island which he named Aux Magdalene, and which would appear to be the same as the land of the Virgin, Hawkins, Virginia, and the archipelago of Falkland, or Malouine Islands, unless indeed it was southern Georgia. Although these islands were then well known, it would appear that the Dutch knew little of their whereabouts, as after vainly seeking the Falkland Isles, they set to work to look for the island St. Louis, belonging to the French, apparently quite unaware that they belonged to the same group. There are few lands, indeed, which have borne so many different names as Pepe's Isles, Conti Isles, and many which we need not mention. It would be easy to count up a dozen. After discovering, or rather noticing, an island below the parallel of the Straits of Magellan, about twenty-four leagues from the American continent, of two hundred leagues in circumference, which he named South Belgium, Roggevine passed through the Straits of La Mer, or possibly was carried by the current, to sixty-two and a half degrees of southern latitude. Finally, he regained the coast of Chile, and cast anchor opposite the island of Mocha, which he found deserted. He afterwards reached Juan Fernandez, where he met with the Tienhoven, from which he had been separated since the 21st of December. The vessels left this harbor before the end of March, and steered to the west-northwest in search of the land discovered by Davis, between 27 degrees and 28 degrees south. After a search of several days, Roggevine sighted an island upon the 6th of April, 1722, which he named Easter Island. We will not stop to enumerate the exaggerated dimensions claimed for this island by the Dutch navigator, nor to notice his observations of the manners and customs of the inhabitants. We shall have occasion to refer to them in dealing with the more detailed and reliable accounts of Cook and La Perouse. But, said Fleurieu, we shall vainly look in this narrator for any sign of learning on the part of Roggevine's sergeant major. After describing the banana, of which the leaves are six or eight feet high, and two or three wide, he adds that this was the leaf with which our first parents covered their nakedness after the fall, and to make it clearer, further remarks that those who accept this view do so on account of this leaf being the largest of all the plants growing in either eastern or western countries, thereby plainly indicating his notion of the proportions of Adam and Eve. A native came on board the eagle. He delighted everyone by his good humor, gaiety, and friendly demonstrations. In the morning, Roggenvine distinguished an eager multitude upon the shore, which was adorned with high statues, who awaited the arrival of the strangers with impatient curiosity. For no discoverable purpose a gun was fired. One of the natives was killed, and the multitude fled in every direction, soon, however, to return in greater haste. Roggevine, at the head of a hundred and fifty men, fired a volley, stretching a number of victims on the ground. Overcome with terror, the natives hastened to appease their terrible visitors by offering them all they possessed. Florieu is of opinion that Easter Island and Davis Island are not identical, but in spite of the reasons with which he supports his opinions, and the differences which he points out in the situation and description of the two islands, it is impossible to avoid the conclusion that Roggevine and Davis's discoveries are one and the same. No other island answering to the description is to be found in these latitudes, which are now thoroughly well known. 
A violent storm of wind drove Roggewein from his anchorage on the eastern side of the island and obliged him to make for the west-northwest. He traversed the sea called Mauvais by Schouten, and having sailed eight hundred leagues from Easter Island, fell in with what he took to be the Isle of Dogs, so called by Schouten. Roggewein named it Karlshof, a name which it still retains. The squadron passed this island in the night without touching at it, and was forced in the following night, by the wind and adverse currents, to the midst of a group of low islands which were quite unexpectedly encountered. The African was dashed against a coral rock, and the two consorts narrowly escaped the same fate. Only after five days of unceasing effort, of danger and anxiety, the crew succeeded in extricating the vessels and in regaining the open sea. The natives of this group were tall, with long and flowing hair. They painted their bodies in various colors. It is generally agreed now to recognize in Roggewein's description of the pernicious islands the group to which Cook gave the name of Palliser Isles. On the morning succeeding the day in which he had so narrowly escaped the dangers of the pernicious islands, Roggewein discovered an island to which he gave the name of Aurora. Lying low, it was scarcely visible above the water, and had the sun not shone out, the Tienhoven would have been lost upon it. As night approached, new land was perceived, to which the name of Vesper was given, and it is difficult to decide whether or no it belonged to the Palliser group. Roggewein continued to sail between the fifteenth and sixteenth degrees, and was not long in finding himself, all of a sudden, in the midst of islands which were half-submerged. As we approached them, says Behrens, we saw an immense number of canoes navigating the coast, and we concluded that the islands were well populated. Upon nearing the land we discovered that it consisted of a mass of different islands, situated close the one to the other, and we were insensibly drawn in amongst them. We began to fear that we should be unable to extricate ourselves. The admiral sent one of the pilots up to the lookout to ascertain how we could get free of them. We owed our safety to the calm that prevailed. The slightest movement of the water would have run our ships upon the rocks, without the possibility of assistance reaching us. As it was, we got away without any incident worth mentioning. These islands are six in number, all very pleasant, and taken together may extend some thirty leagues. They are situated twenty-five leagues westward of the pernicious islands. We named them the Labyrinth, because we could only leave them by a circuitous route. Many authors identify this group with Byron's Prince of Wales Islands. Fleurieu holds a different opinion. Dumont d'Urville thinks them identical with the group of Vliegen, already seen by Schouten and Le Maire. After navigating for three days in a westerly direction, the Dutch caught sight of a beautiful island. Coconuts, palm trees, and luxuriant verdure testified to its fertility. But finding it impossible to anchor there, the officers and crews were obliged to visit it in well-armed detachments. Once more, the Dutch needlessly shed the blood of an inoffensive population which had awaited them upon the shore, and whose only fault consisted in their numbers. After this execution, worthy rather of barbarians than of civilized men, they endeavored to persuade the natives to return by offering presents to the chiefs and by deceitful protestations of friendship. But they were not to be deceived by the latter, 
and having enticed the sailors into the interior, the inhabitants rushed upon them and attacked them with stones. Although a volley of bullets stretched a number upon the ground, they still bravely persisted in attacking the strangers, and forced them to re-embark, carrying with them their dead and wounded. Of course the Dutch cried treason, not knowing how to find epithets strong enough for the treachery and disloyalty of their adversaries. But who struck the first blow? Who was the aggressor? Even admitting that a few thefts were committed, which is probable enough, was it necessary to visit them with so severe a punishment? To revenge upon an entire population the wrongdoing of a few individuals, who, after all, can have had no very strict notions of honesty. In spite of their losses, the Dutch called this island, in memory of the refreshment they had enjoyed there, Recreation Island. Roggevine gives its situation as below the sixth parallel, but his longitude is so incorrect that it is impossible to depend upon it. The question now arises whether the captain should prosecute his search for the island Espirito Santo de Quiros in the west, or whether, on the contrary, he should sail northward and reach the East Indies during the favorable season. The council of war, which Roggevine called to the consideration of this question, chose the latter alternative. The third day after this decision, three islands were simultaneously discovered. They received the name of Bauman, after the captain of the Tienhoven, who was the first to catch sight of them. The natives came round the vessels to traffic, whilst an immense crowd of the inhabitants lined the shore, armed with bows and spears. They were white-skinned, and only differed from Europeans in appearance, when very much tanned by the sun. Their bodies were not painted. A strip of stuff, artistically arranged and fringed, covered them from the waist to the heels. Hats of the same material protracted their heads, and necklaces of sweet-smelling flowers adorned their necks. It must be confessed, says Behrens, that this is the most civilized nation, as well as the most honest, which we have met with in the southern seas. Charmed with our arrival, they received us like gods, and when we showed our intention of leaving, they testified most lively regrets. From the description, these would appear to have been the inhabitants of the navigator's islands. After having encountered the islands, which Roggevine believed to be Cocoa and Traitor Islands, already visited by Schouten and Le Maire, and which Fleurieu, imagining them to be a Dutch discovery, named Roggevine Islands, after having caught sight of Tienhoven and Groning Islands, which were believed by Pingray to be identical with Santa Cruz of Mendana, the expedition finally reached the coast of New Ireland. Here the discoverers perpetrated new massacres. From thence they went to the shores of New Guinea, and after crossing the Moluccas, cast anchor at Batavia. Their fellow countrymen, less humane than many of the tribes they had visited, confiscated the two vessels, imprisoned the officers and sailors indiscriminately, and sent them to Europe to take their trial. They had committed the unpardonable crime of having entered countries belonging to the East India Company, whilst they themselves were in the employ of the West India Company. The result was a trial and the East India Company was compelled to restore all that it had appropriated, and to pay heavy damages. We lose all sight of Roggevine after his arrival at Texel upon the 11th July, 1723, and no details are to be obtained of the last years of his life. Grateful thanks are due to Fleurieu 
for having unraveled this chaotic narrative and for having thrown some light upon an expedition which deserves to be better known. Upon the 17th of June, 1764, Commodore Byron received instructions signed by the Lord of the Admiralty. They were to the following effect. As nothing contributes more to the glory of this nation in its character of a maritime power, to the dignity of the British crown, and to the progress of its national commerce and navigation, than the discovery of new regions, and as there is every reason for believing in the existence of lands and islands in great numbers between the Cape of Good Hope and the Straits of Magellan, which have been hitherto unknown to the European powers, and which are situated in latitudes suitable for navigation, and in climates productive of different marketable commodities, and as, moreover, His Majesty's Islands, called Pepys and Falkland Islands, situated, as will be described, have not been sufficiently examined for a just appreciation of their shores and productions, although they were discovered by English navigators. His Majesty, taking all these considerations into account, and conceiving the existing state of profound peace now enjoyed by his subjects, especially suitable for such an undertaking, has decided to put it into execution. Upon what seamen would the choice of the English government fall? Commodore John Byron, born on the 8th of November, 1723, was the man selected. From his earliest years he had shown an enthusiastic love of seafaring life, and at the age of seventeen had offered his services upon one of the vessels that formed Admiral Anson's squadron when it was sent out for the destruction of Spanish settlements upon the Pacific coast. We have already given an account of the troubles which befell this expedition before the incredible fortune which was to distinguish its last voyage. The vessel upon which Byron embarked was the Wager. It was wrecked in passing through the Straits of Magellan, and the crew, being taken prisoners by the Spaniards, were sent to Chile. After a captivity which lasted at least three years, Byron effected his escape, and was rescued by a vessel from Saint-Malo, which took him to Europe. He returned at once to service and distinguished himself in various encounters during the war with France. Doubtless it was the recollection of his first voyage round the world, so disastrously interrupted, which procured for him the distinction conferred upon him by the Admiralty. The vessels entrusted to him were carefully armed. The Dauphin was a six-rate man-of-war, and carried twenty-four guns, one hundred fifty sailors, three lieutenants, and thirty-seven petty officers. The Tamar was a sloop of sixteen guns and ninety sailors, three lieutenants, twenty-seven petty officers, commanded by Captain Muat. The start was not fortunate. The expedition left the Downs upon the 21st of June, but the Dauphin grounded before leaving the Thames, and was obliged to put into Plymouth for repairs. Upon the 3rd of July, anchor was finally weighed, and ten days later, Byron put in at Funchal in the island of Madeira for refreshments. He was forced to halt again at Cape Verde Islands to take in water that with which he was supplied having become rapidly wasted. Nothing further occurred to interrupt the voyage until the two English vessels sighted Cape Frio. Byron remarked a singular fact, since fully verified, that the copper sheathing of his vessels appeared to disperse the fish which he expected to meet with in large quantities. 
the tropical heat and constant rains had struck down a large proportion of the crew hence the urgent need of rest and of fresh victuals which they experienced these they hoped to find at rio de janeiro where they arrived on the twelfth december Byron was warmly welcomed by the viceroy and thus describes his first interview when i made my visit i was received in the greatest state about sixty officers were drawn up by the palace the guard was under arms they were fine well-drilled men his excellency accompanied by the nobility received me on the staircase fifteen salutes from the neighboring fort honored my arrival we then entered the audience chamber and after conversation of a quarter of an hour i took my leave and was conducted back with the same ceremonies we shall see a little later how slightly the reception given to captain cook some years afterwards resembled that just related the commodore obtained ready permission to disembark his sick and found every facility for revictualling his sole cause of complaint was the repeated endeavor of the portuguese to tempt his sailors to desert the insupportable heat experienced by the crew shortened their stay at rio upon the sixteenth of october anchor was weighed but it was five days before a land breeze allowed the vessels to gain the open sea up to this moment the destination of the expedition had been kept secret byron now summoned the captain of the tamar on board and in the presence of the assembled sailors read his instructions these enjoined him not to proceed to the east indies as had been supposed but to prosecute discoveries which might prove of great importance to england in the southern seas with this object the lords of the admiralty promised double pay to the crew with future advancement and enjoyments if they were pleased with their services the second part of this short harangue was the most acceptable to the sailors and was received by them with joyous demonstrations until the twenty ninth of october no incident occurred in their passage upon that date sudden and violent squalls succeeded each other and culminated in a fearful tempest the violence of which was so great that the commodore ordered four guns to be thrown overboard to avoid foundering in the morning the weather moderated somewhat but it was as cold as in england at the same time of year although in this quarter of the globe the month of november answers to the month of may as the wind continued to drive the vessel eastward byron began to think that he should experience great difficulty in avoiding the east of patagonia suddenly upon the twelfth of november although no land was marked on the chart in this position a repeated cry of land land ahead arose clouds at this moment obscured almost the entire horizon and it thundered and lightened without intermission it seemed to me says byron that what had at first appeared to be an island was really two steep mountains but upon looking windward it was apparent that the land which belonged to these mountains stretched far to the southeast consequently he steered southwest I sent some officers to the masthead to watch the wind and to verify the discovery. They unanimously asserted that they saw a great extent of country. We then went east-southeast. The land appeared to present entirely the same appearance. The mountains looked blue, as is often the case in dark and rainy weather, when one is near them shortly afterwards several of our number fancied they could distinguish waves breaking upon a sandy shore but after steering with the utmost caution for an hour that which we had taken for land disappeared suddenly 
and we were convinced to our amazement that it had been only a land of fog i have passed all my life at sea continues byron since i was twenty-seven but i never could have conceived so complete and sustained an illusion there is no doubt that had the weather not cleared so suddenly as it did we should one and all on board have declared that we had discovered land in this latitude we were then in latitude forty three degrees forty six minutes south and longitude sixty degrees five minutes west the next morning a terrible gale of wind arose heralded by the piercing cries of many hundred birds flying before it it lasted only twenty minutes sufficiently long however to throw the vessel on its beam end before it was possible to let go the halyards at the same moment a blow from the sheet of the mainsail overthrew the first lieutenant and sent him rolling to a distance while the mizzenmast which was not entirely lowered was torn to pieces the following days were not much more favorable moreover the ship had sunk so little that she drifted away as the wind freshened after such a troublesome voyage we may guess how gladly byron reached penguin island and port desire on the twenty fourth of november but the delights of this station did not by any means equal the anticipations of the crew the english sailors landed and upon advancing into the interior met only with a desert country and sandy hills without a single tree they found no game but they saw a few guanacos too far off for a shot they were, however, able to catch some large hares, which were not difficult to secure. The seals and seabirds, however, furnished food for an entire fleet. End of section three. Recording by Malone. Section 4 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter Two, Part One, Captain Cook's Predecessors, One B. Badly situated and badly sheltered, Port Desire offered the further inconvenience that only brackish water could be procured there. Not a trace of inhabitants was to be found. A long stay in this place being useless and dangerous, Byron started in search of Pepys Island on the 25th. The position of this island was most uncertain. Haley placed it 80 degrees east of the continent. Cowley, the only person who asserted that he had seen it, declared it was about 47 degrees latitude south, but did not fix its longitude. Here, then, was an interesting problem to solve. After having explored to the north, to the south, and to the east, Byron, satisfied that this island was imaginary, set sail for the Sibaldines, in haste to reach the first possible port where he could obtain food and water, of which he had pressing need. A storm overtook him, during which the waves were so terrific that Byron declared he had never seen them equaled, even when he doubled Cape Horn with Admiral Anson. This danger surmounted, he recognized Cape Virgin, which forms the northern entrance to the Straits of Magellan. 
as soon as the vessels neared the shore the sailors distinguished a crowd of men on horseback who set up a white tent and signed to them to land curious to see these patagonians about whom preceding navigators had so disagreed byron landed with a strong detachment of armed soldiers he found nearly five hundred men most of them on horseback of gigantic stature and looking like monsters in human shape their bodies were painted in the most hideous manner their faces traced with various colored lines their eyes encircled with blue black or red so that they had the appearance of wearing enormous spectacles almost all were naked with the exception of a skin thrown over their shoulders the wool inside and a few of them wore boots truly a singular costume primitive and not expensive with them were numbers of dogs and of very small horses excessively ugly but not the less extremely swift the women rode on horseback like the men without stirrups and all galloped on the shore although it was covered with immense stones and very slippery the interview was friendly byron distributed numbers of toys ribbons glass trinkets and tobacco to the crowd of giants as soon as he had brought the dauphin to the wind byron entered the straits of magellan with the tide it was not his intention to cross it but merely to find a safe and commodious harbor where he might secure wood and water before starting in his search for the falkland islands on leaving the second outlet he met with st elizabeth st bartholomew and st george islands and sandy point near the last he found a delicious country springs woods fields covered with flowers which shed an exquisite perfume in the air the country was swarming with hundreds of birds of which one species received the name of the painted goose from the exceeding brilliancy of its plumage but nowhere could a spot be found where the ship's boat could approach without extreme danger the water was shallow everywhere and the breakers were heavy fish of many kinds more especially mullets geese snipe teal and other birds of excellent flavor were caught and killed by the crew Barron was obliged to continue his voyage to Port Famine, which he reached on the 27th of December. We were sheltered from all winds, he says, with the exception of the southeast, which rarely blows, and no damage could accrue to vessels which might be driven on shore in the bay because of the profound calm that prevails. Wood enough floated near the shore to stock a thousand vessels, so we had no need to go and cut it in the forests the river sedger ran at the bottom of the bay the water of which is excellent its banks are planted with large and beautiful trees excellent for masts parrots and birds of brilliant plumage throng the branches abundance reigned in famine port during byron's stay as soon as his crew were completely recovered from their fatigue and the ships well provisioned the commodore on the fifth of january seventeen sixty five resumed his search for the falkland islands seven days later he discovered a land in which he fancied he recognized the islands of sebald de vert but upon nearing them he found that what he had taken for three islands was in reality but one which extended far south he had no remaining doubt that he had found the group marked upon the charts of the time as new ireland fifty one degrees south latitude and sixty three degrees thirty two minutes west longitude first of all byron steered clear of them fearing to be thrown upon a coast with which he was unacquainted and after this summary bearing a detachment was selected to skirt the coast as closely as possible 
and look for a safe and commodious harbor, which was soon met with. It received the name of Port Egmont, in honor of Earl Egmont, first lord of the Admiralty. I did not expect, says Byron, that it would be possible to find so good a harbor. The depth was excellent, with the supply of water easy, and all the ships of England might be anchored there in shelter from winds. Geese, ducks, and teal abounded to such an extent that the sailors were tired of eating them. Want of wood was general, with the exception of some trunks of trees which floated by the shore, and which were apparently brought here from the Strait of Magellan. The wild sorrel and celery, both excellent antiscorbutics, were to be found in abundance. Sea cows and seals, as well as penguins, were so numerous that it was impossible to walk upon the strand without seeing them rush away in herds. Animals resembling wolves, but more like foxes in shape, with the exception of their height and tails, several times attacked the sailors, who had great difficulty in defending themselves. It would be no easy task to guess how they came here, distant as the country is from any other continent, by at least a hundred leagues, or to imagine where they found shelter in a country barren of vegetation, producing only rushes, sword-grass, and not a single tree. The account of this portion of Byron's voyage in Dido's biography is a tissue of errors. The flotilla, says Mr. Alfred de Lucas, became entangled in the Straits of Magellan, and was forced to put into a bay near Port Famine, which was named Port Egmont. A singular mistake, which proves how lightly the articles of this important collection were sometimes written. Byron took possession of Port Egmont and the adjacent isles, called Falkland, in the name of the King of England. Cowley had named them Pepper's Islands, but in all probability the first discoverer was Captain Davis in 1592. Two years later Sir Richard Hawkins found land which was thought to be the same, and named it Virginia, in honor of his Queen Elizabeth. Lastly, vessels from St. Malo visited this group, and no doubt it was owing to this fact that Fraser called them the Malouin Islands. After having named a number of rocks, islets, and capes, Byron left Port Egmont on the 27th of January, and set sail for Port Desire, which he reached nine days later. There he found the Florida, a transport vessel, which had brought from England the provisions and necessary appliances for his long journey. But this anchorage was too dangerous. The Florida and the Tamar were in too bad a condition to be equal to the long operation of transshipment. Byron, therefore, sent one of his petty officers, who had a thorough knowledge of the Strait of Magellan, on board the Florida, and with his two consorts set sail for Port Famine. He met with a French ship so many times in the Straits that it appeared as if she were bent upon the same course as himself. Upon returning to England he ascertained that she was the Aigle, Captain Monsieur de Bougainville, who was coasting Patagonia in search of the wood needed by the French colony in the Falkland Islands. During the various excursions in the Straits, the English expedition received several visits from the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego. I have never seen such wretched beings, says Byron. They were entirely naked, with the exception of a skin thrown across the shoulders. They offered me the bows and arrows with which they were armed in exchange for beads, necklaces, and other trifles. Their arrows, which were two feet long, were made of cane and pointed with greenish stone. 
The bows were three feet long and were furnished with catgut for strings. Their nourishment consisted of certain fruits, mussels, and the remains of putrid fish thrown upon the beach during the storms. Pigs only could have relished their food. It consisted of large pieces of whale, already putrefied, the odor of which impregnated the air for some distance. One of them tore the carrion in pieces with his teeth and handed the bits to his companions, who devoured them with the voracity of wild beasts. Several of these miserable beings decided to come on board. Wishing to give them a pleasant reception, one of my petty officers played the violin, and the sailors danced. This delighted them. Anxious to show their appreciation, one of their number hastened to his pirogue, small boat, and returned with a little bag of wolf-skin containing a red ointment, with which he rubbed the face of the violinist. He was anxious to pay me the same attention, but I drew back. He then tried every means of overcoming my delicacy, and I had great difficulty in avoiding the mark of esteem he was so anxious to give me. It will not be out of place here to record the opinion held by Byron, an experienced seaman, upon the advantages and disadvantages offered to the passage through the Straits of Magellan. He does not agree with the majority of navigators who have visited these latitudes. He says, Our account of the difficulties and dangers we encountered may lead to the idea that it is not prudent to attempt this passage, and that ships leaving Europe for the southern seas should prefer to double Cape Horn. There is one season in the year when not only one ship, but an entire fleet might safely cross the straits, and to profit by this season one should enter them in the month of December. One inestimable advantage, which should weigh with all navigators, is that celery, scurvy grass, fruits, and other antiscorbutic vegetables abound. Such obstacles as we encountered, and which delayed us from the 17th of February till the 8th of April in the Straits, were mainly due to the equinoctial season, a season which is invariably stormy, and which more than once tried our patience. Until the 26th of April, the day upon which they found Massa Fuero, belonging to the Juan Fernandez group, Byron had sailed to the northwest. He hastened to disembark several sailors, who, after obtaining water and wood, chased wild goats, which they found better flavored than venison in England. During their stay in this port, a singular fact occurred. A violent surf broke over the shore and prevented the shore boats from reaching the strand. Although he was provided with a life belt, one of the sailors, who could not swim, refused to jump into the sea to reach the boat. Threatened with being left alone on the island, he still persistently refused to venture, when one of his companions cleverly encircled his waist with a cord, in which he had made a running knot, and one end of which was made fast to the boat. When he reached the vessel, Hawksworth's narrative relates that the unfortunate fellow had swallowed so much water that he appeared lifeless. He was accordingly hung up by the heels, whereupon he soon regained his senses, and the next day was completely restored. But in spite of this truly wonderful recovery, we can hardly venture to recommend this course of treatment to human rescue societies. Leaving Massa Fuero, Byron changed his route with the intention of seeking Davis Land, now known as Easter Island, which was placed by geographers in 27 degrees 30 minutes, a hundred leagues westward of the American coast. Eight days were devoted to this search. Having found nothing after this cruise, which he was unable to prolong, Byron, 
following his intention of visiting the Solomon Group, steered for the northwest. Upon the 22nd of May, scurvy broke out on board the vessels and quickly made alarming havoc. Fortunately, land was perceived from the lookout on the 7th of June in 140 degrees 58 minutes west longitude. Next day, the fleet neared two islands, which presented an attractive appearance. Large bushy trees, shrubs, and groves were seen, and a number of natives who hastened to the shore and lighted fires. Byron sent a boat in search of anchorage. It returned without having found the requisite depth at a cable's length from shore. The unfortunate victims of scurvy who had crawled on to the forecastle cast looks of sorrowful longing at the fertile islands, which held the remedy for their sufferings and which nature placed beyond their reach. The narrative says, They saw the cocoa trees in abundance, laden with fruit, the milk of which is probably the most powerful anti-scorbutic in the world. They had reason for supposing that limes, bananas, and other tropical fruits abounded, and to add to their torments they saw the shells of tortoises floating on the shore. All these delights, which would have restored them to vigor, were no more attainable than if they had been separated by half the globe, but the sight of them increased the misery of their privations. Byron was anxious to curtail the tantalizing misery of his unfortunate crew, and giving the name of Disappointment Islands to the group, he set sail once more on the 8th of June. The very next day he found a new land, long, flat, covered with coconut trees. In its midst was a lake with a little islet. This feature alone was indicative of the madreporic formation of the soil, simple deposit, which was not yet, but which in time would become an island. The boat sent to sound met in every direction with a coast as steep as a wall. Meanwhile, the natives made hostile demonstrations. Two men entered the boat. One stole the sailor's waistcoat, another put out his hand for the quartermaster's cocked hat, but not knowing how to deal with it, pulled it towards him instead of lifting it up, which gave the quartermaster an opportunity of interfering with his intention. Two large pirogues, each manned by thirty paddlers, showed an intention of attacking the vessels, but the latter immediately chased them. Just as they were running ashore, a struggle ensued, and the English, all but overwhelmed by numbers, were forced to use their arms. Three or four natives were killed. The next day the sailors and such of the sick as could leave their hammocks landed. The natives, intimidated by the lesson they had received in the evening, remained in concealment, whilst the English picked coconuts and gathered anti-scorbutic plants. These timely refreshments were so useful that in a few days there was not a sick man on board. Parrots, rarely beautiful, and tame doves, and several kinds of unknown birds composed the fauna of the island which received the name of King George. That which was discovered afterwards was called Prince of Wales Island. All these lands belong to the Pomontou group, which is also known as the Low Islands, a very suitable name for this archipelago. On the 21st again, a new chain of islands surrounded by breakers was sighted. Byron did not attempt a thorough investigation of these, as to do so he would have incurred risks out of proportion to the benefit to be gained. He called them the Dangerous Islands. Six days later, Duke of York Island was discovered. The English found no inhabitants, but carried off two hundred coconuts, which appeared to them of inestimable value. 
a little farther in latitude one degree eighteen minutes south longitude one hundred seventy three degrees forty six minutes west a desert island received the name of byron it was situated eastward of the gilbert group the heat was overwhelming and the sailors weakened by their long voyage and want of proper food in addition to the putrid water they had been forced to drink were almost all attacked by dysentery at length on the twenty eighth of july byron joyfully recognized sapan and tinian islands which formed part of the marianne or ladrone islands and he prepared to anchor in the very spot where lord anson had cast anchor with the centurion tents were immediately prepared for the sufferers from scurvy almost all the sailors had been attacked by this terrible disease many even had been at the point of death the captain undertook to explore the dense wood which extended to the very edge of the shore in search of the lovely country so enthusiastically described in the account written by lord anson's chaplain how far were these enchanting descriptions from the truth impenetrable forests met him on every side overgrown plants briars and tangled shrubs at every step caught and tore his clothes at the same time the explorers were attacked and stung by clouds of mosquitoes game was scarce and wild the water detestable the roadstead was never more dangerous than at this season the halt was made therefore under unfortunate auspices still in the end limes bitter oranges coconuts breadfruits guavas and others were found but although these productions were beneficial to the invalids who were shortly restored to vigor the malarious atmosphere caused such violent fever that two sailors succumbed to it in addition the rain fell unceasingly, and the heat was overpowering. Byron says that he never experienced such terrific heat, even in his visits to the coast of Guinea, the East Indies, or St. Thomas Island, which is immediately below the equator. Fowls and wild pigs, which weighed about two hundred weight each, were easily procurable, but had to be eaten immediately as in less than an hour decomposition took place lastly the fish caught upon this shore was so unwholesome that even those who ate it in moderation became dangerously ill and risked their lives after a stay of nine weeks the two ships amply provisioned left the port of tinian byron continued his route to the north and after having passed Anatakan Island, already discovered by Anson, he hoped to beat the northeast monsoon before reaching the Bashis, which formed the extreme north of the Philippines. Upon the 22nd he perceived Grafton Island, the most northerly of this group, and upon the 3rd of November he arrived at Timoan which had been mentioned by Dampier as a favorable place for procuring provisions. The natives, however, who are of Malay descent, refused the offer of hatchets, knives, and iron instruments in exchange for fowls. They demanded rupees. Finally, they accepted some handkerchiefs in payment of a dozen fowls, a goat, and its kid. Fortunately, fish was abundant, as it would have been impossible to procure fresh victuals. Byron set sail once more on the 7th November, passed Paolo Condor at a distance, stopped at Paolo Taia, where he encountered a vessel bearing Dutch colors, but which was manned entirely by Malays. Reaching Sumatra, he explored the coast and cast anchor at Batavia, the principal seat of Dutch power in the East Indies, on the 20th November. At this time there were more than 100 ships, large and small, in this roadstead, 
so flourishing was the trade of the East India Company at this epoch. The town was at the height of its prosperity. Its large and open thoroughfares, its admirable canals, bordered by pine trees, its regular buildings, singularly recall the cities of the Netherlands. Portuguese, Chinese, English, Dutch, Persians, Moors, and Malays mixed in the streets and transacted business. Fete, receptions, gaieties of every kind impressed newcomers with a high idea of the prosperity of the town, and contributed to make their stay a pleasant one. The sole drawback, and it was a serious one to cruise after so long a voyage, was the unhealthiness of the locality, where endemic fevers abound. Byron, being aware of this, hurried the embarkation of his provisions, and set sail after an interval of twelve days. Short as their stay had been, it had been too long. The fleet had scarcely reached the strait of the sound before a malignant fever broke out among the crew, disabling half their number and ending in the death of three sailors. After forty-eight days' navigation, Byron perceived the coast of Africa and cast anchor three days later in Table Bay. Cape Town furnished all that he could require. Provisions, water, medicines were all shipped with a rapidity which sufficiently indicated their anxiety in return, and once more the prow of the vessel was directed homewards. Two incidents occurred on the passage across the Atlantic, thus described by Byron. Off St. Helena, in fine weather, and with a favorable wind, the vessel, then at a considerable distance from land, received a shock which was as severe as if she had struck on a rock. Its violence so alarmed us that we all ran to the bridge. Our fears were dissipated when we saw the sea tinged with blood to a great distance. We concluded that we had come in contact with a whale or a grampus, and that our ship had apparently received no damage, which was true. A few days later, however, the Tamar was found to be in such a dilapidated state, such grave injuries were discovered in her rudder, that it was necessary to invent something to replace it, and to enable her to reach the Antilles, it being too great a risk to allow her to continue her voyage. Upon the ninth of May, 1766, the Dauphin anchored in the Downs, after a voyage round the world which had lasted for twenty-three months. This was the most fortunate of all the circumnavigation voyages undertaken by the English. Up to this date, no purely scientific voyage had been attempted. If it was less fruitful of results than had been anticipated, the fault lay not so much with the captain as with the lords of the admiralty. They were not sufficiently accurate in their instructions, and had not taken the trouble, as was done in later voyages, of sending special professors of the various branches of science with the expedition. Full justice, however, was paid to Byron. The title of admiral was conferred on him, and an important command in the East Indies was entrusted to him but we have no interest in the latter part of his life, which ended in 1786, and to that, therefore, we need not allude. End of section 4 Reading by Malone Section 5 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. 
great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter two part two captain cook's predecessors two a the impulse once given england inaugurated a series of scientific expeditions which were to prove so fruitful of results and to raise her naval reputation to such a height admirable indeed is the training acquired in these voyages round the world in them the crew the officers and sailors are constantly brought face to face with unforeseen difficulties and dangers which call forth the best qualities of the sailor the soldier and the man if france succumbed to the naval superiority of great britain during the revolutionary and imperial wars was it not fully as much owing to this stern training of the british seamen as to the internal dissensions which deprived france of the services of the greater part of her naval staff be this as it may the english admiralty shortly after byron's return organized a new expedition their preparations appear to have been far too hasty the dauphin only anchored in the downs at the beginning of may and six weeks later on the nineteenth of june captain samuel wallace received the command this officer after attaining the highest rank in the military marine service had been entrusted with an important command in canada and had assisted in the capture of Louisbourg. we cannot tell what qualities commended him to the admiralty in preference to his companions in arms but in any case the noble lords had no reason to regret their decision wallace hastened to the needful preparations on board the dauphin and on the twenty first of august less than a month after receiving his commission he joined the sloop swallow and the prince frederick in plymouth harbour the latter was in charge of lieutenant brine the former was commanded by philip carteret both were most distinguished officers who had just returned from a voyage round the world with commodore byron and whose reputation was destined to be increased by their second voyage the swallow unfortunately appears to have been quite unfit for the service demanded of her having already been thirty years in service the sheathing was very much worn and her keel was not studded with nails which might have served instead of sheathing to protect her from parasites again the provisions and marketable commodities were so unequally divided that the swallow received much less than the dauphin carteret begged in vain for a rope yarn a forge and various things which his experience told him would be indispensable this rebuff confirmed carteret in his notion that he should not get further than the falkland isles but none the less he took every precaution which his experience dictated to him as soon as the equipment was complete on the twenty second of april seventeen sixty six the vessels set sail it did not take wallace long to find out that the swallow was a bad sailor and that he might anticipate much trouble during his voyage however no accident happened during the voyage to madeira where the vessels put in to revictual upon leaving the port the commander supplied carteret with a copy of his instructions and selected port famine in the strait of magellan as a rendezvous in case of separation their stay at port praia in the island of santiago was shortened on account of the ravages committed there by the smallpox and wallace would not even allow his crew to land shortly after leaving the equator the prince frederick gave signs of distress and it was necessary to send the carpenter on board to stop up a leak on the larboard side this vessel which was provided with inferior provisions counted already a number of sick among her crew
towards eight o'clock in the evening of the nineteenth of november the crews perceived in the northeast a meteor of extraordinary appearance moving in a straight line towards the southwest with marvellous rapidity it was visible for almost a minute and left behind a trail of light so bright that the deck was illuminated as if it were midday on the eighth of december the coast of patagonia was at last visible wallace skirted it until he reached cape virgin where he landed with the armed detachments of the swallow and prince frederick a crowd of natives awaited them upon the shore and received with apparent satisfaction the knives scissors and other trifles which it was usual to distribute upon such occasions but they would not part with guanacos ostriches or any other game which were seen in their possession for any consideration wallace says we took the measure of the largest of them one was six feet six inches in height several were five feet five inches but the average was five foot six or six feet it must be remembered that these were english feet which are only three hundred and five millimeters if these natives were not quite so tall as the giants mentioned by previous navigators they were very little less striking each one continues the narrative carried a strange kind of weapon it consisted of two round stones covered with copper each of which weighed about a pound and they were attached at both ends to a cord about eight feet long they used them like slings holding one of the stones in the hand and whirling the other round the head until it attained sufficient velocity when they threw it towards the object they wished to strike they managed this weapon so adroitly that they could strike a butt no larger than a shilling with both stones at a distance of fifteen rods they did not however employ it in chasing guanacos or ostriches willis conducted eight of these patagonians on board they did not appear surprised as one would have expected at the number of new and extraordinary things they met with they advanced retired made a thousand grimaces before the mirrors shouted with laughter and conversed animatedly amongst themselves their attention was attracted by the pigs for a moment but they were immensely amused with the guinea fowls and turkeys it was difficulty to persuade them to leave the vessel at last they returned to the shore singing and making signs of delight to their countrymen who awaited them on the bank on the seventeenth of december wallace signalled the swallow to head the squadron for the passage of the straits of magellan at port famine the commander had two tents erected on the shore for the sick the woodcutters and the sailors fish in sufficient quantities for each day's meal abundance of celery and acid fruits similar to cranberries and barberries were to be found in this harbor and in the course of about a fortnight these remedies completely restored the numerous sufferers from scurvy the vessels were repaired and partially caulked the sails were mended the rigging which had been a good deal strained was overhauled and repaired and all was soon ready for sea again but wallace first ordered a large quantity of wood to be cut and conveyed on board the prince frederick for transport to the falkland isles where it is not obtainable at the same time he had hundreds of young trees carefully dug up and the roots covered in their native soil to facilitate their transportation in port egmont that in taking root as there was reason to hope they would they might supply the barren archipelago with this precious commodity lastly the provisions were divided between the dauphin and the swallow the former taking sufficient for a year the latter for ten months we will not enlarge upon the different incidents which befell the two ships in the straits of magellan 
such as sudden gales, tempests, and snowstorms, irregular and rapid currents, heavy seas and fogs, which more than once brought the vessels within an inch of destruction. The swallow especially was in such dilapidated condition that Carteret besought Wallace to consider his vessel no longer of any use in the expedition, and to tell him what course should best be pursued for the public good. Wallace replied, The orders of the Admiralty are concise, and you must conform to them, and accompany the Dauphin as long as possible. I am aware that the Swallow is a bad sailor. I will accommodate myself to her speed and follow her movements, for it is most important that in case of accident to one of the ships, the other should be within reach to give all the assistance in her power. Carteret had nothing to urge in reply, but he augured badly for the result of the expedition. As the ships approached the opening of the straits on the Pacific side, the weather became abominable. A thick fog, falls of snow and rain, currents which sent the vessels on to the breakers, a chopping sea, contributed to detain the navigators in the straits until the 10th of April. On that day, the Dauphin and Swallow were separated off Cape Pilar, and could not find each other. Wallace not having fixed a rendezvous in case of separation. Before we follow Wallace on his voyage across the Pacific, we will give a short account of the wretched natives of Tierra del Fuego, and of the general appearance of their country. These wretches, who were as miserable and debased as possible, subsisted upon the raw flesh of seals and penguins. One of our men, says Wallace, who fished with a line, bestowed a live fish which he had just caught, and which was about the size of a herring, upon one of these Americans. He took it with the eagerness of a dog snatching a bone. He commenced operations by killing the fish with a bite near the gills, and proceeded to devour it, beginning at the head and finishing at the tail, without rejecting the bones, fins, scales, or entrails. In fact, these people swallowed everything that was offered to them, cooked or uncooked, fresh or salt, but they refused all drink but water. Their sole covering was a miserable seal-skin reaching to the knees. Their weapons were javelins tipped with a fishbone. They all suffered from bad eyes, which the English attributed to their custom of living in smoke to protect themselves from mosquitoes. Lastly, they emitted a most offensive smell, only to be likened to that of foxes, which doubtless arose from their excessively filthy habits. Although certainly not inviting, this picture is graphic, as all navigators testify. It would appear that progress is not possible to these savages, so nearly allied to brutes. Civilization is a dead letter to them, and they still vegetate like their forefathers, with no wish to improve, and with no ambition to attain a more comfortable existence. Wallace continues, Thus we quitted this savage and uninhabitable region, where for four months we had been in constant danger of shipwreck, where in the height of summer the weather is foggy, cold, and stormy, where almost all the valleys are without verdure, and the mountains without woods, in short, where the land which one can see rather resembles the ruins of a world rather than the abode of living creatures. Wallace was scarcely free of the strait when he set sail westward in spite of dense fogs, and with high wind and such a heavy sea, that for weeks together there was not a dry corner in the ship. The constant exposure to damp endangered cold and severe fevers, to which scurvy shortly succeeded. Upon reaching 32 degrees south latitude and 100 degrees west longitude, the navigator steered due north. Upon the 6th of June, two islands were discovered 
amidst general rejoicings. The ship's boats, well armed and equipped, reached the shore under command of Lieutenant Fourneau. A quantity of coconuts and antiscorbutic plants were obtained, but although the English found huts and sheds, they did not meet with a single inhabitant. This island was discovered on the eve of Whitsunday, and hence received the name Whitsunday. It is situated in 19 degrees 26 minutes south latitude, and 137 degrees 56 minutes west longitude. Like the following islands, it belongs to the Pomontou group. Next day, the English endeavored to make overtures to the inhabitants of another island, but the natives appeared so ill-disposed, and the coast was so steep, that it was impossible to land. After tacking about all night, Wallace dispatched the boats, with orders not to use violence to the inhabitants if they could avoid it, or unless absolutely obliged. As Lieutenant Fourneau approached the land, he was astonished by the sight of two large pirogues with double masts, in which the natives were on the eve of embarking. As soon as they had done so, the English landed and searched the island thoroughly. They discovered several pits full of good water. The soil was firm, sandy, covered with trees, more especially coconut trees, palm trees, and sprinkled with anti-scorbutic plants. The narrative says, The natives of this island were of moderate stature. Their skin was brown, and they had long black hair, straggling over the shoulders. The men were finely formed, and the women were beautiful. Some coarse material formed their garment, which was tied around the waist and appeared to be intended to be raised round the shoulders. In the afternoon, Wallace sent the lieutenant to procure water and to take possession of the island in the name of King George the Third. It was called Queen Charlotte's Island in honor of the English Queen. After reconnoitering personally, Wallace determined to remain in this region for a week in order to profit by the facilities it offered for provisioning. In their walks, the English met with working implements made of shells and sharpened stones shaped like axes, scissors, and awls. They also noticed boats in the course of construction, made of boards joined together. But they were most of all astonished at meeting with tombs upon which the dead bodies were exposed under a sort of awning and were they putrefied in the open air. When they quitted the island, they left hatchets, nails, bottles, and other things as reparation for any damage they might have committed. The seventeenth century teemed with philanthropic aspirations, and from the accounts of all navigators, one is led to believe that the theory so much advocated was put into practice upon most occasions humanity had made great strides. Difference of color no longer presented an insuperable barrier to a man's being treated as a brother, and the convention which at the close of the century ordered the freedom of the black set a seal to the convictions of numbers. The Dauphin discovered new land the same day that she left Queen Charlotte's Island. It lay to the westward, but after cruising along the coast, the vessel was unable to find anchorage. Lying low, it was covered with trees. Neither coconuts nor inhabitants were to be found, and it evidently was merely a rendezvous for the hunters and fishers of the neighboring islands. Wallace therefore decided not to stop. It received the name of Egmont in honor of Lord Egmont, then Chief Lord of the Admiralty. The following days brought new discoveries. Gloucester, Cumberland, William, Henry, and Osnaburg Islands were sighted in succession. Lieutenant Fourneau was able to procure provisions without landing at the last named. Observing several large pirogues on the beach, 
he drew the conclusion that other and perhaps larger islands would be found at no great distance where they would probably find abundant provisions and to which access might be less difficult his prevision was right as the sun rose upon the nineteenth the english sailors were astonished at finding themselves surrounded by pirogues of all sizes having on board no less than eight hundred natives after having consulted together at some distance a few of the natives approached holding in their hands banana branches they were on the point of climbing up the vessels when an absurd accident interrupted these cordial relations one of them had climbed into the gangway when a goat ran at him turning he perceived the strange animal upon its hind legs preparing to attack him again overcome with terror he jumped back into the sea an example quickly followed by the others it recalled the incident of the sheep of panurge recovering from this alarm they again climbed into the ship and brought all their cunning to bear upon petty thefts however only one officer had his hat stolen the vessel all the time was following the coast in search of a fitting harbor whilst the boats coasted the shore for soundings the english had never found a more picturesque and attractive country in any of their voyages on the shore the huts of the natives were sheltered by shady woods in which flourished graceful clusters of coconut trees graduated chains of hills with wooded summits and the silver sheen of rivers glistening amid the verdure as they found their way to the sea added to the beauty of the interior the boats sent to take soundings were suddenly surrounded at the entrance of a large bay by a crowd of pirogues wallace to avoid a collision gave the order for the discharge from the swivel gun above the natives heads but although the noise terrified them they still continued their approach the captain accordingly ordered his boats to make for the shore and the natives finding themselves disregarded threw some sharp stones which wounded a few sailors but the captains of the boats replied to this attack by a volley of bullets which injured one of them and was followed by the flight of the rest the dauphin anchored next day at the mouth of a large river in twenty fathoms of water the sailors rejoiced universally the natives immediately surrounded them with pirogues bringing pigs fowls and various fruits which were quickly exchanged for hardware and nails one of the boats employed in taking soundings however was attacked by blows from paddles and sticks and the sailors were forced to use their weapons one native was killed a second severely wounded and the rest jumped into the water seeing that they were not pursued and conscious that they themselves had been the aggressors they returned to traffic with the dauphin as if nothing had happened upon returning on board the officers reported that the natives had invited them to land more especially the women with unequivocal gestures and that moreover there was excellent anchorage near the shore within reach of water the only inconvenience arose from a considerable swell the dauphin accordingly weighed anchor and proceeded into the open sea to run with the wind when all at once wallace perceived a bay seven or eight miles distant which he determined to reach the captain was soon to experience the truth of the proverb which asserts that one had better leave well alone although soundings were taken by the boats as they advanced the dauphin struck on a rock and damaged her forepart the usual measures in such a case were taken immediately but outside the chain of madreporic rocks no depth could be sounded it was consequently impossible to cast anchor or to use the capstan what course had best be pursued in this critical situation the vessel beat violently against the rocks 
and a host of pirogues waited in expectation of a shipwreck, eager to clutch their prey. Fortunately, at the end of an hour, a favorable breeze rising disengaged the Dauphin and wafted her into good anchorage. The damage done was not serious and was as easily repaired as forgotten. Wallace, rendered prudent by the constant efforts of the natives, divided his men into four parties, one of which was always to be armed, and he ordered guns to be fired. But after one or two rounds, the number of pirogues increased, and no longer laden with poultry, they appeared to be filled with stones. The crews of the larger vessels also were augmented. All at once, upon a given signal, a storm of pebbles fell upon the ship. Wallace ordered a general discharge, and had two guns loaded with fine shot. The natives, after some slight hesitation and disorder, returned to the attack with great bravery, and the captain, noticing the constantly increasing numbers of the assailants, was not without anxiety as to the result when an unexpected event put an end to the contest. Among the pirogues which attacked the Dauphin most energetically was one which appeared to contain a chief, as from it the signal of attack was given. A well-directed shot cut this double pirogue in two. This was enough to decide the natives upon retreat. They set about it so precipitately that in less than half an hour not a single boat remained in sight. The vessel was then towed into port, and so placed as to protect the disembarkation. Lieutenant Fourneau landed at the head of a strong detachment of sailors and marines, and planting the English flag, took possession of the island in the name of the King of England, in whose honor it was named George the Third. The natives called it Tahiti. After prostrating themselves and offering various marks of repentance, the natives appeared anxious to commence friendly and honest business with the English. But fortunately Wallace, who was detained on board by severe illness, perceived preparations for a simultaneous attack by land and sea upon the men sent to find water. The shorter the struggle, the less the loss, acting upon which principle, Directly the natives came within gunshot range, a few discharges dispersed their fleet. To put a stop to these attempts, it was necessary to make an example. Wallace decided with regret that it was so. He accordingly sent a detachment on shore at once with his carpenters, ordering them to destroy every pirogue which was hauled up on the beach. More than fifty many of them sixty feet long, were hacked to pieces. Upon this, the Tahitians decided to give in. They brought pigs, dogs, stuffs, and fruits to the shore, placed them there, and then withdrew. The English left in exchange hatchets and toys, which were carried off to the forest with many delighted gestures. End of section 5 Reading by Malone Section 6 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Malone Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne First Part, Chapter 2, Part 2 Captain Cook's Predecessors, 2b Peace was established, and from the Merrill a regular and abundant traffic commenced, which supplied the ships with the fresh provisions needed by the crews. There was ground for hope that these amicable relations would continue 
during their stay in the island. Now that the natives had once realized the power and effect of the stranger's weapons. Wallace, therefore, ordered a tent to be prepared near the water supply, and disembarked all the sufferers from scurvy, whilst the healthy members of his company were engaged in repairing the rigging, mending the sails, and caulking and repainting the vessel, putting her, in short, in a condition fitted for the long journey which was to take her to England. At this juncture, Wallace's illness assumed an alarming character. The first lieutenant was in hardly better health. All the responsibility of the expedition fell upon Fourneau, who was quite equal to the task. After a rest of fifteen days, during which the peace had not been disturbed, Wallace found all his invalids restored to health. Provisions, however, became less plentiful. The natives, spoilt by the abundance of nails and hatchets, became more exacting. Upon the 15th of July, a tall woman, apparently some forty-five years of age, of majestic appearance, and who seemed to be much respected by the natives, came on board the Dauphin. Wallace at once perceived by the dignity of her deportment and the freedom of her manner, peculiar to persons habituated to command, that she was of high station. He presented her with a blue mantle, a looking-glass, and other gewgaws, which she received with an expression of profound contentment. Upon leaving the vessel she invited the captain to land and to pay her a visit. Wallace, although still very weak, did not fail to comply with this request next day. He was conducted to a large hut, which covered about 327 feet in length and 42 in width. The roof was constructed of palm leaves, and was supported by 53 pillars. A considerable crowd, collected together by the event, lined the approach, and received him respectfully. The visit was enlivened by a comical incident. The surgeon of the vessel, who perspired greatly from the effects of the walk, to relieve himself took off his wig. A sudden exclamation from one of the Indians at this sight drew general attention to the prodigy, and all fixed their eyes upon it. The whole assemblage remained perfectly still for some moments, in the silence of astonishment which could not have been greater if they had seen one of our company decapitated. Next day, a messenger, sent to convey a present to Queen Oberoa, in acknowledgment of her gracious reception, found her giving a feast to several hundred persons. Her servants carried the dishes to her already prepared, the meat in coconut shells, and the shellfish in a sort of wooden trough, similar to those used by our butchers. She herself distributed them with her own hands to each of her guests, who were sitting and standing all round the house. When this was over, she seated herself upon a sort of raised dais, and two women beside her gave her her food. They offered the viands to her in their fingers, and she had only to take the trouble to open her mouth. The consequences of this exchange of civilities were speedily felt. The market was once more fully supplied with provisions, although no longer at the same low price as upon the first arrival of the English. Lieutenant Fourneau reconnoitred the length of the coast westward to gain an idea of the island, and to see what it was possible to obtain from it. The English were everywhere well received. They found a pleasant country, densely populated, whose inhabitants appeared in no hurry to sell their commodities. All their working implements were either of stone or of bone, which led Lieutenant Fourneau to infer that the Tahitians possess no metals. As they had no earthenware vessels, they had no idea that water could be heated. They discovered it one day when the Queen dined on board. One of the principal members of her suite, having seen the surgeon pour water from the boiler into the teapot, 
turned the tap and received the scalding liquor upon his hand. Finding himself burnt, he uttered most frightful screams and ran round the cabin, making most extravagant gestures. His companions, unable to imagine what had happened to him, stared at him with mingled astonishment and fear. The surgeon hastened to interfere, but for a long time the poor Tahitian refused to be comforted. Some days later Wallace discovered that his sailors stole nails to give them to the native women. They even went so far as to raise the planks of the ship to obtain screws, nails, bolts, and all the bits of iron which united them to the timbers. Wallace treated the offense rigorously, but nothing availed, and in spite of the precaution he took of allowing no one to leave the vessel without being searched, these robberies constantly occurred. An expedition undertaken into the interior discovered a large valley watered by a beautiful river. Everywhere the soil was carefully cultivated, and arrangements had been made for watering the gardens and the fruit plantations. Farther penetrations into the interior proved the capacious windings of the river. The valley narrowed, the hills were succeeded by mountains. At every step the way became more difficult. A peak, distant about six miles from the place of landing, was climbed in the hope of thus discovering the entire island, even to its smallest recesses. But the view was intercepted by yet higher mountains. On the side towards the sea, however, nothing interfered with the magnificent view which stretched before their gaze. Everywhere hills covered with magnificent woods, upon whose verdant slopes the huts of the natives stood out clearly, and in the valleys, with their numberless cabins and gardens surrounded by hedges, the scenes were still more enchanting. The sugar cane, ginger plant, tamarind, and tree ferns with coconut trees furnished the principal resources of this fertile country. Wallace, wishing to enrich it still more with the productions of our own climate, caused peach, cherry, and plum stones to be planted, as well as lemon, orange, and lime pips, and sowed quantities of vegetable seeds. At the same time he gave the queen a present of a cat about to kitten, of two cocks, fowls, geese, and other domestic animals, which he hoped might breed well. However, time passed, and Wallace decided to leave. When he announced his intention to the queen, she threw herself upon a seat and cried for a long time, with so much grief that it was impossible to comfort her. She remained upon the vessel up to the last moment, and as it set sail, embraced us, says Wallace, in the tenderest way, weeping plenteously, and our friends the Tahitians bade us farewell with so much sorrow, and in so touching a manner, that I felt heavy-hearted, and my eyes filled with tears. The uncourteous reception of the English, and the repeated attempts made by the natives to seize the vessel, would hardly have led to the idea of a painful separation. However, as the proverb has it, all's well that ends well. Of Wallace's observations of the manners and customs of the island, we shall only enumerate the few following, as we shall have occasion to return to them again in relating the voyages undertaken by Bougainville and Cook. Tall, well-built, active, slightly dark in complexion, the natives were clothed in a species of white stuff made from the bark of trees. Two pieces of stuff completed their costume. One was square and looked like a blanket. The head was thrust through a hole in the center, and it recalled the zarapo of the Mexicans and the poncho of the South American Indian. The second piece was rolled round the body without being tightened. Almost all men and women tattoo their bodies with black lines close together, representing different figures. The operation was thus performed. The pattern was pricked in the skin and the holes filled with a sort of paste composed of oil and grease, 
which left an indelible mark. Civilization has little advanced. We have already stated that the Tahitians did not understand earthenware vessels. Wallace, therefore, presented the queen with a saucepan, which everybody flocked to inspect with extreme curiosity. As to religion, the captain found no trace of that. He only noticed that upon entering certain places, which he took to be cemeteries, they maintained a respectful appearance and wore mourning apparel. One of the natives, more disposed than his companions to adopt English manners, was presented with a complete suit of clothes, which became him very well. Jonathan, so they named him, was quite proud of his new outfit. To put the finishing touch to his manners, he desired to learn the use of a fork, but habit was too strong for him. His hands always went to his mouth, and the bit of meat at the end of the fork found its way to his ear. It was the 27th of July when Wallace left the George III Island. After coasting Duke of York Island, he discovered several islands or islets in succession upon which he did not touch. For example, Charles Saunders, Lord Howe, Scilly, Boscoen, and Keppel Islands, where the hostile character of the natives and the difficulty of disembarkation prevented his landing. Winter was now to begin in the southern region. The vessel leaked in all directions. The stern especially was much strained by the rudder. Was it wise, under such circumstances, to sail for Cape Horn or the Straits of Magellan? Would it not be running the risk of certain shipwreck? Would it not be better to reach Tinian or Batavia, where repairs were possible, and to return to Europe by the Cape of Good Hope? Wallace decided upon the latter course. He steered for the northwest, and upon the 19th of September, after a voyage which was too fortunate to supply any incidents, he cast anchor in the Tinian harbor. The incidents which marked Byron's stay in this place were repeated with far too much regularity. Wallace could not rejoice over its facilities for provisioning or the temperature of the country any more than his predecessors. But the sufferers from scurvy recovered in a short time. The sails were mended, and the vessel caulked and repaired, and the crew had the unexpected good fortune of catching new fever. On the 16th October, 1769, the Dauphin returned to sea, but this time she encountered a succession of frightful storms, which tore the sails, reopened the leakage, broke the rudder, and carried away the poop with all that was to be found on the forecastle. However, the Bashies were rounded and Formosa Strait crossed. Sandy Isle, Small Key, Long Island, and New Island were recognized, as also Condor, Timor, Aros, Pisang, Paolo Taya, Pulo Tote, and Sumatra, before the arrival at Batavia, which took place upon the 30th of November. We have already had occasion to mention the localities which witnessed the completion of the voyage. It is enough to state that from Batavia, where the crews took the fever, Wallace proceeded by the Cape, thence to St. Helena, and finally arrived in the Downs on the 20th of May, 1768, after 637 days' voyage. It is to be regretted that Hawksworth has not reproduced the instructions Wallace received from the Admiralty. Without knowing what they were, we cannot decide whether this brave sailor carried out the orders he had received au pied de la lettre. We have seen that he followed with little variation the route traced by his predecessors in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, nearly all had approached by the dangerous archipelago, leaving unexplored that portion of Oceania where islands are most numerous and where Cook was later to make such important discoveries. 
clever as a navigator wallace understood how to obtain from a hasty and incomplete equipment unexpected resources which enabled him to bring an adventurous enterprise to a successful close he is equally to be honored for his humanity and the efforts he made to collect reliable information of the countries he visited had he only been accompanied by special men of science there is no doubt that their scientific harvest would have been abundant the fault lay with the admiralty we have related how on the tenth of april seventeen sixty seven as the dauphin and the swallow entered the pacific the former carried away by a strong breeze had lost sight of the latter and had been unable to follow her this separation was most unfortunate for captain carteret he knew better than any of his crew the dilapidated condition of his vessel and the insufficiency of his provisions in short he was well aware that he could only hope to meet the dauphin in england as no plan of operation had been arranged and no rendezvous had been named a grave omission on wallace's part who was also aware of the condition of his consort nevertheless carteret allowed none of his apprehensions to come to the knowledge of the crew at first the detestable weather experienced by the swallow upon the pacific ocean most misleading name allowed no time for reflection the dangers of the passing moment in which there was every prospect of their being engulfed hid from them the perils of the future carteret steered for the north by the coast of chile upon investigating the quantity of soft water which he had on board he found it quite insufficient for the voyage he had undertaken he determined therefore before setting sail for the west to take in water at juan fernandez or at Masafuero. the weather continued wretched upon the evening of the twenty seventh a sudden squall was followed by a rising wind which carried the vessel straight to the cape the violence of the storm failed to carry away the masts or to founder the ship the tempest continued in all its fury and the sails being extremely wet clung round the masts and rigging so closely that it was impossible to work them next day a sudden wave broke the mizzenmast just where there was a flaw in the sail and submerged the vessels for a few moments the storm only abated sufficiently to allow the crew of the swallow time to recover a little and to repair the worst damage then recommenced and continued with violent squalls until the seventh of may the wind then became favorable and three days later juan fernandez was reached carteret was not aware that the spaniards had fortified this island he was therefore extremely surprised at seeing a large number of men upon the shore and at perceiving a battery of four pieces on the beach and a fort pierced with twenty embrasures and surmounted by the spanish flag upon a hill the rising wind prevented an entrance into cumberland bay and after cruising about for an entire day carteret was obliged to content himself with reaching Masafuero. but he met the same obstacles and the surge which broke upon the shore interfered with his operations and it was only with the utmost difficulty that he succeeded in shipping a few casks of water some of the crew who had been forced by the state of the sea to remain on land killed guinea fowls enough to feed the entire crew these with the exception of some seals and plenty of fish were the sole result of a stay marked by a succession of squalls and storms which constantly placed the ship in danger carteret who owing to unfavorable winds had had several opportunities of noticing Masafuero, corrected many of the errors in the account of lord anson's voyage and furnished many details of inestimable use to navigators on leaving Masafuero, carteret steered northward in the hope of meeting the southeastern trade wind 
carried farther than he had counted upon, he determined to seek St. Ambrose and St. Felix Island, or the island of St. Paul. Now that the Spaniards had taken possession of and fortified Juan Fernandez, those islands might be of great value to the English in the event of war. But Mr. Green's charts and the elements of navigation by Robertson did not tally as to their situation. Carteret, having most confidence in the latter work, sought for them in the north and failed to find them. In re-reaching the description given by Wazer, Davis's surgeon, he thought these two islands were identical with the land met with by that filibuster in his route to the south of the Galapagos Islands, and that Davis's land did not exist. This caused a double error, that of identifying St. Felix Island with Davis's land, and of denying the existence of the latter, which is in reality Easter Island. At this parallel, says Carteret, that is, in eighteen degrees west from his point of departure, we had fresh breezes, and a strong northerly current, and other reasons for conjecturing that we were near Davis's land, which we were seeking so carefully. But a stiff breeze rising again, we steered quarter southwest, and reached twenty-eight and a half degrees southern latitude, from which it follows that if this land or anything answering to it exists, I must infallibly have fallen in with it, or at least have seen it. I afterwards remained in twenty-eight degrees south latitude and forty degrees west of my point of departure, and, as far as I can conjecture, one hundred and twenty-one degrees west London. All the navigators combined in insisting upon the existence of a southern continent. Carteret could not conceive that Davis's land was but a small island, a spot lost in the immensity of the ocean. As he found no continent, he decided upon the non-existence of Davis's land. It was precisely in this way that he was misled. Carteret continued his search until the 7th of June. He was in 28 degrees south latitude and 112 degrees west longitude. That is to say, he was in the immediate neighborhood of Easter Island. It was still the depth of winter. The sea ran continually high. Violent and variable winds, dull, foggy, and cold weather, was accompanied by thunder, rain, and snow. No doubt it was owing to the great darkness, and to the thick fog which hid the sun for several days, that Carteret failed to perceive Easter Island, for many signs, such as the number of birds, floating seaweeds, and so on, announce the neighborhood of land. These atmospheric troubles again retarded the voyage, in addition to which the swallow was as bad a sailor as possible, and one may guess at the weariness, the preoccupation, even the mental suffering of the captain, who saw his crew on the point of starvation. But in spite of all, the voyage was continued by day and night in a westerly direction until the 2nd of July. Upon this day, land was discovered to the north, and on the morrow, Carteret was sufficiently close to recognize it. It was only a great rock, five miles in circumference, covered with trees, which appeared uninhabited, but the swell, so prevalent at this time of year, prevented the vessel coming alongside. It was named Pitcairn, after the first discoverer. In these latitudes the sailors, previously in good health, felt the first attacks of scurvy. Upon the eleventh a new land was seen in twenty-two degrees southern latitude, and a hundred and forty-five degrees thirty-four minutes longitude. It received the name of Osnaburg in honor of the king's second son. Next day Carteret sent an expedition to two more islands, where neither eatables nor water were found. The sailors caught many birds in their hands, 
as they were so tame they did not fly at the approach of man. All these islands belong to the dangerous group, a long chain of low islands, clusters of which were the despair of all navigators for the few resources they offered. Carteret thought he recognized Quiros in the land discovered, but this place, which is called by the natives Tahiti, is situated more to the north. Sickness, however, increased daily. The adverse winds, but especially the damage the ship had sustained, made her progress very slow. Carteret thought it necessary to follow the route upon which he was most likely to obtain provisions and the needful repairs. My intention, in the event of my ship being repaired, says Carteret, was to continue my voyage to the south upon the return of a favorable season, with a view to new discoveries in that quarter of the world. In fact, I had settled in my own mind, if I could find a continent where sufficient provisions were procurable, to remain near its coast until the sun had passed the equator, then to gain a distant southern latitude, and to proceed westward towards the Cape of Good Hope, and to return eastward after touching at the Falkland Islands, should it be necessary, and thence to proceed quickly to Europe. These laudable intentions show Carteret to have been a true explorer, rather stimulated than intimidated by danger, but it proved impossible to carry them into execution. End of section 6 Reading by Malone Section 7 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part. Chapter 2, Part 2. Captain Cook's Predecessors, 2C. The trade wind was only met on the 16th, and the weather remained detestable. Above all, although Carteret navigated in the neighborhood of Danger Island, discovered in 1765 by Byron and by others, he saw no land. We probably were close by land, he says, which the fog prevented our seeing, for in these waters numbers of birds constantly flew round the ship. Commodore Byron, in his last voyage, had passed the northern limits of this portion of the ocean, in which the Solomon Islands are said to be situated, and, as I have been myself beyond the southern limit without seeing them, I have good reason for thinking that if these islands exist, they have been badly marked on all the charts. This last supposition is correct, but the Solomon Islands do exist, and Carteret stopped there a few days later without recognizing them. The victuals were now all but consumed or tainted, the rigging and the sails torn by the tempest, half the crew on the sick list, when a fresh alarm for the captain arose. A leak was reported just below the load water line. It was impossible to stop it as long as they were in the open sea. By unexpected good fortune land was seen on the morrow. Needless to say, what cries of delight, what acclamations followed this discovery. To use Carteret's own comparison, the feelings of surprise and comfort experienced by the crew can only be likened to those of a criminal who at the last moment on the scaffold receives a reprieve. It was Nitendit Island, already discovered by Mendana. No sooner was the anchor cast than landing was hurried in search of water supply. The natives were black, with woolly hair and perfectly naked. They appeared upon the shore, but fled again before the boat could come up with them. The leader of the landing party described the country as wild, bristling with mountains and impenetrable forests of trees and shrubs, 
reaching to the shore itself, through which ran a fine current of fresh water. The following day, the master was sent in search of an easier landing place, with orders to propitiate the natives, if possible, by presence. He was expressly enjoined not to expose himself to danger, to return if several pirogues advanced against him, not to leave the boat himself, and not to allow more than two men to land at once, whilst the remainder held themselves on the defensive. Carteret, at the same time, sent his ship's boat on shore for water. Some natives attacked it with arrows, which fortunately hit no one. Meantime, the sloop regained the swallow. The master had three arrows in his body, and half his crew were so dangerously wounded that three sailors and he himself died a few days later. This is what happened. Landing the fifth in succession in a spot where he had noticed huts, he entered into friendly traffic with the natives. The latter soon increased in numbers, and several large pirogues advanced towards his sloop, and he was unable to rejoin it until the very moment when the attack commenced. Pursued by the arrows of the natives, who waded up to their shoulders into the water, chased by pirogues, he only succeeded in escaping after having killed several natives and foundered one of their boats. This effort to find a more favorable spot where he might run the swallow ashore, having ended so unfortunately, Carteret heaved his ship down where he was, and efforts were made to stop the leak. If the carpenter, the only healthy man on board, did not succeed in perfectly stopping it, he at least considerably diminished it. Whilst a fresh landing for water was sought, the fire of the guns was directed upon the woods, as well as volleys of musketry from the sloop. Still the sailors worked for a quarter of an hour, when they were attacked by a shower of arrows, which grievously wounded one or two in the breast. The same measures were necessary each time they fetched water. At this juncture, thirty of the crew became incapable of performing their duty. The master died of his wounds. Lieutenant Gower was very ill. Carteret himself, attacked by a bilious and inflammatory illness, was forced to keep his bed. These three were the only officers capable of navigating the Swallow to England, and they were on the point of succumbing. To stay the ravages of disease, it was necessary to procure provisions at all costs, and this was utterly impossible in this spot. Carteret weighed anchor on the 17th of August, after calling the island Egmont, in honor of the Lord of the Admiralty, and the bay where he had anchored Swallow. Although convinced that it was identical with the land named Santa Cruz by the Spaniards, the navigator nevertheless followed the prevailing mania of giving new appellations to all the places he visited. He then coasted the shore for a short distance and ascertained that the population was large. He had many a crow to pick with the natives. These obstacles, and moreover the impossibility of procuring provisions, prevented Carteret's reconnoitering the other islands of this group upon which he bestowed the name of Queen Charlotte. The inhabitants of Egmont Isle, he says, are extremely agile, active, and vigorous. They appear to live as well in water as on land, for they are continually jumping from their pirogues into the sea. One of the arrows which they sent passed through the planks of the boat and dangerously wounded the officer at the poop in the thigh. Their arrows are tipped with stone, and we saw no metal of any kind in their possession. The country in general is covered with woods and mountains, and interspersed with a great number of valleys. On the 18th of August, 1767, Carteret left this group with the intention of regaining Great Britain. He fully expected to meet with an island on his passage, where he might be more fortunate 
and on the 20th he actually did so, discovering a little low island which he named Gower, where coconuts were procurable. Next day he encountered Simpson and Carteret Islands, and a group of new islands which he took to be the Ohang Java, discovered by Tasman. Then successively Sir Charles Hardy and Winchelsea Islands, which he did not consider as belonging to the Solomon Archipelago, the island of St. John, so-called Shooton, and finally that of New Britain, which he gained on the 28th of August. Carteret coasted this island in search of a safe and convenient port, and stopped in various bays where he obtained water, wood, cocoa, nutmegs, aloes, sugar canes, bamboos, and palm cabbages. This cabbage, he says, is white, crisp, of a substance filled with sugar. Eaten raw, the flavor resembles that of a chestnut, and boiled it is superior to the best parsnip. We cut it into small strips and boiled it in the broth made from our cakes, and this broth, afterwards thickened with oatmeal, furnished us with a good meal. The wood was all alive with pigeons, turtle doves, parroquets, and other unknown birds. The English visited several deserted huts. If an idea of the civilization of a people can be drawn from their dwellings, these islanders were on the lowest rung of the social ladder, for their huts were the most miserable Carteret had ever seen. The commander profited by his stay in this place, by once more overhauling the swallow, and attending to the leak, which the carpenters doctored as well as they could. The sheathing was greatly worn, and the keel quite gnawed away by worms. They coated it with pitch and warm tar mixed together. On the 7th of September, Carteret accomplished the ridiculous ceremony of taking possession of the country in the name of George the Third. He then dispatched one of his boats upon a reconnoitering expedition, which returned with a quantity of cocoa and palm cabbages most precious provision for the sick on board. In spite of the fact that the monsoon would soon blow from the east for a long time, Carteret, alive to the dilapidated condition of his ship, determined to start for Batavia, where he hoped to make up his crew and to repair the swallow. Upon the ninth September, therefore, he left Carteret Harbor, the best which he had met with since leaving the Straits of Magellan. He soon penetrated to a gulf to which Dampier had given the name of St. George Bay, and was not long in reconnoitering for a strait which separated New Britain and New Ireland. This passage he found and named St. George. He describes it in his narrative with a care which should certainly have earned for him the thanks of all his contemporary navigators. He then followed the coast of New Ireland to its southern extremity. Near a little island which he named Sandwich, Carteret had some dealings with the natives. These natives, he says, are black and have woolly hair like negroes, but they have not flat noses or large lips. We imagine them to be of the same race as the inhabitants of Egmont Island. Like them, they are entirely naked, if we accept some ornaments of shells, which they attach to their arms and legs. At the same time, they have adopted a fashion without which our fashionable men and women are not supposed to be perfectly dressed. They powder their hair, or rather the wool on their heads, white, from which it follows that the fashion of wearing powder is probably of greater antiquity and of more extended fashion than we would have generally supposed. They are armed with spears and large sticks in the shape of clubs, but we perceived neither bows nor arrows. At the southwestern extremity of New Ireland, Carteret found another land, to which he gave the name of New Hanover, and shortly afterwards the group of the Duke of Portland. 
Although all the portion of the narrative of his voyage, in countries unknown before his time, abounds in precious details, Carteret, a far more able and zealous navigator than his predecessors Byron and Wallace, makes excuses for not having collected more facts. The description of the country, he says, and of its productions and inhabitants, would have been far more complete and detailed had I not been so weakened and overcome by the illness to which I had succumbed through the duties which devolved upon me from want of officers. When I could scarcely drag myself along, I was obliged to take watch after watch and to share in other labors with my lieutenant, who was also in a bad state of health. After leaving St. George's Strait, the route was westward. Carteret discovered several other islands, but illness for several days prevented his coming on deck, and therefore he could not determine their position. He named them Admiralty Islands, and after two attacks found himself forced to employ firearms to repulse the natives. He afterwards reconnoitred Durur and Matty Islands and the Quedes, whose inhabitants were quite delighted at receiving bits of an iron hoop. Carteret affirms that he might have bought all the productions of this country for a few iron instruments. Although they are the neighbors of New Guinea and of the groups they had just explored, these natives were not black, but copper-colored. They had very long black hair, regular features, and brilliantly white teeth. Of medium height, strong and active, they were cheerful and friendly, and came on board fearlessly. One of them even asked permission to accompany Carteret upon his voyage, and in spite of all the representations of his countrymen, and even of the captain, he refused to leave the swallow. Carteret, meeting with so decided a will, consented. But the poor Indian, who had received the name of Joseph Freewill, soon faded away and died at Celebes. On the 29th October, the English reached the northeastern portion of Mindanao, Always on the lookout for fresh water and provisions, Carteret in vain looked for the bay which Dampier had spoken of as abounding in game. A little further off he found a watering place, but the hostile demonstrations of the inhabitants forced him to re-embark. After leaving Mindanao, the captain sailed for the Straits of Makassar, between the islands of Borneo and Celebes. They entered it on the 14th of November. The vessel then proceeded with so much difficulty that she only accomplished twenty-eight leagues in fifteen days. Ill, he says, weakened, dying, tortured by the sight of lands which we could not reach, exposed to tempests which we found it impossible to overcome, we were attacked by a pirate. The latter, hoping to find the English crew asleep, attacked the swallow in the middle of the night. But far from allowing themselves to be cowed by this new danger, the sailors defended themselves with so much courage and skill that they succeeded in foundering the Malay pra. On the 12th of December, Carteret sorrowfully perceived that the western monsoon had commenced. The swallow was in no condition to struggle against this wind and current to reach Batavia by the west. He must then consent himself with gaining Makassar, then the principal colony of the Dutch in the Celebes Islands. When the English arrived, it was thirty-five weeks since they had left the Straits of Magellan. Anchor was scarcely cast when a Dutchman, sent by the governor, came on board the Swallow. He appeared much alarmed on finding that the vessel belonged to the English Marine Service. In the morning, therefore, when Carteret sent his lieutenant, 
Mr. Gower to ask for access to the port in order to secure provisions for his dying crew and to repair his dilapidated ship and await the return of the monsoon, not only could he not obtain permission to land, but the Dutch hastened to collect their forces and arm their vessels. Finally, after five hours, the governor's reply was brought on board. It was a refusal couched in terms as little polite as they were equivocal. The English were simultaneously forbidden to land at any port under Dutch government. All Carteret's representations, his remarks upon the inhumanity of the refusal, even his hostile demonstrations, had no other result than the sale of a few provisions and permission to proceed to a small neighboring bay. He would find there, he was told, certain shelter from the monsoon, and might set up a hospital for his sick, that indeed he could procure more plentiful provisions than in Macassar, from whence they would send him all that he could need. Fearing death by starvation and foundering, it was necessary to overlook these exactions, and Carteret proceeded to the roadstead of Bonthane. There the sick, installed in a house, found themselves prohibited from going more than thirty roods from their hospital. They were kept under guard, and could not communicate with the natives. Lastly, they were forbidden to buy anything excepting through the agency of the Dutch soldiers, who strangely abused their power, often making more than a thousand percent profit. All the complaints of the English were useless. They were forced to submit, during their stay, to a surveillance to the last degree humiliating. It was only on the 22nd of May, 1768, on the return of the monsoon, that Captain Carteret was able to leave Bonthian, after a long series of annoyances, vexations, and alarms, which it is impossible to give in detail, and which had sorely tried his patience. Celebes, he says, is the key to the Moluccas, or Spice Islands, which are necessarily under the power of the people who are masters of this island. The town of Macassar is built upon a promontory, and is watered by one or two rivers which cross it or flow in its vicinity. The ground is even and beautiful in appearance. There are many plantations and coconut woods, interspersed with houses, which convey the idea that it is well populated. At Bonthian the beef is excellent, but it is difficult to procure enough of it to feed a fleet. Fowls, and as much rice and fruits as can be wished, are procurable. The woods abound with wild pigs, which are to be had cheap, because the natives, being Mohammedans, do not eat them. These details, however incomplete, had great interest at the time they were collected, and we go so far as to believe that even now, some hundred years since they were first written, they yet contain a certain amount of truth. No incident marked the voyage to Batavia. After several delays, caused by the desire of the Dutch company to make Carteret give them a testimonial as to the treatment he had met with from the government of Macassar, and which he steadily refused, Carteret at last obtained permission to repair his vessel. On the 15th of December, the Swallow, partially refitted, set sail. She was reinforced with a supplementary number of English sailors, without which it would have been impossible to regain Europe. Eighty of her original crew were dead, and eighty more were so reduced that seven of their number died before they reached the Cape. After a stay in this port, a most salutary one for the crew, which lasted until the 6th of January, 1769, Carteret set out once more, and a little beyond Ascension Island, at which he had touched, he met a French vessel. It was the frigate La Boudeuse, 
with which Bougainville had just been round the world. On the 20th of March, the Swallow anchored in Spithead Roadstead, after thirty-one months of a voyage as painful as it had been dangerous. All Carteret's nautical abilities, all his sang-froid, all his enthusiasm were needed to save so inefficient a vessel from destruction, and to make important discoveries under which conditions, if the perils of the voyage add luster to his renown, the shame of such a miserable equipment falls upon the English Admiralty, who, despising the representations of an able captain, risked his life and the lives of his crew upon so long a voyage. End of section 7 Recording by Malone Section 8 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 3, Captain Cook's Predecessors, 3a. Bougainville, a notary's son metamorphosed, colonization of the Malouine Islands, Buenos Aires and Rio Janeiro, the Malouine relinquished to the Spaniards, hydrography of the Strait of Magellan, the Percheré, the Quatre Facardius, Tahiti, incidents of the stay there, productions of the country and manners of the inhabitants, Samoa Islands, the land of the Holy Spirit or the New Hebrides, the Louisiade, the Anchorite Isles, New Guinea, Bouton, from Batavia to Saint-Malo. Whilst Wallace completed his voyage round the world, and Carteret continued his long and hazardous circumnavigation, a fresh expedition was organized for the purpose of prosecuting new discoveries in the southern seas. Under the old regime, when all was arbitrary, titles, rank, and places were obtained by interest. It was therefore not surprising that a military officer, who left the army scarcely four years before with the rank of colonel, to enter the navy as a captain, should obtain this important command. Strangely enough, this singular measure was amply justified, thanks to the talents possessed by the favored recipient. Louis-Antoine de Bougainville was born at Paris on the 13th of November, 1729. The son of a notary, he was destined for the bar and was already an advocate. But having no taste for his father's profession, he devoted himself to the sciences and published a treatise on the integral calculus, whilst he obtained a commission in the Black Musketeers. Of the three careers he thus entered upon, he entirely abandoned the first two, slightly neglected the third, for the sake of a fourth, diplomacy, and finally left it entirely for a fifth, the naval service. He was destined to die a member of the Senate after a sixth metamorphosis. First aide-de-camp to Chevray, then secretary of the embassy in London, where he was made a member of the Royal Society, he left Brest in 1756 with the rank of captain of dragoons to rejoin Montcalm in Canada. Becoming aide-de-camp to this general, he distinguished himself on various occasions and obtained the confidence of his chief, who sent him to France, to ask for reinforcements. 
That unhappy country was just then overwhelmed with reverses in Europe, and had need of all her resources. Therefore, when young Bougainville entered upon the object of his mission to Monsieur de Choiseul, the minister answered brusquely, When the house is on fire, one does not worry oneself about the stables. At least, replied Bougainville, no one can say that you speak like a horse. This sally was too witty and too stinging to conciliate the minister. Ultimately, Madame de Pompadour, who appreciated witty people, introduced Bougainville to the king, and although he did not succeed in obtaining much for his general, he gained a colony and the order of Saint-Louis for himself, although he had only seen seven years' service. Returning to Canada, he was anxious to justify Louis XIV's confidence, and distinguished himself in various matters. After the loss of his colony, he served in Germany under Monsieur de Choiseul Stainville. His military career was cut short by the peace of 1763. His active spirit and love of movement rebelled against a garrison life. He conceived the strange idea of colonizing the Falkland Islands in the extreme south of South America, and of conveying there, free of expense, the emigrants from Canada who had settled in France to escape the tyrannous yoke of England. Carried away by this idea, he addressed himself to certain privateers at Saint-Malo, who, from the commencement of the century, had been in the habit of visiting the group, and who had named them Malouine Islands. Having gained their confidence, Bougainville brought the advantages, however problematical, of this colony to the minister's notice, maintaining that the fortunate situation of the island would secure a good resting place for ships going to the southern seas. Having high interest, he obtained the authority he desired, and received his nomination as ship captain. It was the year 1763. There is little reason to suppose that marine officers who had passed all the grades of the service looked with gratification upon an appointment which no past event justified. But that mattered little to the Minister of Marine, Monsieur de Choiseul Stainville. Bougainville had served under him, and was far too grand a personage to trouble himself about the grumbling of ship's officers. Bougainville, having brought his uncle and cousin, Messieurs de Nerville and d'Arboulin, to look favorably upon his venture, caused the eagle of twenty guns and the sphinx of twelve to be built at Saint-Malo under the auspices of Monsieur Guizot Duclos. Upon these he embarked several Canadian families. Leaving Saint-Malo on the 15th of September, 1763, he rested at St. Catherine's Island, on the coast of Brazil, and at Montevideo, where he took horses and cattle, and landed at the Malouine in a large bay, which appeared to him wholly suited to his purpose, but he was not long in discovering that what he had taken by preceding navigators for woods of moderate height were only reeds. Not a tree, not a shrub grew in the islands. Fortunately, an excellent turf did for fuel in their stead, whilst fish and game offered good resources. The colony consisted at first of only twenty-nine persons, for whom huts were built and also a provision warehouse. At the same time a fort, capable of holding fourteen guns, was planned and commenced. Monsieur de Nerville agreed to remain at the head of the establishment, whilst Bougainville returned to France on the 5th of April. There he recruited some more colonists, and took a considerable cargo of provisions of every kind which he disembarked on the 5th of January, 1765. 
He then went to the Strait of Magellan in search of a cargo of wood, and having, as we have already narrated, met Commodore Byron's squadron, followed it to Port Famine. There he took in more than ten thousand saplings of different growths, which he intended to transport to the Malouine. When he left the group on the twenty-seventh of April following, the colony already numbered eighty persons, comprising a staff paid by the king. Towards the end of 1765, the same two vessels were sent back with provisions and new colonists. The colony was beginning to make a show when the English settled themselves in Port Egmont, reconnoitred by Byron. At the same time, Captain McBride attempted to obtain possession of the colony, on the ground that the island belonged to the English king, although Byron had not recognized the Malouine in 1765, and the French had then settled there two years. In the meantime, Spain laid claim to it in her turn, as a dependency of Southern America. England and France were equally adverse to a breach of the peace for the sake of this archipelago, which was of so little commercial value, and Bougainville was forced to relinquish his undertaking on condition that the Spanish government indemnified him for his expenses. In addition, he was ordered by the French government to facilitate the restoration of the Malouine to the Spanish commissioners. This foolish attempt at colonization was the origin and groundwork of Bougainville's good fortune, for in order to make use of the last equipment, the minister ordered Bougainville to return by the South Sea and to make discoveries. In the early days of November, 1766, Bougainville repaired to Nantes, where his second-in-command, Monsieur Duclos Guillot, captain of the fireship, and an able and veteran sailor, who grew gray in the inferior rank because he was not noble, superintended the equipment of the frigate La Boudeuse of twenty-six guns. Bougainville left the roadstead of Menden at the mouth of the Loire on the 15th of November for La Plata River, where he hoped to find two Spanish vessels, the Esmeralda and the Liebre, but scarcely had the Boudeuse gained the open sea when a furious tempest arose. The frigate, the rigging of which was new, sustained such serious damages that it was necessary to put for repairs into Brest, which she entered on the 21st November. This experience sufficed to convince the captain that the Boudeuse was but little fitted for the voyage he had before him. He therefore had the masts shortened, and changed his artillery for less heavy pieces. But in spite of these modifications, the Boudeuse was not fit for the heavy seas and storms of Cape Horn. However, the rendezvous with the Spaniards was arranged, and Bougainville was obliged to put to sea. The staff of the frigate consisted of eleven officers and three volunteers, among whom was the Prince of nassau Siegen. The crew comprised two hundred and three sailors, boys, and servants. As far as La Plata, the sea was calm enough to allow of Bougainville's making many observations on the currents, a frequent source of the errors made by navigators in their reckonings. On the 31st of January, La Boudeuse anchored in Montevideo Bay, where the two Spanish frigates had been awaiting her for a month, under the command of Don Felipe Perici Spuente. The long stay Bougainville made in this part, and also at Buenos Aires, enabled him to collect facts about the city and the manners of the inhabitants, which are too curious to be passed over in silence. Buenos Aires appeared to them too large for its population, which amounted only to twenty thousand. 
the reason being that the houses are of only one story and have large courts or gardens. Not only has this town no fort, but it has not even a jetty. Thus ships are forced to discharge their cargoes on to lighters, which convey them to the little river, where carts come to take the bales and convey them to the town. The number of religious communities, both male and female, in Buenos Aires adds to the originality of its character. Bougainville says, The year is full of saint days, which are celebrated by processions and fireworks. Religious ceremonies supply the place of theaters. The Jesuits incite the women to greater austerity in their piety than any other order. Attached to their convent, they have an institution entitled Casa de los Egericios de las Mujeres, that is, House for the Devotion of Women. Women and girls, without the permission of husbands or fathers, enter the retreat for twelve days to increase their sanctity. They were lodged and boarded at the expense of the company. No man ever set foot in this sanctuary unless in the cowl of St. Ignatius. Servants even of the female sex were not allowed to accompany their mistresses. The devotional services consisted of meditation, prayer, catechizings, confession, and flagellation. We were shown the stains on the walls of the chapel made by the blood which flowed under the hands of these Magdalens as they did penance. The environs of the town were well cultivated and brightened by a large number of country houses named Quintas, but scarcely two or at most three leagues from Buenos Aires were immense plains with scarcely a single undulation given up to bulls and horses, which are almost the only inhabitants. Bougainville says, These animals were so abundant that travelers, when they needed food, would kill a bull, consume what they could eat, and leave the rest to be devoured by wild dogs and tigers. The Spaniards had not yet succeeded in subduing the Indian tribes on the two shores of La Plata River. They were called Indios Bravos. They are of medium height, very ugly, and almost all infected with the itch. Their complexions are very dark, and the grease with which they perpetually rub themselves makes them even blacker. Their sole garment is the skin of the roebuck, which reaches to the heels, and in which they wrap themselves. These Indians pass their lives on horseback, at least near the Spanish settlement. They occasionally come there with their wives to buy eau de Cologne, and they never cease drinking until drunkenness literally deprives them of the power to move. Sometimes they assemble in droves of two or three hundred to carry off the cattle from the Spanish lands, or to attack the caravans of travelers. They pillaged, massacred, and carried off slaves. It was an evil without remedy. How was it possible to subdue a wandering nation in a vast and uncultivated country, where it was difficult even to meet with them? Commerce was far from flourishing, as no European merchandise was allowed to pass by land to Peru or Chile. Nevertheless, Bougainville saw a vessel leaving Buenos Aires carrying a million piastres, and if, adds he, all the inhabitants of this country had the traffic of their hides in Europe, that of itself would be enough to enrich them. The anchorage of Montevideo was safe, although several times they were visited by Pamperos, a scourge of the southwest, accompanied by violent tempests. The town offered nothing of interest. The environs are so uncultivated that it is necessary to import flour, biscuits, and everything necessary for the boats. But fruits, such as figs, peaches, apples, lemons, and so on, are plentiful. 
as well as the same quantity of butcher's meat as in the rest of the country. These documents, which are all a hundred years old, are curious when compared with those furnished by contemporary navigators, especially by Monsieur Emile Derot in his work on La Plata. In many respects this picture is still correct, but there are other details, such, for instance, as regards instruction, of which Bougainville could not speak as it did not exist, in which it has made immense progress. When the victuals, the provisions of water, and the cattle were embarked, the three vessels set sail on the 28th of February, 1767, for the Malouine. The voyage was not fortunate. Variable winds, heavy weather, and a running sea caused much damage to the Boudeuses. On the 23rd of March, she cast anchor in French Bay, where she was joined on the morrow by two Spanish vessels, which had been much tried by the tempest. Upon the 1st of April, the restitution of the colony to the Spaniards was solemnized. Very few French profited by their king's permission to remain in the Malouine. Almost all preferred to embark upon the Spanish frigates upon their leaving Montevideo. As for Bougainville, he was forced to await the provisions, which the flyboat Etoile was to bring him, and which was to accompany him upon his voyage round the world. However, the months of March, April, and May passed, and no Etoile appeared. It was impossible to cross the Pacific with only six months' provisions, which was all the Boudeuses carried. Bougainville decided at last, on the 2nd of June, to reach Rio Janeiro, which he had mentioned to Monsieur de la Gironde, the commander of the Etoile as a rendezvous, should unforeseen circumstances prevent his reaching the Malouine. The crossing was made with such favorable weather that only eighteen days were needed to reach the Portuguese colony. The Etoile, which had been awaiting her for four days, had left France later than was expected. She had been forced to seek shelter from the tempest at Montevideo, from whence, following her instructions, she gained Rio. Well received by the Count of Acuna, viceroy of brazil the french had opportunities of seeing the comedies of metastasio given at the opera by a mulatto troupe and of hearing the works of the great italian masters executed by a bad orchestra conducted by a deformed abbe in ecclesiastical dress but the cordial relations with the viceroy were not lasting bougainville who, with the Viceroy's permission, had made some purchase, found the delivery of it refused for no reason. He was forbidden to take wood he needed from the royal timber-yard, although he had concluded a contract for it. And lastly, he was prevented from lodging with his staff, during the repairs of the Boudeuse, in a house near the town, placed at his disposal by a friend. To avoid altercation, Bougainville hurried the preparations for departure. Before leaving the capital of Brazil, the French commander entered into various details of the beauty of the port and the picturesque nature of its surroundings, and finished by a very curious digression upon the prodigious riches of the country, of which the port was the emporium. The mines called General, he says, are the nearest to the town, although they are seventy-five leagues away from it. They yield the king a yearly revenue by his right to a fifth share of at least a hundred and twelve arrobas of gold. In 1762 they brought him in a hundred and nineteen. Under the captaincy of the General Mines, those of the Rio de Mar, Sabara and Cerro Frio were included. The last named, in addition to all the gold it produces, yields all the diamonds which come from the Brazils. 
No precious stones, except diamonds, are contraband. They belong to the speculators, who were obliged to keep an exact account of the diamonds they find, and to restore them to the possession of an intendant named by the king for this purpose. He immediately places them in a casket bound with iron, and fastened with three locks. He retains one key, the king has another, and the proveedor de Hacienda Real the third. This casket is enclosed in a second, stamped with the seals of three persons named, and containing the three keys of the smaller one. But in spite of all these precautions, and the severe punishment visited upon diamond robberies, an enormous contraband trade was carried on. It was, however, not the only source of revenue, and Bougainville calculated that, deducting the maintenance of troops, the pay of the civil officers, and all the expenses of the administration, the King of Portugal drew no less than ten million francs from the Brazils. From Rio to Montevideo no incident occurred, but upon the Plata, during a storm, the Etoile was run down by a Spanish vessel which broke her bowsprit, her beak-head, and much of her rigging. The damages and the shock increased the leak of the ship, and forced her to return to Ensenada de Baragán, where the repairs were more easily managed than at Montevideo. It was impossible, therefore, to leave the river until the 14th of November. Thirteen days later, both ships came in sight of Virgin Cape at the entrance to the Strait of Magellan, which they hastened to enter. Possession Bay, the first they met with, is a large space open to all winds and offering very bad anchorage. From Virgin Cape to Orange Cape is about fifteen leagues, and the strait is throughout seven or eight leagues wide. The first narrow entrance was easily passed, an anchor cast in Buco Bay, where half a score of officers and men landed. They soon made acquaintance with the Patagonians and exchanged a few trifles, precious to the natives, for swans down and gunaco skins. The inhabitants were tall, but none of them reached six feet. What struck me as gigantic in their proportions, says Bougainville, was their enormous breadth of shoulder, the size of their heads, and the thickness of their limbs. They are robust and well-nourished, their muscles are sinewy, their flesh firm, and in fact they are men who, having lived in the open air and drawn their nourishment from juicy aliments, have reached their highest point of development. The distance from the first to the second opening may have been six or seven leagues, and was passed without accident. This opening is only one and a half leagues in width and four in length. In this part of the strait, the ships easily reconnoitred St. Bartholomew and St. Elizabeth Islands. At the latter, the French landed. They found neither wood nor water. It was an absolutely desert land. Leaving this place, the American side of the strait is amply furnished with wood, but although the first advances had been fortunate, Bougainville was to find plenty to try his patience. The distinctive character of the climate lies in the rapid atmospheric changes, which succeeded each other so quickly that it is quite impossible to forecast their sudden and dangerous variations. Hence the damages which it is impossible to foresee, which retard the passage of the ships, even if they do not force them to seek shelter for repairs. Guillaume Duco Bay provides an excellent anchorage, with six or eight fathoms of water and sound bottom. Bougainville remained there long enough to fill several casks, and endeavored to procure fresh meat, but he only met with a few wild animals. St. Anne's Point was reached. At that place Sarmiento had founded the colony of Philippeville 
in 1581. In a preceding volume we have narrated the fearful catastrophe which procured the name of Port Famine for this spot. The French reconnoitred several bays, capes, and harbors at which they touched. They were Bougainville Bay, where the Etoile was repainted, Port Beaubassin, Cormadier Bay, off the coast of Tierra del Fuego, and Cape Forward, which forms the most southerly point of the Strait and of Patagonia, Cascade Bay in Tierra del Fuego, the safety, easy anchorage, and facilities for procuring water and food of which render it a most desirable haven for navigators. The various ports which Bougainville discovered are particularly valuable, as they offer favorable points for Dublin Cape Forward, one of the most difficult routes for sailors on account of the violent and contrary winds which prevail there. The year 1768 opened for the adventurers in Fort Rescue Bay, below which is Port Gallant, the plan of which had been taken with great exactitude by M. de Gênes. Detestable weather, of which the worst winter in Paris can give no idea, detained the French expedition for three weeks. It was visited by a band of Pecheans, the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, who boarded the ship. We made them sing, says the narrative, dance, listen to instruments, and above all, eat everything was pleasant to them bread salt meat tallow they devoured everything that was given them they showed no surprise either at the sight of the vessels or that of the various objects which were shown to them no doubt because to feel surprise at works of art one must have elementary ideas these men akin to brutes treated chef d'oeuvre of human industry as they treated the laws and phenomena of nature these savages are small ugly thin and smell abominably they were all but naked having only clothing of sealskin too small to cover them these women are hideous and the men appear to care little for them they live all together men and women and children in one hut in the center of which a fire is lighted their food is chiefly shellfish still they have dogs and snares set with whalebone on the whole they appear to be a good sort of people but so weak that one overlooks their faults of all savages i have met with the pechere are the most destitute a painful event occurred whilst the crew were in this port a child of about twelve years of age came on board and glass beads and bits of glass were given to it with no suspicion of the use to which they would be put it would appear that these savages are in the habit of stuffing pieces of talk down the throats as talismans this boy no doubt meant to do the same with the glass for when they landed they found him vomiting violently and spitting blood his throat and gums were lacerated and bleeding in spite of the enchantments and violent rubbings of a juggler or perhaps on account of this not too effective treatment the poor child suffered dreadfully and died shortly afterwards this was the signal for a precipitate flight of the pechere they no doubt entertained a fear that the french had cast a spell upon them and that they would all die in a similar manner end of section eight recording by malone Section 9 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne First Part, Chapter 2, Part 3 
Captain Cook's predecessors, 3b. On the 16th of January, in endeavouring to reach Rupert Isle, the Boudeuse was driven by the currents half a cable's length from the shore. The anchor, which was then heaved, gave way, and without the least land breeze the vessel stranded. It was necessary to regain gallant harbour. It was just time, for next day a fearful storm was raging. After experiencing constantly adverse and variable winds for twenty-six days in Port Gallant, thirty-six hours favourable breeze, for which we had not dared to hope, sufficed to take us into the Pacific Ocean. This, I believe, to be a solitary instance of a voyage without anchorage from Port Gallant to the narrow channel. I estimate the entire length of this strait, from Virgin Cape to Cape Pellier, at about 114 leagues. We took fifty-two days to accomplish it. In spite of the difficulties we met with in the passage of the Straits of Magellan, and in this Bougainville entirely agrees with Byron. I should advise this route in preference to that by Cape Horn from September to the end of March. During the remaining months of the year I should prefer the open sea. Contrary winds and heavy seas are not dangerous, whilst it is not wise to grope one's way between two coasts one is sure to be detained for some time in the strait, but this delay is not time wholly lost. One meets with water in abundance, wood and shellfish, and occasionally very good fish, and I am decidedly of opinion that a crew reaching the Pacific by doubling Cape Horn suffers more from the ravages of scurvy than that which proceeds by the Straits of Magellan. Bougainville's opinion has met with many opposers up to the present time, and the route which he lauds so highly has been almost abandoned by navigators, one strong reason for which is that steam has completely transformed maritime experience and entirely changed nautical science. Scarcely had he entered the southern sea when Bougainville, to his intense surprise, found the winds southerly. He was therefore obliged to relinquish his intention of reaching Juan Fernandez. Bougainville had agreed with Monsieur de la Gironde, captain of the Etoile, that if a larger stretch of sea was discovered, the two vessels should separate, but not lose sight of each other and that every evening the bugle should recall them within half a league of each other, so that, in the event of the Boudeuse encountering danger, the Etoile might avoid it. Bougainville for some time sought Easter Island in vain. At last he fell in during the month of March with the lands and islands erroneously marked upon M. Bellini's chart as Quiros Islands. On the 22nd of the same month, he met with four islets, to which he gave the name of Quatre Facardins, which belonged to the dangerous group, a set of madreporic islets, low and damp, which all navigators who have visited the Pacific Ocean by way of the Straits of Magellan appear to have noticed a little further discovery was made of a fertile island inhabited by entirely naked savages who were armed with long spears which they brandished with menacing gestures and thus it obtained the name of lancer's island we need not refer to what we have already repeatedly said of the nature of these islands the difficulty of access to them their wild and inhospitable inhabitants. Cook calls them this very Lancers Island, Thrum Cape, 
and the inhabitants of La Alpe, which Bougainville found on the 24th, is identical with Cook's Bow Island. The captain, knowing that Roger wine had nearly perished in these latitudes, and thinking the interest of their explorations not worth the risk to be run, proceeded southward and soon lost sight of this immense archipelago, which extends in length five hundred leagues and contains at least sixty islands or groups. Upon the 2nd of April, Bougainville perceived a high and steep mountain, to which he gave the name of La Boudeuse. It was Maitea Island, already called La Dezana by Quiros. On the 4th, at sunrise, the vessel reached Tahiti, a long island consisting of two peninsulas, united by a tongue of land no more than a mile in width. More than one hundred pirogues hastened to surround the two vessels. They were laden with coconuts and many delicious fruits, which were readily exchanged for all sorts of trifles. When night fell, the shore was illuminated by a thousand fires, to which the crew responded by throwing rockets. The appearance of this shore, says Bougainville, raised like an amphitheatre, offered a most attractive picture. Although the mountains are high, the land nowhere shows its nakedness, being covered with wood. We could scarcely credit our sight when we perceived a peak, covered with trees, which rose above the level of the mountains in the southern portion of the island. It appeared only thirty fathoms in diameter, and decreased in size at its summit. At a distance it might have been taken for an immense pyramid, adorned with foliage by a clever decorative. The least elevated portions of the country are intersected by fields and groves, and the entire length of the coast, upon the shore below the higher level, is a stretch of low land, unbroken and covered by plantations. There, amid the medanas, coconut and other fruit trees, we saw the huts of the natives. The whole of the morrow was spent in barter. The natives, in addition to fruits, offered fowls, pigeons, fishing instruments, working implements, stuffs and shells, for which they asked nails and earrings. Upon the morning of the 6th, after three days devoted to tacking about and reconnoitering the coast in search of a roadstead, Bougainville decided to cast anchor in the bay he had seen the first day of his arrival. The number of pirogues round our vessels, he says, was so great that we had immense trouble in making our way through the crowd and noise. All approached crying, Tayo, friend, and offering a thousand marks of friendship. The pirogues were full of women, who might vie with most Europeans in pleasant features, and who certainly excelled them in beauty of form. Bougainville's cook managed to escape, in spite of all prohibitions, and gained the shore. But he had no sooner landed than he was surrounded by a vast crowd, who entirely undressed him to investigate his body. Not knowing what they were going to do with him, he thought himself lost, when the natives restored his clothes and conducted him to the vessel more dead than alive. Bougainville wished to reprimand him, but the poor fellow assured him that However he might threaten him, he could never equal the terrors of his visit on shore. As soon as the ship could heave to, Bougainville landed with some of his officers to reconnoiter the watering place. An enormous crowd immediately surrounded him and examined him with great curiosity, all the time crying, Tayo, Tayo. One of the natives received them in his house and served them with fruits, grilled fish, and water. As they regained the shore, 
a native of fine appearance, lying under a tree, offered them a share of the shade. We accepted it, says Bougainville, and the man at once bent towards us in a gentle way, sung to the sound of a flute which another Indian blew with his nose, a song which was no doubt anacreontic. It was a charming scene, worthy of the pencil of Boucher. Four natives came with great confidence to sup and sleep on board. We had the flute, bassoon, and violin played for them, and treated them to fireworks composed of rockets and serpents. This display excited both surprise and fear. Before giving further extracts from Bougainville's narrative, it appears apropos to warn the reader not to accept these descriptions au pied de la lettre. The fertile imagination of the narrator embellished everything. Not content with the ravishing scenes under his eyes, the picturesque reality is not enough for him, and he adds new delights to the picture, which only overload it. He does this almost unconsciously. None the less, his descriptions should be received with great caution. We find a strange example of this tendency of the age in the narrative of Cook's second voyage. Mr. Hodges, the painter who was attached to the expedition, wishing to reproduce the disembarkation of the English on the island of Middleburg, paints personages who have not the smallest resemblance to the dwellers in the ocean regions, and whose togas give them the appearance of being contemporaries of Caesar or of Augustus. Yet he had the originals before his eyes, and nothing could have been easier to him than to depict the scene as it really was. We know better how to respect truth in these days. No additions, no embellishments are found in the narratives of our navigators, and if sometimes they prove but dry accounts, which give little pleasure to the general public, they are sure to contain the elements of earnest study for the scientific man, and the basis of works for the advancement of science. With this preamble, let us follow the narrator. Bougainville established his sick and his water-casks upon the shore of a small river which ran at the bottom of the bay, under a guard for their security. These precautions were not taken without arousing the susceptibility and distrust of the natives. They had no objection to seeing the strangers walk about their island all day, but they expected them to return on board at night. Bougainville persisted, and at last he was obliged to fix the length of his stay. At this juncture harmony was restored. A large shed was prepared for the sufferers from scurvy, in number thirty-four, and for their guard, which consisted of thirty men. The shed was closed on all sides, and only one opening left to which the natives crowded with the wares they wished to exchange. The only trouble they had was in keeping an eye upon everything that was brought on shore, for there are no more adroit sharpers in Europe than these folks. Following a laudable custom, now becoming general, Bougainville presented the chief of this settlement with a pair of turkeys and ducks and drakes, and then cleared a piece of land where he sowed corn, wheat, rice, maize, onions, and so on. On the tenth, a native was killed by a gunshot. All Bougainville's inquiries failed to find out the perpetrator of this abominable assassination. Apparently, the natives thought the victim in the wrong for they continued to frequent the market with their former confidence. The captain, however, knew that the harbor was not well sheltered, and the bottom was entirely coral. On the twelfth, during a storm of wind, the Boudeuse, whose anchor cable had been cut by the coral, 
caused great injuries to the étoile, upon which she was driven. Whilst all on board were busily occupied in repairing these injuries, and a boat had been dispatched in search of a second passage, by means of which the ships might have left with any wind, Bougainville learned that three natives had been killed or wounded in their cabins by bayonets, and that owing to the general alarm all the inhabitants had hurried to the interior. In spite of the risk run by his ships, the captain at once landed and put the supposed perpetrators of this outrage, which might have brought the entire population upon the French, into irons. Thanks to these rigorous measures, the natives calmed down, and the night passed without incident. Still, Bougainville's worst apprehensions were not upon this score. He returned on board as soon as possible. But for a breeze which opportunely sprang up, both vessels would have been driven on shore by a strong squall, accompanied by a swell and thunder. The anchor cables broke, and the vessels had a narrow escape of striking on the breakers, where they must speedily have been demolished. Fortunately, the Etoile was able to gain the open, and was soon followed by the Boudeuse, leaving in this foreign roadstead six anchors, which might have been of great use during the rest of the voyage. So soon as they perceived the approaching departure of the French, the natives came in crowds with provisions of every variety. One of them, named Aotuuru, asked, and finally obtained, permission to accompany Bougainville on his voyage. After his arrival in Europe, Aotuuru lived eleven months in Paris, where he was received with cordiality and welcome in the highest society. In 1770, when he returned to his native land, the government took an opportunity of conveying him to the Isle of France. He was to return to Tahiti as soon as the weather permitted, but he died in the island without having been able to convey to his land the useful implements, grains, and cattle which had been given to him by the French government. Tahiti, which was named Nouvelle Citerre by Bougainville on account of the beauty of the women, is the largest of the society's group. Although it was visited, as we have already narrated, by Wallace, we will give a little information which we owe to Bougainville. The principal productions were cocos, bananas, breadfruits, yams, sugar cane, and so on. Monsieur de Commerson, naturalist who was on board the Etoile, recognized the Indian flora. The only quadrupeds were pigs, dogs, and rats, who multiplied rapidly. Bougainville says, The climate is so healthy that in spite of our fatigues, although our people were perpetually in the water and under a burning sun, sleeping on the naked soil under the stars, no one was ill. The sufferers from scurvy, whom we disembarked, and who had not enjoyed a single night's sleep, regained their strength and were so soon restored that some of them were completely cured on board. In addition to all this, the health and strength of the natives, who live in cabins open to every wind, and who scarcely cover the ground which serves them as a bed, with a few leaves, the happy old age to which they easily attain, the sharpness of all their senses, and the singular beauty of their teeth, which they preserve to the greatest age, all testify to the salubrity of the climate, and the efficiency of the rules followed by the inhabitants. In character, the people seem gentle and good. It would not appear that they have civil wars among themselves, although the country is divided into little portions under independent chiefs. 
they are constantly at war with the inhabitants of the neighboring islands. Not satisfied with massacring the men and male children taken in arms, they skin their chins with the beard and keep this hideous trophy. Bougainville could only obtain very vague information of their ceremonies and religion, but he could at least assert the reverence they pay their dead. They preserve the corpses for a long time in the open air, on a sort of scaffold sheltered by a shed. In spite of the odor of decomposition, the women go every day to weep near the monuments and bedew the sad relics of their beloved ones with their tears and with coconut oil. The soil is so productive and requires so little cultivation that men and women live in a state of almost entire idleness. Therefore, it is not astonishing that the sole care of the latter is to be pleasing. Dancing, singing, long conversations, teeming with gaiety, have developed a mobility of expression among the Tahitians, surprising even to the French, a people who themselves have not the reputation of being serious, possibly because they are more lively than those who reproach them with levity. It is impossible to fix a native's attention. A trifle strikes them, but nothing occupies them. In spite of their want of reflection, they were clever and industrious. Their pirogues were constructed after a fashion equally ingenious and solid. Their fish-hooks and all their fishing implements were of delicate workmanship. Their nets were like those of Europeans. Their stuffs, manufactured of the bark of a tree, were generally woven and dyed of various colors. In fact, Bougainville's impression of the Tahitian people was that they were Lazaroni. At eight o'clock on the 16th of April, Bougainville was about ten leagues north of Tahiti when he perceived land to windward. Although it had the appearance of three islands, it was in reality but one. It was named Umaita after Aoturu. The captain, not thinking it wise to stop there, steered so as to avoid the pernicious islands, of which Rogawine's disaster had made him afraid. During the remainder of the month of April the weather was fine, with little wind. On the 3rd of May, Bougainville bore down towards a new land, which he had just discovered, and was not long in finding others on the same day. The coasts of the largest one were steep. In point of fact, it was simply a mountain covered with trees to its summit, with neither valley nor sea coast. Some fires were seen there, cabins built under the shade of the coconut trees, and some thirty men running on the shore. In the evening several pirogues approached the vessels, and after a little natural hesitation exchanges commenced. The natives demanded pieces of red cloth in exchange for coconuts, yarns, and far less beautiful stuffs than those of the Tahitians. They disdainfully refused iron, nails, and earrings, which had been so appreciated elsewhere in the Bourbon Archipelago, as Bougainville had named the Tahitian group. The natives had their breasts and thighs painted dark blue. They wore no beards. Their hair was drawn into tufts on the top of their heads. Next day, fresh islands belonging to the archipelago were seen. The natives, who appeared very savage, would not approach the vessels. The longitude of these islands, says the narrative, is pretty nearly similar to that which Abel Tasman reckoned it when he discovered Amsterdam and Rotterdam Islands, the Pilstars, Prince William Island, and the lowlands of Flemskerk. It is also approximate to that assigned for the Solomon Islands. Besides, the pirogues which we have seen rowing in the open sea, and to the south, 
indicate other islands in this locality. Thus it appears likely that these lands form an extended chain in the same parallel. The islands comprising the Navigator Archipelago lie below the 14th southern parallel, between 170 degrees and 172 degrees west longitude from Paris. As fresh victuals diminished, scurvy again began to appear. It was necessary to think of putting into a port again. On the 22nd and the following days of the same month, Pentecost Island, Aurora, and Leper Islands, which belonged to the archipelago of New Hebrides, were reconnoitred. They had been discovered by Quiros in 1606. The landing appearing easy, the captain determined to send an expedition on shore, which would bring back coconuts and other antiscorbutic fruits. Bougainville joined them during the day. The sailors cut wood, and the natives aided in shipping it. But in spite of this apparent good feeling, the natives were still distrustful, and carried their weapons in their hands. Those who possessed none held large stones, all ready to throw. As soon as the boats were laden with fruit and wood, Bougainville re-embarked his men. The natives then approached in great numbers, and discharged a shower of arrows, lances, and javelins. Some even entered the water, the better to aim at the French. Several gunshots, fired into the air, having no effect, a well-directed general volley soon put the natives to flight. A few days later, a boat seeking anchorage upon the coast of the Leper Islands was in danger of attack. Two arrows aimed at them served as a pretext for the first discharge, which was speedily followed by a fire so well directed that Bougainville believed his crew in danger. The number of victims was very large. The natives uttered piercing cries as they fled to the woods. It was a regular massacre. The captain, uneasy at the prolonged firing, sent another boat to the help of the first, when he saw it doubling a point. He therefore signaled for their return. I took measures, he said, that we should never again be dishonored by such an abuse of our superior forces. The easy abuse of their powers by captains is truly sad. The mania for destroying life needlessly, even without any object, raises one's indignation. To whatever nation explorers belong, we find them guilty of the same acts. The reproach, therefore, belongs not to a particular nation, but to humanity at large. Having obtained the commodities he needed, Bougainville regained the sea. It would appear that the navigator aimed at making many discoveries for he only reconnoitred the lands he found very superficially and hastily, and of all the charts which accompany the narrative, and there are many of them, not one gives an entire archipelago, or settles the various questions to which a new discovery gives rise. Captain Cook did not proceed in this way. His explorations, always conducted with care, and with rare perseverance, are, for that very reason, far superior in value to those of the French explorers. End of section 9. Recording by Malone. Section 10 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 3. Captain Cook's Predecessors, 3C. The lands which the French now encountered were no other than St. Esprit, Malicolo, and St. Bartholomew, and the islets belonging to the latter. 
although he was perfectly aware that these islands were identical with the Tierra del Espíritu Santo of Quiros, Bougainville could not refrain from bestowing a new name upon them, and called them the Archipelago de Grandes Cyclades, to which, however, the name of New Hebrides has been given in preference. I readily believed, he says, quote, that it was its extreme southern point, which Raghavine saw under the eleventh parallel, and which he named Tienhoven and Groningue. But when we arrived there, everything led us to believe that we were in the southern land of Espiritu Santo. Every appearance seemed to coincide with Quiros's narrative, and the discoveries we made every day encouraged us in our search. It is singular that precisely in the same latitude and longitude as that which Quiros gives to his St. Philip and St. James's bays, upon a shore which at first sight appeared like a continent, we found a passage equal in size to that which he gives to the opening of his bays. Did the Spanish navigator see badly, or did he wish to hide his discoveries? Had geographers merely guessed in making the Tierra del Espiritu Santo identical with New Guinea? To ascertain the truth, we must follow the same parallel for over 350 leagues. I resolved upon doing so, although the state and quantity of our provisions warned us to seek a European settlement as soon as possible. It will be seen that we narrowly escaped being the victims of our own persistence. End quote. Whilst Bougainville was in these latitudes, certain business matters required his presence on board the Etoile, and he there found out a singular fact, which had already been largely discussed by his crew. Monsieur de Commerson had a servant named Barre, indefatigable, intelligent, and already an experienced botanist. Barre had been seen taking an active part in the herborizing excursions, carrying boxes, provisions, the weapons, and books of plants, with endurance which obtained from the botanist the nickname of his beast of burden. For some time past Barre had been supposed to be a woman. His smooth face, the tone of his voice, his reserve, and certain other signs, appeared to justify the supposition, when on arriving at Tahiti suspicions were changed into certainty. Monsieur de Commerson landed to botanize, and according to custom Barre followed him with the boxes, when he was surrounded by natives, who, exclaiming that it was a woman, were disposed to verify their opinion. A midshipman, Monsieur Beaumont, had the greatest trouble in rescuing her from the natives and escorting her back to the ship. When Bougainville visited the Etoile, he received Barre's confession. In tears, the assistant botanist confessed her sex and excused herself for having deceived her master by presenting herself in man's clothes at the very moment of embarkation. Having no family, and having been ruined by a lawsuit, this girl had donned man's clothes to ensure respect. She was aware, before she embarked, that she was going on a voyage round the world, and the prospect, far from frightening her, only confirmed her in her resolution. Quote, she will be the first woman who has been round the world, says Bougainville, and I must do her the justice to admit that she has conducted herself with the most scrupulous discretion. She is neither ugly nor pretty, and at most is only twenty-six or twenty-seven years old. It must be admitted that had the two vessels suffered shipwreck upon a desert island, it would have been a singular experience for Barre. The expedition lost sight of land on the 29th of May. The route was directed westward. On the 4th of June, a very dangerous rock, so slightly above water that at two leagues distant it was not visible from the lookout, was discovered in latitude 15 degrees 50 minutes and 148 degrees 10 minutes longitude. The constant recurrence of breakers, trunks of trees in large quantities, fruits and sea rack, and the smoothness of the sea, all indicated the neighborhood of extensive land to the southeast. It was New Holland. Bougainville determined to leave these dangerous latitudes, where he was likely to meet with nothing but barren lands, and a sea strewn with rocks and full of shallows. There were other urgent reasons for changing the route, provisions were getting low, the salt meat was so tainted that the rats caught on board were eaten in preference. Bread enough for two months, and vegetables for forty days alone remained. All clamored for a return to the north. 
unfortunately the south winds had ceased and when they recommenced they brought the expedition within an inch of destruction on the tenth of june land was seen to the north it was the bottom of the gulf of the louisiade which had received the name of cul-de-sac de l'orangerie the country was magnificent on the seashore a low land covered with trees and shrubs the balmy odors of which reached the ships rose like an amphitheatre towards the mountains whose summits were lost in the skies however it was impossible to visit this rich and fertile country but on the other hand desirable to find to the east a passage to the south of new guinea which by way of the gulf of carpentaria would have led direct to the moluccas did such a passage exist nothing was more problematic for the notion was that land had been seen extending far to the westward it was needful to hurry as fast as possible from the gulf where the ships had so incautiously involved themselves but there is a wide difference between a wish and its fulfilment the two vessels strove in vain up to the twenty first of june to transport themselves to the west from this coast which was so full of rocks and breakers and upon which the wind and currents bade fair to swallow them up the fog and rain continued so closely with them that the frigate could only proceed in company with the etoile by a constant firing of guns when the wind changed they profited by it and immediately proceeded to the open sea but it soon veered again and continued east southeast and thus they speedily lost the ground they had gained during this terrible cruise the rations of bread and vegetables were obliged to be reduced consumption of old leather was threatened with severe punishment and the last goat on board was sacrificed it is difficult for the reader tranquilly sitting in his chimney corner to imagine the anxiety of a voyage in these unknown seas threatened with the unexpected appearance of rocks and breakers with contrary winds unknown currents and a fog which concealed all dangers cape deliverance was only rounded on the twenty sixth it was now possible to start for the north northeast two days later when they had made about sixty leagues northward some islands were perceived ahead bougainville imagined they were part of the louisiade group but they are more generally accepted as belonging to the solomon archipelago which carteret who saw them the preceding year as little imagined that he had reached as the french navigator several pirogues speedily surrounded the two ships they were manned by natives blacker than africans with long curling red hair armed with javelins they uttered shrill cries and showed dispositions far from peaceful it was useless to attempt to reach them the surge broke violently and the coast was so narrow that it scarcely seemed as if there were one at all surrounded on all sides by islands and in a thick fog bougainville steered by instinct in a passage only four or five leagues in width and with a sea so rough that the etoile was forced to close her hatchways upon the eastern coast a pretty bay was perceived which promised good anchorage boats were told off to sound it whilst they were thus engaged ten or more pirogues upon which some hundred and fifty men armed with bucklers lances and bows were embarked advanced against them the pirogues divided into two parties to surround the french boats as soon as they were within sufficient reach the natives showered a storm of arrows and javelins upon the boats the first discharge failed to stop them a second was necessary to disperse them two pirogues the crews of which had jumped into the sea were captured of great length and well made these boats were decorated in front with a man's head carved the eyes of which were formed of mother-of-pearl the ears of tortoise-shell and the lips painted red the water in which this combat took place was called the warrior river and the island received the name of chasul in honor of the french minister of marine on leaving this strait a new land was discovered bougainville island the southern extremity of which called laverty cape appears to join buca island the latter which carteret had seen the preceding year and which he named winchelsea appeared densely populated if the cabins which abounded were any criterion the inhabitants whom bougainville classifies as negroes probably to distinguish them from the polynesians and malays were Papuans, 
of the same race as the inhabitants of New Guinea. Their short curly hair was painted red, and the beetle nut, which they perpetually chewed, had communicated the same color to their teeth. The coast, with its coconut and other trees, promised plentiful refreshments, but contrary winds and currents quickly drew the ships away. On the 6th of July, Bougainville cast anchor on the southern coast of New Ireland, which had been discovered by Scoton, in Port Praslin, at the very point where Carteret had stopped. We sent our casks on shore, says the narrative, quote, and began to collect water and food, and commence washing, all of which was most necessary. The disembarkation was splendid, upon fine sand, with neither rock nor wave. Four streams flowed into the harbour in a space measuring four hundred paces. We selected three according to custom, one to supply water for the La Badoos, one for the Etoile, and one for washing purposes. Wood was plentiful on the shore, and there were various kinds of it, all good for burning, and several first-rate for carpentry, joinery, and even toy-making. The two vessels were in hearing of each other and close to the shore. Again, this part and its neighborhood, to a great distance, were uninhabited, a fact which secured us precious peace and liberty. We could not have hoped for a surer anchorage, or a more convenient spot for water, wood, or the various repairs needed by the vessels. We were able to send the sufferers from scurvy to range the woods, but with all these advantages the port had a few inconveniences. In spite of active search, neither coconut trees nor bananas were to be found, nor any of the resources which either by consent or by force could have been gained in an inhabited country. Fish was not abundant, and we could expect only safety and strictly necessary things. There was every fear that the sick would not re-establish their health. We had, indeed, no serious cases, but several were infected, and no improvement took place, and their malady could not have increased more rapidly. They had been only a few days in port, when a sailor found a leaden plate, upon which was an inscription in English. It was easy to guess that they had found the very spot where Carteret had made a stay the preceding year. The resources offered by this country to sportsmen were mediocre in the extreme. They did indeed catch sight of a few boars or wild pigs, but it was impossible to hit them. To make up for this, they shot most beautiful pigeons, the bodies and necks of grey-white, and of golden-green plumage, turtle-doves, paroquets, crested birds, and a species of crow whose cry was so like the baying of a dog as to be mistaken for it. The trees were large and magnificent, amongst them the beetle, the areca, and the pepper tree. Malignant reptiles swarm in these marshy lands, and in the ancient forests serpents, scorpions, and other venomous reptiles abounded. Unfortunately, they were not only to be found on land. A sailor in search of marteau, a very rare kind of bivalve mussel, was stung by a serpent. The fearful suffering and violent convulsions which followed only subsided at the expiration of five or six hours, and at last the theriac which was administered for him after the bite effected a cure. This accident was a sad damper to the conchological enthusiasm. Upon the twenty-second, after a severe storm, the ships were sensible of several slight earthquakes, the sea rose and fell several times in succession, which greatly alarmed the sailors who were occupied in fishing. In spite of the rain and ceaseless storms which continued daily, a detachment started to search the interior for bourbon palms, palm trees, and turtle doves. They expected to find wonders, but returned oftenest empty-handed and with the one result of being wet to the skin. A natural curiosity at some distance from the anchorage, a thousand times more beautiful than the wonders invented for the ornament of kingly palaces, attracted numberless visitors, who could never tire of admiring it. It was a waterfall, too beautiful for a description. To form any idea of its beauty, it would be necessary to reproduce by the brush the sparkling gleam of the spray lit up by the rays of the sun, the vaporous shade of the tropical trees which dipped their branches into the water, and the fantastic display of light over a magnificent country not yet spoiled by the hand of men. 
as soon as the weather changed the ships left port praslin to follow the coast of new guinea until the third of august the etoile was attacked by hundreds of pirogues and forced to return the stones and arrows that assailed her by a few gunshots which put the assailants to flight on the fourth the islands named matthias and stormy by dampier were sighted three days later anchorite island was recognized so called because a number of pirogues occupied in fishing took no notice of the etoile and Bodus, disdaining to enter into relations with the strangers after passing a series of islets half under water upon which the vessels nearly struck and which were named the echequiers by bougainville the coast of new guinea appeared steep and mountainous it ran west-northwest on the twelfth a large bay was discovered but the currents which so far had been unfavorable were equally so in carrying the boats far from it it was visible at a distance of twenty leagues from two gigantic mountains cyclops and bougainville the aramoa islands the largest of which is only four miles in length were next seen but the bad weather and the currents forced the two vessels to remain in the open sea and relinquish all exploration it was necessary however to maintain a close watch in order to avoid missing the outlet into the indian ocean miss pulu and waigiu the last at the extreme north of new guinea were passed in succession the canal des francais the outlet for ships from this mass of little islands and rocks was passed without mishap from thence bougainville penetrated to the molucca archipelago where he reckoned upon finding the fresh provisions requisite for the forty-five sufferers from scurvy on board in absolute ignorance of the events which had occurred in europe since he left it bougainville could not run the risk of visiting a colony in which he was not the strongest power the small dutch establishment boten or buru island suited him perfectly all the more that provisions were easily obtained there the crew received orders to enter the gulf of Kajeti with the greatest delight no one on board had escaped scurvy and half the crew bougainville says were quite unfit for duty Quote, the victuals remaining to us were so tainted and ill-smelling that the worst moments of our sad days were those when we were obliged to partake of such disgusting and unwholesome viands. The charms of Boten Island were enhanced by our wretched situation. About midnight a delicious odor, emanating from the aromatic plants with which the Molucca Islands are covered, had been wafted several leagues out to sea, and was hailed by us as a forerunner of the end of our woes the appearance of the moderately sized town situated below the gulf with vessels at anchor and cattle grazing in the pastures that surrounded us caused pleasure in which i participated but which i cannot describe scarcely had the Bodus and the etoile cast anchor than the resident governor sent two soldiers to inquire of the french captain what reason he could assign for stopping at this place when he must be aware that entrance was permitted to the ships of the india company only bougainville immediately sent an officer to explain that hunger and sickness forced him to enter the first port which presented itself in his route also that he would leave boten as soon as he had received the aid of which he had urgent need the resident at once sent him the order of the governor of amboyna which expressly forbade his receiving any strange ship in his harbour and begged bougainville to make a written declaration of the reason for his putting into port in order that he might prove to his superior that he had not infringed his orders except under paramount necessity as soon as bougainville had signed a certificate to this effect cordiality was established with the dutch the resident entertained the officers at his own table and a contract was concluded for provisions and fresh meat bread gave place to rice the usual food of the dutch and fresh vegetables which were not usually cultivated in the island were provided for the crews by the resident who obtained them from the company's gardens it would have been desirable for the re-establishment of the health of the crew that the stay at this port could have been prolonged but the end of the monsoon warned bougainville to set out for batavia the captain left boten on the seventh of september convinced that navigation in the molucca archipelago was not so difficult as it suited the dutch to affirm 
as for trusting to french charts they were of no use being more qualified to mislead vessels than to guide them bougainville therefore directed his courts through the straits of button and Solaire, a route which though commonly used by the dutch is but little known to other nations the narrative therefore carefully describes with mention of every cape the course he took we will not dwell upon this part of the voyage although it is very instructive and on that account interesting to seafaring men on the twenty eighth of september ten months and a half after leaving montevideo the etoile and the Baudus arrived at batavia one of the finest colonies in the world after touching at the isle of france the cape of good hope and ascension island near which he met carteret bougainville entered st malo on the sixteenth of february seventeen sixty nine having lost only seven men in the two years and four months which had elapsed since he left nantes the remaining particulars of the career of this fortunate navigator do not concern our purpose and may be dismissed briefly he took part in the american war and in seventeen eighty one participated in an honorable combat before port royal off martinique made chief of the fleet in seventeen eighty he ten years later received a commission to re-establish order in the mutinous fleet of monsieur d'albert de rion created vice-admiral in seventeen ninety two he did not think it right to accept a high rank which was to use his own words quote, a title without duties end quote. nominated first to the bureau of longitudes and then to the institute raised to the rank of senator created a count by napoleon the first bougainville died full of years and honors on the thirty first of august eighteen eleven bougainville acquired popularity as the first frenchman who accomplished a voyage round the world though the merit of discovering and reconnoitring if not of exploring many groups of islands little known and quite neglected before his time has been ascribed to him he owes his reputation rather to the charm and easy animation of his narrative than to his labors if he is better known than any other french naval officers his competitors it is not so much because he accomplished more than they as because his style of narrating his adventures charmed his contemporaries as for guyot duclos his secondary share in the enterprise and his plebeian rank excluded him from reward he was afterwards given the cross of st louis but he earned the title by his rescue of the belle poule although he was born in seventeen twenty two and had been in the navy since the year seventeen thirty four he was still only lieutenant in seventeen ninety one a succession of ministers of new views was needed to obtain the rank of ship captain for him a tardy recompense of long and signal services guyot duclos died at st servan on the tenth march seventeen ninety four end of section ten Section 11 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3, Part 1 captain cook's first voyage one a the beginning of his maritime career the command of the adventure entrusted to him tierra del fuego discovery of some islands on the pomontu archipelago arrival at tahiti manners and customs of the inhabitants discovery of other islands in the society group arrival at new zealand interview with the natives discovery of cook's strait circumnavigation of two large islands manners and productions of the country in narrating the career of a distinguished man it is well to neglect none of those details which may appear of but slight importance they acquire significance as indications of a vocation unknown even to its subject and throw a light upon the character under consideration for these reasons 
we shall dwell a little upon the humble beginnings of the career of one of the most illustrious navigators whom england boasts james cook was born at martin in yorkshire on the twenty seventh of october seventeen twenty eight he was the ninth child of a farm servant and a peasant woman named grace when scarcely eight years of age little james assisted his father in the rough toil of the farm of airy holm near ayton his amiability and love of work attracted the interest of the farmer who had him taught to read when he was thirteen years of age he was apprenticed to william sanderson a linen draper at snaith a fishing hamlet of some importance but young cook found little pleasure in an employment which kept him behind a counter and he spent every leisure moment in chatting with the sailors who visited the port gaining his father's consent james soon left the linen drapers to engage himself as shipboy to messrs walker whose boats carried coal from england to ireland successively ship lad sailor and master cook rapidly learned all the details of his profession in the spring of seventeen fifty five as the first hostilities between england and france broke out the boat upon which cook served was anchored in the thames the navy was recruited in those days by means of press gangs at first cook hid himself but afterwards urged no doubt by a presentiment he engaged himself on board the eagle a vessel of sixty guns to the command of which sir hugh palliser was soon appointed intelligent active thoroughly at home in all the details of the service cook was noticed by the officers and attracted the attention of his captain who in a short time received a letter of warm recommendation from the member for scarborough sent in accordance with the pressing solicitations of all the inhabitants of ayton for young cook who shortly afterwards received a warrant at spotswain he embarked upon the mercury bound for canada upon the fifteenth of may seventeen fifty nine and joined the fleet of sir charles saunders who in conjunction with general wolfe conducted the siege of quebec in that campaign cook found the first opportunity of distinguishing himself ordered off to sound the st lawrence between the orleans island and the northern shore of the river he executed his task with much skill and drew up a chart of the channel in spite of the difficulties and dangers of the enterprise his hydrographical skill was acknowledged to be so exact and complete that he received orders to examine the channels of the river below quebec this duty he performed so well that his chart of the st lawrence was published by the english admiralty after the capture of quebec cook passed on to the northumberland under the command of lord colville and profited by his stay on the shores of newfoundland to devote himself to astronomy important operations were now entrusted to him he drew up the plan of Pacentia, and took the bearings of St. Peter and Miquelon. In 1764 he was made naval engineer for Newfoundland and Labrador, and was employed for three consecutive years in hydrographical tasks, which obtained for him the notice of the ministry, and helped to correct innumerable errors in the maps of America. At the same time he addressed a treatise to the Royal Society of London upon an eclipse of the sun which he had observed in newfoundland in 1766 this document appeared in the philosophical transactions cook was not long in receiving a due reward for so much and such successful labor and for his patient studies the more meritorious as he had had few opportunities and was self-taught a scientific question of the highest importance viz the transit of venus across the sun's disk which had been announced for seventeen sixty nine was eagerly discussed by all the scientists of the day the english government confident that this observation could only be effectually made in the pacific sea resolved to send a scientific expedition thither the command was offered to the famous hydrographer a darimple equally celebrated for his astronomical investigations and his geographical discoveries in the southern seas but he was so exacting in his demands and so persevering in his request for a commission as ship's captain which sir edward hawker as obstinately refused that the secretary of the admiralty proposed another commander for the projected enterprise his choice fell upon james cook who was cordially recommended by sir hugh palliser 
and to him therefore the command of the endeavour was given whilst he was at the same time raised to the rank of ship's lieutenant cook was now forty years of age this was his first appointment in the royal navy the mission entrusted to him called for varied qualifications rarely to be met with in a sailor for although the observation of the transit of venus was the principal object of the voyage it was by no means the only one cook was also to make a voyage of discovery in the pacific ocean but the humbly born yorkshire lad was destined to prove himself equal to his task whilst endeavour was being equipped her crew of eighty-four men chosen her store of eighteen months provision embarked her ten guns and twelve swivel guns with the needful ammunition shipped captain wallace arrived in england he had accomplished his voyage round the world he was consulted as to the best spot for the observation of the transit of venus and he selected an island which he had discovered and which was named by him after george the third it was later known by its native name of tahiti from this spot therefore cook was to take observations charles green assistant to dr bradley of greenwich observatory embarked with him to green was entrusted the astronomical department dr solander a swedish doctor of medicine a disciple of linnaeus and professor at the british museum undertook the botanical part finally sir joseph banks joined the expedition out of simple interest anxious to employ his energy and fortune after leaving oxford sir joseph banks had visited the newfoundland coast and labrador and had there acquired a taste for botany two painters accompanied the expedition one a landscape and a portrait painter the other a scientific draughtsman in addition to these persons the company comprised a secretary and four servants two of whom were negroes the endeavour left plymouth upon the twenty sixth of august seventeen sixty eight and put into port at funchal in the island of madeira on the thirteenth of september to obtain fresh fruit and make discoveries the expedition met with a cordial reception during their visit to a convent the staff of the endeavour were entreated by the poor immured recluses to let them know when it would thunder and to find a spring of fresh water for them which they sorely needed in the interior of the convent with all their learning banks solander and cook found it impossible to satisfy these demands from madeira to rio de janeiro where the expedition arrived on the thirteenth of november no incident interrupted the voyage but cook's reception by the portuguese was hardly what he expected the whole time of his stay in port was spent in disputes with the viceroy a man of little knowledge and quite incapable of understanding the scientific aspect of the expedition however he could not well refuse to supply the english with fresh provisions of which they had absolutely none left as however cook was passing fort santa cruz on leaving the bay two shots were fired after him whereupon he immediately cast anchor and demanded the meaning of the insult the viceroy replied that the commandant of the fort had orders to allow no vessel to leave the bay without having his received notice and although captain cook had notified his intention to the viceroy it had by pure neglect not been communicated to the commandant of the fort was this an intentional act of discourtesy on the part of the viceroy or was it simple heedlessness if the viceroy was equally negligent in all the details of his administration the portuguese colony must have been well regulated cook entered the straits of la mer on the fourteenth of january eighteen sixty nine kippis in his life of captain cook gives the following account the sea ran so high that the water was above cape san diego and the vessel was so driven by the wind that her bowsprit was constantly under water next day anchor was cast in a small harbour which was recognised as port maurice and soon afterwards they anchored in the bay of good success whilst the endeavour remained off this spot a strange and untoward adventure befell banks solander dr green and monkhouse the surgeon of the vessel and their attendants they were proceeding towards a mountain in search of plants and as they climbed it they were surprised by cold so penetrating and sudden that they were all in danger of perishing dr solander was seized with vertigo two negro servants died on the spot finally the gentlemen were only able to regain the vessel after a lapse of two days 
they rejoiced in their deliverance with a joy which can only be estimated by those who have escaped similar dangers whilst cook showed a lively pleasure in the cessation of the anxiety their absence had caused him this event gave them a proof of the severity of the climate it was the middle of summer in this part of the world and the day when the cold surprised them had begun as warmly as an ordinary may morning in england James Cook was enabled to make some curious observations upon the savage inhabitants of these desolate regions. Destitute of the necessaries of life, without clothes, without efficient shelter from the almost perpetual severity of this glacial latitude, unarmed and unlearned in any industrial art which would enable them to construct the more necessary utensils, they passed a miserable life, and could only exist with difficulty. In spite of these facts, of all the articles offered in exchange they invariably chose the least useful they joyfully accepted bracelets and necklaces and rejected hatchets knives and fish-hooks careless of what we consider valuables our superfluities were their necessaries cook had reason to congratulate himself upon the selection of this route he took thirty days to double tierra del fuego from the date of his entrance into the straits of la mer to his arrival three degrees north of magellan no doubt a much longer time would have been needed if he had followed the winding course of the strait of magellan his very exact astronomical observations in which green joined him and the directions he gave for this dangerous navigation smoothed the difficulties of his successors and rectified the charts of laramite la mer and Schouten. cook noticed no current of any importance from the twenty first january the day upon which he doubled cape horn to the first of march in a distance of one hundred and sixty leagues of sea he discovered a good many islands in the dangerous archipelago which he respectfully named lagoon arch groups birds and chain islands the greater number were inhabited and were covered with vegetation which to sailors who for three months had seen only sea and sky and the frozen rocks of Tierra del Fuego appeared luxuriant. Soon they found Marti Island, which Wallace had named Osnaburg, and on the next day, 11th of June, the islands of Tahiti were reached. Two days later, the endeavor cast anchor in Port Matavai, called Port Royal by Wallace, and where the captain had had a struggle with the natives, over whom, however, he had triumphed without much difficulty cook aware of the incidents of his predecessor's stay to this port wished above all to avoid similar scenes moreover it was essential to the success of his observations that no interruption or distraction should occur his first care was to read out standing orders to his crew which they were forbidden under heavy penalties to infringe he first declared that he intended in every possible way to cultivate friendly relations with the natives then he selected those who were to buy the needed provisions, and forbade all others to attempt any sort of traffic without special permission. Finally, the men who landed were on no pretext to leave their posts, and if any soldier or workman parted with his arms or implements, not only would the price be deducted from his wages, but he would be punished in proportion to the exigency of the case. In addition to this, to guard the observers from attack, cook decided on constructing a sort of fort in which they might be sheltered within gun range of the endeavour he then landed with messrs banks solander and green soon found a favourable spot and in presence of the natives immediately traced out the extent of land he intended to occupy one of them named Alhaw, who had had friendly intercourse with wallace was particularly profuse in his protestations of friendship as soon as the plan of the fort was fixed, Cook left thirteen men and an officer in charge of the tents, and accompanied his associates into the interior of the island, but he was speedily recalled by the sound of firing. A very painful incident, the consequences of which might have been serious, had occasioned this. One of the natives had surprised a sentinel near the tents, and had possessed himself of a gun. A general discharge was immediately directed upon the inoffensive crowd, but fortunately no one was injured. The robber, meantime, was pursued and killed. A great commotion ensued, and Cook was profuse in his protestations 
to pacify the natives. He promised payment for all that he required for the construction of his fort, and would not allow a tree to be felled without their sanction. Finally, he had the butcher of the endeavor mastheaded and flogged for threatening the wife of one of the chiefs with death. This proceeding effaced the recollection of the painful antecedents, and with the exception of some thieving by the natives, the friendly relations remained undisturbed. And now the moment for the execution of the primary object of the voyage approached. Cook accordingly took steps for putting the instructions he had received into effect. With this in view, he dispatched observers with Sir Joseph Banks to Aimiro, one of the neighboring islands. Four others proceeded to a favorable distance from the fort, where Cook himself proposed to await the transit of the planet. Hence the point of observation was called Point Venus. The night preceding the observation passed with many fears of unfavorable weather, but on the 3rd of June the sun rose in all its glory, and not a cloud troubled the observers throughout the day. The observations, according to W. de Tonnel's article in Nature, for the 28th of March, 1874, were most fatiguing for the astronomers, for they began at twenty-one minutes after nine in the morning, and only terminated at ten minutes after three in the afternoon, at which moment the heat was stifling. The thermometer registered one hundred and twenty degrees Fahrenheit. Cook assures us, and we can readily believe it, that he himself was not certain of the end of his observation. In such theometrical conditions, the human organism, admirable instrument as it is, loses its powers. On passing the sun, the rim of Venus was elongated as though attracted. A black point or dark ligament, a little less dark than the body of the star, was formed. The same phenomenon occurred upon the second interior contact. The observation, says Cook, was made with equal success at the fort, and by those I had sent to the east of the island. From the rising to the setting of the sun, not a single cloud obscured the sky, and Mr. Green, Dr. Solander, and myself observed the entire transit of Venus with the greatest ease. Mr. Green's telescope and mine were of equal power, and that of Dr. Solander still stronger. We noted a luminous atmosphere or fog surrounding the planet, which rendered the actual movement of contact, and especially of interior contacts, somewhat indistinct. To this fact it is owing that our observations varied somewhat one from the other. Whilst the officers and savants were engaged in this important observation, some of the crew, forcing an entrance into the storeroom, stole a hundredweight of nails. This was a grave offence, and one which might have had disastrous results for the expedition. The market was at once gutted with that one article of traffic, and as the natives testified an immoderate desire to possess it, there was every reason to anticipate an increase in their demands. One of the thieves was detected, but only seventy nails were found in his possession, and the application of eighty lashes failed to make him betray his accomplices. Other incidents of this kind constantly occurred, but friendly relations were not seriously disturbed. The officers were free to make incursions into the interior of the island to prosecute scientific investigations and to inquire into the manners of the inhabitants. In one of these excursions, Sir Joseph Banks met a band of itinerant musicians and improvisatory. They were somewhat surprised to find that the arrival of the English and the various incidents of their stay formed the subjects of native songs. Banks followed the river which flows into the sea at Matavai, some distance into the interior, and found traces of a long extinct volcano. He planted and also distributed among the population a large number of kitchen garden seeds, such as watermelons, oranges, lemons, etc., and planned a garden near the fort, where he sowed many of the seeds he had selected at Rio Janeiro. Cook and his principal assistants wished to accomplish the circumnavigation of the island, which they estimated at thirty nautical leagues. During this voyage they entered into amicable relations with the chiefs of different districts, and collected a mass of information as to the manners and customs of the natives. A curious custom was that of allowing the dead to decompose in the open air, and of burying the bones only. 
the corpse was placed in a hut about fifteen feet in length and eleven in height, and of proportionate width. One end was closed up, and the other three sides shut in by trellis work of twigs. The board upon which the corpse rested was five feet above the earth. There the dead body was laid, covered in stuffs, with its club and stone hatchet. Cocoa nuts, wreathed together, were hung at the open end of the tent. Half a cocoa nut, filled with soft water, was placed outside, and a bag containing some bits of toasted bread was attached to a post. This species of monument is called Tau Papau. Whence could that singular method of raising the dead above the ground until the flesh was decayed by putrefaction have been derived? It is quite impossible to find out. Cook could only ascertain that the cemeteries called Morai are places where the natives observe certain religious customs, and that they always betrayed some uneasiness when the English approached. One of their most delicate dishes was dog. Those intended for the table never ate meat, but were fed upon breadfruits, coconuts, yams, and other vegetables. The flesh placed in a hole upon hot stones covered with green leaves was stewed down in four hours. Cook, who partook of it, says it has a delicious flavor. End of section 11section twelve of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter three part one captain cook's first voyage one b on the seventh of july preparations for departure began in a short time the doors and palings were removed and the walls demolished at this moment one of the natives who had received the english with cordiality came on board with a young lad of about thirteen years of age who acted as his servant his name was tupia formerly first minister to queen oberia he was afterwards one of the principal priests of Tahiti. He asked to be allowed to go to England. Many reasons combined to decide Cook upon permitting this. Thoroughly acquainted, as a necessary consequence of his high functions, with all the particulars concerning Tahiti, this native would be able to give the most circumstantial details of his compatriots, and at the same time to initiate them into the civilized customs of the Europeans. Finally, he had visited the neighboring islands and perfectly understood the navigation of those latitudes. On the 13th of July there was a crowd on board the Endeavour. The natives came to bid farewell to their English friends, and to their countrymen, to Pia. Some, overcome with silent sorrow, shed tears. Others, on the contrary, uttered piercing cries, with less of true grief than of affection in their demonstrations. In the immediate neighborhood of Tahiti were to be found, according to Tupia, four islands, Huahiani, Ulaita, Otaha, and Bola Bola. He asserted that wild pigs, fowls, and other needful provisions could easily be obtained there. These commodities had become scarce in the latter part of the stay at Maltavai. Cook, however, preferred visiting a small island called Tethurora, about eight miles north of Tahiti, but the natives had no regular settlement, and he therefore considered it useless to wait there. When they came in sight of Huahiaini, several pierogies approached the endeavor, and it was only after they recognized Tupia that the natives consented to come on board. King Oria, who was among the passengers, was greatly surprised at all the vessel contained. Soon reassured by the welcome of the English, he became so familiar as to wish to exchange names with Cook. During the entire stay in port, he always called himself Cooky, and gave his own name to the captain. Anchor was cast in a conventional harbor, and the officers of this vessel on landing found the manners, the language, and the productions of this island identical with those of Tahiti. Seven or eight leagues southwest lay 
Ulaitia. Cook landed there also, and solemnly took possession of this and the three neighboring islands. He also profited by his stay to make hydrographical surveys of the shores, whilst a leak which had been found in the gun-room of the endeavor was attended to. After reconnoitering various other small islands, Cook gave the entire group the name of Society Isles. Cook sailed on the 7th of August. Six days later, he reconnoitered the island of Oteroa. The hostile demonstrations of the natives prevented the endeavor from remaining. She set sail for the south. On the 25th of August, the anniversary of their departure from England was celebrated by the crew. On the 1st of September, in 40 degrees, 22 minutes south latitude, 174 degrees, 29 minutes east longitude, the sea, agitated by a west wind, became very rough. The endeavor was obliged to put her head to the north and to run before the storm. Up to the 3rd, the weather continued the same. Then it abated, and it was possible to resume the westward route. In a few days, sundry indications of an island or continent appeared, such as floating weeds, land birds, etc. On the 5th of October, the color of the sea changed, and on the morning of the 6th, a coast running west by northwest was perceived. Nearer approach showed it to be of great extent. Unanimous opinion decided that the famous continent, so long looked for, so necessary for the equipoise of the world, known to cosmographers as the unknown land of the south, was at last discovered. This land was the eastern shore of the most northerly of the two islands which have received the name of New Zealand. Smoke was perceived at different points, and the details of the shore were soon mastered. The hills were covered with verdure, and large trees were distinguishable in the valleys. Then houses were perceived, then pirogues, then the natives assembled on the strand, and lastly, a palisade, high and regularly built, surrounded the summit of the hill. Opinions varied as to the nature of this object, some declaring it to be a deer park, others a cattle enclosure, not to speak of many equally ingenious surmises, which were all proved false when later it turned out to be a pa. Towards four o'clock in the afternoon of the 8th of October, anchor was cast in a bay at the mouth of a little river. On either side were white rocks, in the middle a brownish plain, rising by degrees and joining by successive levels a chain of mountains which appeared far in the interior. Such was the aspect of this portion of the shore. Cook, Banks, and Solander entered two small boats accompanied by a part of the crew. As they approached the spot where the natives were assembled, the latter fled. This, however, did not prevent the English from landing, leaving four lads to guard one of the boats, whilst the other remained at sea. They had proceeded only a short distance from the boat, when four men, armed with long spears, emerged from the wood and threw themselves upon it to take possession of it. They would have succeeded with ease, had not the crew of the boat out at sea perceived them, and cried out to the lads to let it drift with the current. They were pursued so closely by the enemy that the master of the pinnace discharged his gun over the heads of the natives. After a moment's hesitation, the natives continued their pursuit, when a second discharge stretched one of them dead on the spot. His companions made an effort to carry him away with them, but were obliged to abandon the attempt, as it retarded their flight. Hearing the firing, the officers who had landed went back to the vessel, whence they soon heard the natives returning to the shore, eagerly discussing the event. Still Cook desired to have friendly intercourse with them. He ordered three boats to be manned, and landed with Banks, Solander, and Tupia. Fifty or more natives seated upon the shore awaited them. They were armed with long lances, and an instrument made of green talc, and highly polished, a foot long, which perhaps weighed four or five pounds. This was the patu patu, or toki, a kind of battle-axe, in talc or bone, with a very sharp edge. All rose at once, and signed to the English to keep their distance. As soon as the marines landed, Cook and his companions advanced to the natives, whom Tupia told that the English had come with peaceful intentions. 
that they only wished for water and provisions, that they would pay for all that was brought them with iron, of which he explained the use. They saw, with pleasure, that the people, whose language was only a dialect of that spoken by the Tahitians, perfectly understood them. After some parleying, about thirty of the natives crossed the river. The strangers gave them iron and glasswares, on which they set no store, but one of them, having succeeded in possessing himself secretly of Mr. Green's cutlass, the others recommenced their hostile demonstrations, and it was necessary to fire at the robber, who was hit, when they all threw themselves into the river to gain the opposite shore. The various attempts at commercial intercourse with the people ended too unfortunately for Cook to persevere in them any longer. He therefore decided to find a watering place elsewhere. Meanwhile, two pirogues, who were trying to regain the shore, were perceived. Cook took measures to intercept them. One escaped by rapid paddling, the other was caught, and although Tupia assured the natives that the English came as friends, they seized their weapons and commenced attacking them. A discharge killed four, and three others, who threw themselves into the sea, were seized after a fierce resistance. The reflections which this sad incident suggested to Captain Cook are much to his honor. They are in strong contradistinction to the ordinary method of proceeding then in vogue, and deserve to be repeated verbatim. I cannot disguise from myself, he says, that all humane and sensible people will blame me for having fired upon these unfortunate Indians, and I should be forced to blame myself for such an act of violence if I thought of it in cold blood. They certainly did not deserve death for refusing to trust to my promises, and to come on board, even if they suspected no danger. But my commission, by its nature, obliged me to take observations of their country, and I could only do so by penetrating into the interior, either by open force or by gaining the confidence and good will of the natives. I have tried unsuccessfully by means of presents, and my anxiety to avoid new hostilities led me to attempt having some of them on board as the sole method of persuading them that far from wishing to hurt them we were disposed to be of use to them. So far, my intentions were certainly not criminal. It is true that during the struggle, which was unexpected by me, our victory might have been equally complete without taking the lives of four of these Indians, but it must also be remembered that in such a situation, the command to fire having once been given, one is no longer in a position to proscribe it, or to lighten its effect. The natives were welcomed on board with every possible demonstration, if not to make them forget, at least to make them less sensible of the pain of remembering their capture. They were loaded with presents, adorned with bracelets and necklaces, but when they were told to land, they all declared, as the boats were directed to the mouth of the river, that it was an enemy's country, and that they would be killed and eaten. However, they were put on shore, and there is no reason to suppose that anything painful came of their adventure. Next day, the 11th of October, Cook left this miserable settlement. He named it Poverty Bay, because of all that he needed, he had not been able to procure but one thing, wood. Poverty Bay, in 38 degrees 42 minutes south latitude, and 181 degrees 36 minutes west longitude, is of horseshoe shape, and affords good anchorage, although it is open to the winds between south and east. Cook continued along the coast in a southerly direction, naming the most remarkable points, and bestowing the name of Portland upon an island which resembled that of the same name in the English Channel. His relations with the natives were everywhere inimical. If they did not break out into open outrage, it was owing to the English patience under every provocation. One day several pierogies surrounded the ship, and nails and glassware were exchanged for fish, when the natives seized Tayito, Tupia's servant, and quickly paddled off. As it was necessary to fire at the robbers, the little Tahitian profited by the confusion, and jumping into the sea was soon picked up by the pinnacle of the endeavor. On the 17th of October, Cook, not having been able to find a suitable harbor, and considering himself, as the sea became more and more rough, to be losing time which might be better employed in reconnoitering the northern coast, tacked round and returned the way he had come. 
On the 23rd of October, the endeavor reached a bay called Tedego, where no swell was perceptible. The water was excellent, and it was easy to procure provisions, the more so as the natives appeared friendly. After having arranged for everything for the safety of the workers, Messrs. Banks and Solander landed and collected plants, and in their walk they found many things worthy of note. Below the valley, surrounded by steep mountains, arose a rock so perforated that from one side the sea could be seen through it, and from the other the long range of hills. Returning on board, the excursionists were stopped by an old man, who insisted upon their taking part in the military exercises of the country with the lance and the patau patau. In the course of another walk, Dr. Solander bought a top, exactly resembling European tops, and the natives made signs to show him that he must whip it to make it go. Upon an island to the left of the bay, the English saw the largest pirogue they had yet met with. It was no less than sixty-eight feet long, five wide, and three feet six inches high. It had in front a sculpture in relief, of grotesque taste, in which the lines were spiral and figures strangely contorted. On the 30th of October, as soon as he was supplied with wood and water, Cook set sail and continued along the coast toward the north. Near an island, to which Cook had given the name of Mayer, the natives behaved most insolently, and were greater thieves than any previously encountered. It was, however, necessary to make a stay of five or six days in this district to observe the transit of Mercury. With a view to impressing upon the natives that the English were not to be eluded with impunity, a robber who had taken a piece of cloth was fired upon with grape-shot, but although he received the discharge in the back, it had no more effect on him than a violent blow with a rattan. But a bullet which struck the water, and returning to the surface passed several times over the pirogues, struck such terror into the hearts of the natives that they hastily paddled to the shore. On the ninth of November, Cook and Green landed to observe the transit of Mercury. Green only observed the passing, while Cook took the altitude of the sun. It is not our intention to follow the navigators in their thorough exploration of New Zealand. The same incidents were endlessly repeated, and the recital of the similar struggles with the natives, with descriptions of natural beauty, however attractive in themselves, could not but pall upon the reader. It is better, therefore, to pass rapidly over the hydrographic portion of the voyage, in order to devote ourselves to our picture of the manners of the natives, now so widely modified. Mercury Bay is situated at the foot of the long-divided peninsula which, running from the east to the northeast, forms the northern extremity of New Zealand. On the 15th of November, as the Endeavour left the bay, several boats advanced towards her. Two of their number, says the narrative, which carried about sixty armed men, approached within hearing, and the natives began their war-song. But seeing that this attracted little attention, they began throwing stones at the English, and paddled along the shore. Soon they returned to the charge, evidently determined to fight the navigators, and encouraging themselves with their war-cry. Without being incited to it, Tupia addressed them reproachfully, and told them that the English had arms, and were in a position to overpower them instantly. But they valiantly replied, Come to land, and we will kill you all. Directly, replied Tupia, but why insult us as long as we are at sea? We have no wish to fight, and we will not accept your challenge, because there is no quarrel between us. The sea does not belong to you any more than to our ship. Tupia had not been credited with so much simple and true eloquence, and it surprised Cook and the other English. Whilst he was in the bay of the islands, the captain reconnoitred a considerable river, which he named after the Thames. It was shaded with trees, some of the same species as those on Poverty Island. One of them measured nineteen feet in circumference at the height of six feet above the ground. Another was not less than ninety feet long, from the root to the lowest branches. Although quarrels with the natives were frequent, the latter were not invariably in the wrong. Kippis relates as follows. Some of the men on board, who, after the Indians, had once been found in fault, did not fail to exhibit a severity worthy of Lycurgus, thought fit to enter a New Zealand plantation, and to carry off a quantity of potatoes. 
Captain Cook condemned them to a dozen stripes each. Two of them received them peaceably, but the third persisted that it was no crime for an Englishman to pillage Indian plantations. Cook's method of dealing with this causist was to send him to the bottom of the hold until he agreed to receive six additional stripes. On the 30th of December, the English doubled a cape, which they took to be that of Maria van Diemen, who discovered Tasman, but they were so assailed by threatening winds that Cook only accomplished ten leagues in three weeks. Fortunately, they kept at a uniform distance from shore all the time, otherwise they should probably have been spared the recital of their further adventures. End of section 12section thirteen of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter three part one Captain Cook's First Voyage, 1C. On the 16th of January, 1770, after naming various portions of the eastern shore, Cook arrived in sight of an imposing peak which was covered with snow, and which he named Mount Egmont, in honour of the Earl of that name. Scarcely had he doubled the peak when he found that the coast described the arc of a circle. It was split up into numberless roadsteads, which cook determined to enter in order to allow of his ship being repaired and keeled he landed at the bottom of a creek where he found a fine river and plenty of trees for the forest only ceased at the sea for want of soil the amicable relations with the natives at this point enabled him to inquire if they had ever seen a vessel like the endeavour but he found that even the traditions of tasman's visit were forgotten although he was only fifteen miles south of Assassin Bay. In one of the provision baskets of the New Zealanders, ten half-gnawed bones were found. They did not look like a dog's bones, and on near inspection they turned out to be human remains. The natives, in reply to the questions put to them, asserted that they were in the habit of eating their enemies. A few days later they brought on board the Endeavour seven human heads, to which hair and flesh still adhered, but the brains, as being delicate morsels, were already picked. The flesh was soft, and no doubt was preserved from decay by some ingredient, for it had no unpleasant odour. Banks bought one of these heads after some difficulty, but he could not induce the old man who brought it to part with a second, probably because the New Zealanders considered them as trophies and testimonies to their bravery. The succeeding days were devoted to a visit to the environs and to some walks in the neighborhood. During one of these excursions, Cook, having climbed a high hill, distinctly perceived the whole of the strait to which he had given the name of Queen Charlotte, and the opposite shore, which appeared to him about four leagues distant. A fog made it impossible for him to see further to the southeast, but he had discerned enough to assure him that it was the final extent of the large island of which he had followed all the windings. He had now only to finish his discoveries in the south, which he proposed to do as soon as he had satisfied himself that Queen Charlotte's Sound was really a strait. Cook visited a pa in the neighborhood. Built upon a little island or inaccessible rock, the pa was merely a fortified village. The natives most frequently add to their natural defenses by fortifications, which rendered the approach still more perilous. Many were defended by a double ditch, the inner one having a parapet and double palisade. The second ditch was at least eighty feet in depth. On the inside of the palisade, at the height of twenty feet, was a raised platform forty-five feet long by six wide. Supported on two large poles, it was intended to hold the defenders of the place, who from thence could easily overwhelm the attacking party with darts and stones, of which an enormous supply was always ready in case of need. These strongholds cannot be forced, unless by means of a long blockade the inmates should be compelled to surrender. 
it is surprising as cook remarks that the industry and care employed by them in building places so well adapted for defence almost without the use of instruments should not by the same means have led them to invent a single weapon of any importance with the sole exception of the spear they throw with the hand they do not understand the use of a bow to throw a dart or of a sling to fling a stone which is the more astonishing as the invention of slings and bows and arrows is far more simple than the construction of these works by the people and moreover these two weapons are met with in almost all parts of the world in the most savage countries on the sixth of february cook left the bay and set sail for the east in the hope of discovering the entrance to the strait before the ebb of the tide at seven in the evening the vessel was driven by the violence of the current to the close neighbourhood of a small island outside cape koamaru sharply pointed rocks rose from the sea the danger increased momentarily one only hope of saving the ship remained it was attempted and succeeded a cable's length was the distance between the endeavour and the rock when anchor was cast in seventy-five fathoms of water fortunately the anchor found a hold and the current changing its direction after touching the island carried the vessel past the rock but she was not yet in safety for she was still in the midst of rocks and the current made five miles an hour however the current decreased the vessel righted herself and the wind becoming favourable she was speedily carried to the narrowest part of the strait which she crossed without difficulty the most northerly island of new zealand which is named iahia no maui was however as yet only partially known and there still remained some fifteen leagues unexplored a few officers affirmed from this that it was a continent and not an island which was contrary to cook's view but although his own mind was made up the captain directed his navigation with a clear view to clear up any doubt which might remain in the minds of his officers after two days voyage in which cape palliser was passed he called them up on the quarter-deck and asked if they were satisfied as they replied in the affirmative cook gave up his idea of returning to the most southerly point he had reached on the eastern coast of iahia no maui and determined to prolong his cruise the entire length of the land which he had found and which was named to wei paunamau the coast was more sterile and appeared uninhabited it was necessary to keep four or five leagues from the shore on the night of the ninth of march the endeavour passed over several rocks and in the morning the crew discovered what dangers they had escaped they named these reefs the snares as they appeared placed there to surprise unsuspecting navigators next day cook reconnoitred what appeared to him to be the extreme south of new zealand and called it south cape it was the point of steward island great waves from the southwest burst over the vessel as it doubled this cape which convinced captain cook that there was no land in that quarter he therefore returned to the northern route to complete the circumnavigation of new zealand by the eastern coast almost at the southern extremity of this coast a bay was discovered which received the name of dusky this region was sterile steep covered with snow dusky bay was three or four miles in width at its entrance and appeared as deep as it was wide several islands were contained in it behind which a vessel would have had excellent shelter but cook thought it prudent not to remain there as he knew that the wind which would enable him to leave the bay blew only once a month in these latitudes he differed upon this point with several of his officers who thinking only of the present advantage did not reflect upon the inconveniences of a stay in port the duration of which would be uncertain no incident occurred during the navigation of the eastern coast of tuwei paunamau from dusky bay according to cook to forty four degrees twenty minutes latitude there is a straight chain of hills which rise directly from the sea and are covered with forests behind and close to these hills are mountains which form another chain of prodigious height composed of barren and jagged rocks excepting in the parts where they are covered with snow mostly in large masses it is impossible to conceive a wilder prospect 
or a more savage and frightful one than this country from the sea because in every point of view nothing is visible but the summits of rocks so close to each other that in lieu of valleys there are only fissures between them from forty four degrees twenty minutes to forty two degrees eight minutes the aspect varies the mountains are in the interior hills and fruitful valleys border the coast from forty two degrees eight minutes to the forty one degrees thirty minutes the coast inclines vertically to the sea and is covered with dark forests the endeavour moreover was too far from the shore and the weather was too dark for it to be possible to distinguish minor details after achieving the circumnavigation of the country the vessel regained the entrance to queen charlotte sound cook took in water and wood then he decided on returning to england following the route which permitted him best to fulfil the object of his voyage to his keen regret for he had greatly wished to decide whether or no the southern continent existed it was as impossible for him to return to europe by cape horn as by the cape of good hope in the middle of winter in an extreme southerly latitude his vessel was in no condition to bring the enterprise to a successful issue he had no choice therefore but to take the route for the east indies and to this end to steer westward to the eastern shores of new holland but before proceeding to the narration of the incidents of the second part of the campaign it will be better to glance backward and summarize the information upon the situation productions and inhabitants of new zealand which the navigators had accumulated we have already seen that this land had been discovered by abel tasman and we have noted the incidents which were marked with traces of bloodshed when it was reconnoitred by the dutch captain with the exception of tasman in 1642 no european captain had ever visited its shores it was so far unknown that it was not even decided whether it formed a part of the southern continent as tasman supposed when he named it staten island to cook belongs the credit of determining its position and of tracing the coasts of these two large islands situated between thirty four degrees and forty eight degrees south latitude one hundred eighty degrees and one hundred ninety four degrees west longitude to wei panamau was mountainless sterile and apparently very sparsely populated Yehienomawe presented an attractive appearance in its hills mountains and valleys covered with wood and watered by bright flowing streams cook formed an opinion of the climate upon the remarks made by banks and solander that if the english settled in this country it would cost them but little care and work to cultivate all that they needed in great abundance as for the quadrupeds new zealand afforded an asylum for dogs and rats only the former reserved for food but if the fauna was poor the flora was rich among the vegetable products which attracted the english most was one of which the narrative says the natives used as hemp and flax a plant which surpasses all those used for the same purposes in other countries the ordinary dress of the new zealanders is composed of leaves of this plant with very little preparation they fabricate their cords lines and ropes from it and they are much stronger than those made with hemp and to which they can be compared for the same plant prepared in another way they draw long thin fibres lustrous as silk and white as snow their best stuffs are manufactured from these fibres and are of extraordinary strength their nets of an enormous size are composed of these leaves the work simply consisting in cutting them into suitable lengths and fastening them together this wonderful plant which was so enthusiastically described in the lyrical account just quoted and the hardly less exuberant one which la Bidiere afterwards gave of it is known in our day as forneum tenax it was really necessary to subdue the expectations that these narratives excited according to the eminent chemist ducharte the prolonged action of the damp heat and above all bleaching disintegrates the cellular particles of this plant and after one or two washings the tissue which are fabricated from it are reduced to tau still it forms a considerable article of commerce mr alfred kennedy 
in his very curious work on New Zealand, tells us that in 1865 only 15 bales of fornium were exported, that four years later the export amounted to the almost incredible number of 12,162 bales, and that in 1870 to 32,820 bales, valued at 132,578 pounds. The inhabitants were tall and well-proportioned, alert, vigorous, and intelligent. The women had not the delicate organization and grace of form which distinguished them in other countries. Dressed like the men, they were recognizable only by their sweetness of voice and the liveliness of expression. Although the natives of the same tribe were affectionate in their relations to each other, they were implacable to their enemies, and they gave no quarter. The dead bodies of their enemies afforded horrible festivities, which the want of other animal food explains, but can hardly excuse. Perhaps, says Cook, it appears strange that there were frequent wars in a country where so few advantages follow victory. But besides the need of procuring meat, which led to the frequency of these wars, another cause for them, unknown to Cook, existed in the fact that the population consisted of two distinct races, naturally enemies of each other. Ancient tradition has it that the Maoris came in the first instance, some thirteen hundred years ago, from the Sandwich Islands. There is reason for believing this to be correct, when one reflects that the beautiful Polynesian race peopled all the archipelago sprinkled throughout the Pacific Ocean. Leaving Hauikai, which must be identical with Hawaii, of the Sandwich Islands, or Sinai, of the Navigator Archipelago, the Maoris had repelled or possibly driven back the aboriginal population. In truth, the earliest colonists noticed two distinctly separate types of New Zealanders. The one, and most important, unmistakably recalled the natives of Hawaii, the Marquesas, and Tonga Islands, whilst the other offered many resemblances to the Melanesian races. These particulars, collected by Freycinet, and recently confirmed by Hochstetten, are in perfect accord with a singular fact, recorded by Cook, that Tupia, a native of Tahiti, made himself readily understood by the New Zealanders. The migrations of the Polynesian tribes are thoroughly understood in these days, thanks to the wider knowledge of languages and anthropology, but were scarcely suspected in the time of Cook, who, indeed, was one of the first to collect legends on the subject. Every one of these tribes, he says, traditionally believes that his forefathers came years ago from another country, and they all assert from the same tradition that the country was called Hiawisi. The country at this time produced only one quadruped, the dog, and that was an alien. Thus the New Zealanders had no means of subsistence but vegetables and a few fowls unknown to the English. Fortunately, the inhabitants were saved from death by starvation by the abundance of fish. Accustomed to war, and looking upon all strangers as enemies, possibly seeing in them merely an edible commodity, the natives naturally attacked the English. Once convinced, however, of the utter inadequacy of their weapons, and of the powers of their adversaries, once convinced that the newcomers avoided using these instruments which produced such terrific effects, they treated the navigators as friends, and conducted themselves towards them with surprising loyalty. If the natives usually met with by the navigators had little idea of decency or modesty, the same was not true of the New Zealanders, and Cook gives a curious example of this fact. Although not so clean as the natives of Tahiti, whose climate was much warmer, and although they bathed less often, they took a pride in their persons and showed a certain coquetry. For instance, they greased their hair with an oil or fat obtained from fishes or birds, which, becoming rank after a while, made them as disagreeable to the refined sense of smell as the Hottentots. They were in the habit of tattooing themselves, and some of their tattoo designs demonstrated wonderful skill and taste certainly not to be expected among this primitive race. The English were greatly surprised to find that the women devoted less attention to their attire than the men. Their hair was cut short and without ornament, and they wore clothes similar to those of their husbands. Their sole attempt at coquetry consisted in fastening the most extraordinary things to their ears, stuffs, feathers, 
fish bones, bits of wood, not to mention green talc needles, the nails and teeth of their deceased parents, and generally everything they could lay hands on, which they suspended by means of thread. This recalls an adventure related by Cook, which happened to a Tahitian woman. This woman, envious of all she saw, wanted to have a padlock attached to her ear. She was allowed to take it, and then the key was thrown into the sea before her. After a certain time, either because the weight of this singular ornament worried her, or because she wished to replace it by another, she begged to have it removed. The request was refused, upon the ground that her demand was foolish, and that as she had wished for this singular ear-ring, it was fair that she should put up with its inconveniences. The clothing of the New Zealanders consisted of one piece of stuff, something between reed or cloth, attached to the shoulders and falling to the knees, and of a second rolled round the waist, which reached to the ground. But the latter was not an invariable part of their dress. Thus, when they had on only the upper part of their costume, and they squatted, they presented the appearance of thatched roofs. Their coverings were sometimes trimmed in a most elegant manner, by means of various colored fringes, and more rarely with dog-skin cut into strips. But the industry of these people was especially shown in the construction of their pirogues. Their war vessels contained from forty to fifty armed men, and one of them, measured at Ugala, was no less than sixty-eight feet long. It was beautifully ornamented with open work and decorated with fringes of black feathers. The smaller ones generally had poles. Occasionally two pirogues were joined together. The fishing boats were ornamented at the prow and the poop by the face of a grinning man with hideous features, lolling tongue, and eyes made of white shells. Two pirogues were often coupled, and the very smallest carried only the poles needed to preserve their equilibrium. The usual cause of illnesses, remarks Cook, being intemperance and want of exercise, it is not surprising that these people rejoice in perfect health. Each time that we went to their settlements, men, women, and children surrounded us, excited by the same curiosity which caused us to look at them. We never saw one who appeared affected by illness, and amongst all that we saw naked we never remarked the smallest eruption on the skin, nor any trace of spots or sores. End of section 13《Section 14 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. — Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3, Part 2. Captain Cook's First Voyage. Two. Reconnoitering the Eastern Coast of Australia, Remarks on the Natives and the Productions of the Country, The Endeavour Stranded, Perpetual Dangers of Navigation, Crossing Torres Straits, The Natives of New Guinea, Return to England. On the 31st of March, Cook left Cape Farewell and New Zealand, steering westward, on the 19th of April, he perceived land which extended from northeast to west in 37 degrees 58 minutes south latitude and 210 degrees 39 minutes west longitude. In his opinion, judging by Tasman's chart, this was the country called Van Diemen's Land. In any case, he was unable to ascertain whether the portion of the coast before him belonged to Tasmania. He named all the points on his northern voyage— Hicks Point, Ram Head, Cape Howe, Dromedary Mount, Upright Point, Pigeon House, etc. This part of Australia is mountainous and covered with various kinds of trees. Smoke announced it to be inhabited, but the sparse population ran away as soon as the English prepared to land. The first natives were seen armed with long lances and a piece of wood shaped like a scimitar, this was the famous boomerang, so effective a weapon in the hands of the natives, so useless in that of the Europeans. 
The faces of the natives were covered with white powder, and their bodies were striped with lines of the same color, which, passing obliquely across the chest, resembled the shoulder belts of soldiers. On their thighs and legs they had circles of the same kind, which would have appeared like gaiters, had not the natives been entirely naked. A little further on the English once more attempted to land, but two natives whom they had previously endeavoured to propitiate by throwing them nails, glassware, and other trifles, made such menacing demonstrations that they were obliged to fire over their heads. At first they seemed stunned by the detonation, but as they found that they were not wounded, they commenced hostilities by throwing stones and javelins. A volley of bullets struck the oldest in his legs. The unfortunate native rushed at once to one of the cabins, but returned with a shield to continue the fight, which was shortly ended, when he was convinced of his powerlessness. The English seized the opportunity to land, and reached the houses, where they found several spears. In the same bay they landed some casks for water, but communication with the natives was hopeless. They fled immediately on the advance of the English. During an excursion on land, Cook, Banks, and Solander found traces of various animals. The birds were plentiful and remarkably beautiful. The great number of plants discovered by the naturalists in this part induced Cook to give it the name of Botany Bay. This bay is, he says, large, safe, and convenient. It is situated in 34 degrees south latitude and 208 degrees 37 minutes west longitude. Wood and water were easily procurable there. The trees, according to Cook, were at least as large as the oaks of England, and I saw one which somewhat resembled them. It is that one which distills a red gum, like dragon's blood. No doubt this was a species of eucalyptus. Among the various kinds of fishes which abounded in these latitudes is the thorn-back skake, one of which, even after cleaning, weighed 336 pounds. On the 6th of May, Cook left Botany Bay, and continued to coast to the north at two or three miles distance from the shore. The navigation along this coast was sufficiently monotonous. The only incidents which imparted a slight animation were the sudden and unexpected differences in the depth of the sea, caused by the line of breakers which it was necessary to avoid. Landing a little further on, the navigators ascertained that the country was inferior to that surrounding Botany Bay. The soil was dry and sandy. The sides of the hills were sparsely covered with isolated trees and free from brushwood. The sailors killed a bustard, which was pronounced to be the best game eaten since leaving England. Hence, this point was named Bustard Bay. Numbers of bivalves were found there, especially small pearl oysters. On the 25th of May, the endeavor, being a mile from land, was opposite a point which exactly crossed the Tropic of Capricorn. The following day it was ascertained that the sea rose and fell seven feet. The flow was westward, and the ebb eastward, just the reverse of the case in Botany Bay. In this spot islands were numerous, the channel narrow, and very shallow. On the twenty-ninth, Cook landed with Banks and Solander in a large bay, in search of a spot where he could have the keel and bottom of his vessel repaired but they were scarcely on terra firma when they found their progress impeded by a thick shrub, prickly and studded with sharp seeds, no doubt a species of spinifex, which clung to the clothes, pierced them, and penetrated the flesh. At the same time, myriads of gnats and mosquitoes attacked them and covered them with painful bites. A suitable spot for repairs was found, but a watering place was sought in vain. Gum trees growing here and there were covered with enormous ants' nests, and soon deprived of gum by those insects. Numerous brilliantly colored butterflies hovered over the explorers. These were curious facts, interesting from more than one point of view, but they failed to satisfy the captain, who was eager to replenish his water supply. From the first, the great defect of this country was apparent. It consists in the absence of streams, springs, and rivers. A second excursion made during the evening of the same day was equally barren of good results. Cook ascertained that the bay was very deep, and decided on making the circuit of it in the morning. 
he soon discovered that the width of the channel by which he entered increased rapidly and that it ultimately formed a vast lake communicating with the sea to the northwest another arm stretched eastwards and it was conceivable that the lake had a second outlet to the sea at the bottom of the bay cook named this part of australia new south wales sterile sandy dry it lacked all that was most necessary for the establishment of a colony and the english could not ascertain from their cursory inspection or hydrographical examination that mineralogically speaking it was one of the richest countries in the new world the navigation was monotonously continued from the thirty first of may to the tenth of june on this latter date the endeavour after passing safely along an unknown coast in the midst of shallows and breakers for a space of twenty two degrees or thirteen hundred miles was all at once exposed to a greater danger than any which had been apprehended they were in sixteen degrees south latitude and two hundred and fourteen degrees thirty nine minutes west longitude when cook seeing two islets lying low and covered with trees gave orders to keep well out to sea during the night so as to look for the islands discovered by quiros in these latitudes an archipelago which some geographers had maintained was united to the mainland shortly after nine in the evening the soundings taken every quarter of an hour showed constantly decreasing depth all crowded to the deck the water became deeper it was concluded that the vessel had passed over the extremity of the sand banks seen at sunset and all rejoiced at escape from danger when the depths increased cook and all but the officers of the watch retired to their berths but at eleven o'clock the sounding line after indicating twenty fathoms suddenly recorded seventeen and before it was possible to cast anchor the endeavour had touched and beaten by the waves struck upon a rock the situation was a serious one the endeavour raised by a wave over the ridge of a reef had fallen again into a hollow in the rock and by the moonlight portions of the false keel and the sheathing could be seen floating unfortunately the accident happened at high water it was useless therefore to count upon the assistance of the tide to release the ship without loss of time the guns barrels casks ballast and all that could lighten the vessel were thrown overboard the vessel still struck against the rock the sloop was put to sea the sails and topsails were lowered and tow-lines were thrown to the starboard and the captain was about to order the anchor to be cast on the same side when it was discovered that the water was deeper at the stern but although the capstan was vigorously worked it was impossible to move the vessel daybreak disclosed the position in all its horrors land was eight leagues distant not a single isle was visible between the ship and land where refuge might be found if as was to be feared the vessel broke up although she had been lightened of fifty tons weight the sea only gained a foot and a half fortunately the wind fell otherwise the endeavour must soon have been a wreck however the leak increased rapidly although the pumps worked incessantly a third was put into action the alternative was dreadful if the vessel were freed it must sink when no longer sustained by the rock while if it remained fixed it must be demolished by the waves which rent its planks asunder the boats were too small to carry all the crew to land at one time under such circumstances was there not danger that discipline would be thrown to the winds who could tell whether a fratricidal struggle might not ensue and even should some of the sailors reach land what fate could be in store for them upon an inhospitable shore where nets and firearms would scarcely procure them nourishment what would become of those who were obliged to remain on board every one shared these fears but so strong a sense of duty prevailed so much was the captain beloved by his crew that the terrors of the situation evoked no single cry nor disorder of any kind the strength of the men not employed at the pumps was wisely harbored for the moment when their fate should be decided measures were so skilfully taken that when the sea rose to its height all the officers and crew worked the capstan and as the vessel was disengaged from the rock it was ascertained that she drew no more water than when on the reef but the sailors were exhausted after twenty-four hours of such terrible anxiety it was necessary to change hands at the pumps every five minutes a new disaster was now added 
the man whose duty it was to measure the water in the hold announced that it had increased to eighteen inches in a few moments fortunately the mistake of the measure taken was immediately ascertained and the crew were so overjoyed that they fancied all danger over an officer named monkhouse conceived an excellent idea he applied a sort of cap to the stern which he filled in with wool rope yarn and the intestines of the animals slaughtered on board and so effected a stoppage of the leak from this time the men who spoke of driving the vessel on a coast to reconstruct another from its ruins which might take them to the east indies thought only of finding a suitable harbour for this purpose the desirable harbour was reached on the seventeenth of june at the mouth of a current which cook called endeavour river the necessary labours for the careening of the vessel were at once begun and carried on with the utmost rapidity the sick were landed and the staff visited the land several times in the hope of killing some game and of procuring fresh meat for the sufferers from scurvy tupia saw an animal which banks from his description imagined to have been a wolf but a few days later several others were seen who jumped upon their forefeet and took enormous leaps they were kangaroos marsupial animals only met with in australia and which had never before seen a european the natives on this spot appeared far less savage than on other parts of the coast they not only allowed the english to approach but treated them cordially and remained several days with them the narrative says they were usually of medium height but their limbs were remarkably small their skin was the color of soot or rather it might be described as of deep chocolate color their hair was black and not woolly and was cut short some wore it plaited some curled various portions of their bodies were painted red and one of them had white stripes on his lips and breast which he called kerbanda their features were far from disagreeable they had very bright eyes white and even teeth and their voices were sweet and musical some among them wore a nose ornament which cook had not met with in new zealand it was a bone as large as a finger passed through the cartilage a little later a quarrel arose the crew had taken possession of some tortoises which the natives claimed without having in the least assisted in capturing them when they found that their demand was not acceded to they retired in fury and set fire to the shrubs in the midst of which the english encampment was situated the latter lost all their combustible commodities in the conflagration and the fire leaping from hill to hill afforded a magnificent spectacle during the night meantime messrs banks solander and the others enjoyed many successful hunts they killed kangaroos opossums a species of polecat wolverines and various kinds of serpents some of which were venomous they also saw numbers of birds kites hawks cockatoos orioles paroquets pigeons and other unknown birds after leaving endeavour river cook had good opportunities of testing the difficulties of navigation in these latitudes rocks and shallows abounded it was necessary to cast anchor in the evening for it was impossible to proceed at night through this labyrinth of rocks without striking the sea as far as the eye could reach appeared to dash upon one line of rocks more violently than upon the others this appeared to be the last upon arriving there after five days struggle with a contrary wind cook discovered three islands stretching four or five leagues to the north but his difficulties were not over the vessel was once more surrounded by reefs and chains of low islets among which it was impossible to venture cook was inclined to think it would be more prudent to return and seek another passage but such a detour would have consumed too much time and have retarded his arrival in the east indies moreover there was an insurmountable obstacle to this course three months provisions were all that remained the situation appeared desperate and cook decided to steer as far as possible from the coast and to try and pass the exterior line of rocks he soon found a channel which shortly brought them to the open sea so happy a change in the situation says kippis was received with delight the english were full of it and openly expressed their joy for nearly three months they had been in perpetual danger when at night they rested at anchor the sound of an angry sea forced them to remember that they were surrounded by rocks and that should the cable break shipwreck was inevitable 
they had travelled over three hundred and sixty miles and were forced to keep a man incessantly throwing the line and sounding the rocks through which they navigated possibly no other vessel could furnish an example of such continued effort had they not just escaped so terrible a danger the english would have had cause for uneasiness in reflecting upon the length of way that remained to them across a sea but little known upon a vessel which let in nine inches of water in an hour with pumps out of repair and provisions almost consumed the navigators only escaped these terrible dangers to be exposed on the sixteenth of april to a peril of equal magnitude carried by the waves to a line of rocks above which the sea spray washed to a prodigious height making it impossible to cast anchor without a breath of wind they had but one resource to lower boats to tow the vessel off in spite of the sailor's efforts the endeavour was still only one hundred paces from the reef when a light breeze so slight that under better circumstances no one would have noticed it arose and disengaged the vessel but ten minutes later it fell the currents strongly returned and the endeavour was once more carried within two hundred feet of the breakers after many unsuccessful attempts a narrow opening was perceived the danger it offered was less imminent than that of remaining in so terrible a situation says the narrative a light breeze which fortunately sprang up the efforts of the boat and the tide conveyed the ship to the opening across which she passed with frightful rapidity the strength of the current prevented the endeavour from touching either shore of the channel which however was but a mile in width and extremely unequal in depth giving now thirty fathoms now only seven of foul bottom if we have lingered somewhat over the incidents of this voyage it is because it was accomplished in unknown seas in the midst of breakers and currents which sufficiently dangerous for a sailor when they are marked on a map became much more so when as was the case with cook since leaving the coast of new holland the voyages made in the face of unknown obstacles which all the instinct and keen vision of the sailor cannot always successfully surmount one last question remained to be solved were new holland and new guinea portions of one country were they divided by an arm of the sea or by a strait in spite of the dangers of such a course cook approached the shore and followed the coast of australia towards the north on the twenty first he doubled the most northerly cape of new holland to which he gave the name of cape york and entered a channel sprinkled with islands near the mainland which inspired him with hope of finding a passage to the indian ocean once more he landed and planting the english flag solemnly took possession in the name of king george of the entire eastern coast from the eleventh degree of latitude to this spot situated in one hundred and seven degrees south he gave the name of new south wales to this territory and to fitly conclude the ceremony he caused three salutes to be fired cook next penetrated torres strait which he called endeavour strait discovered and named the wallace islands situated in the middle of the southwest entrance to booby island and prince of wales island and steered for the southern coast of new guinea which he followed until the third of september without being able to land upon that day cook landed with about eleven well-armed men among them solander banks and his servants they were scarcely a quarter mile from their ship when three indians emerged from the wood uttering piercing cries and rushed at the english the one who came nearest says the narrative threw something which he carried at his side with his hand and it burned like gunpowder but we heard no report cook and his companions were obliged to fire upon the natives in order to regain their ship from whence they could examine them at their leisure they resembled the australians entirely and like them wore their hair short and were perfectly naked only their skin was less dark no doubt because they were less dirty meantime the natives struck their fire at intervals four or five at a time we could not imagine what this fire could be nor their object in throwing it they held in the hand a short stick perhaps a hollow cane which they flourished from side to side and at the same instant we saw the fire and smoke exactly as it flashes from a gun and it lasted no longer we observed this astonishing phenomenon from the vessel and the illusion was so great that those on board believed that the indians had firearms and we ourselves should have imagined they fired guns but that our ship was so close that in such a case we must have heard the explosion 
This fact remains unexplained, in spite of the many commentaries it has occasioned, and which bear out the testimony of the great navigator. Many of the English officers demanded immediate permission to land in search of coconuts and other fruits, but the captain was unwilling to risk his sailors' lives in so futile an attempt. He was, besides, anxious to reach Batavia to obtain repairs for his vessel. He thought it useless, moreover, to remain a longer time in these latitudes. They had been so often visited by the Spanish and Dutch that there were no further discoveries to make. In passing Arrow and Weasel Island, he rectified their positions, and reaching Timor, put in to port in Savu Island, where the Dutch had been settled for some time. There Cook revictualled, and by accurate observation settled its position at 10 degrees 35 minutes southern latitude, and 237 degrees 30 minutes west longitude. After a short interval the endeavor arrived at Batavia, where she was repaired. But the stay in that unhealthy country was fatal after such severe fatigue. Endemic fevers raged there, and Banks, Solander, and Cook, as well as the greater part of the crew, fell ill. Many died, amongst them Monkhouse, the surgeon, Tupia, and little Taito. Ten men only escaped the fever. The endeavor set sail on the 27th of December, and on the 15th of January, 1771, put into Prince of Wales Island for victuals. From that moment sickness increased amongst the crew. Twenty-three men died, amongst them Green, the astronomer, who was much regretted. After a stay at the Cape of Good Hope, where he met with the welcome he so sorely needed, Cook re-embarked and touched at St. Helena, and anchored in the Downs on the 11th of June, 1772, after an absence of nearly four years. Thus, says Kippus, ended Cook's first voyage, a voyage in which he had experienced such dangers, discovered so many countries, and so often evinced his superiority of character. He was well worthy of the dangerous enterprise, and of the courageous efforts to which he had been called. End of section 14section fifteen of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter four part one Captain Cook's Second Voyage, 1A. Search for the Southern Continent. Second Stay at New Zealand. Pamantu Archipelago. Second Stay at Tahiti. Reconnoitering Tonga Isles. Third Stay at New Zealand. Second Crossing of the Southern Ocean. Easter Island Reconnoitered. Visit to the Marquesas Islands. Had the government not been desirous of rewarding James Cook for the way in which he had fulfilled the mission entrusted to him, the unanimous voice of the public would have constrained them. On the 29th of August, he received the rank of commander in the Royal Navy, but the great navigator, proud of the services he had rendered to England and to science, thought the reward less than his achievements merited. He would have delighted in an appointment as ship's captain, but Lord Sandwich, who was then at the head of the Admiralty, pointed out to him that it was not possible to gratify him without upsetting all established customs and injuring the discipline of the Royal Navy. However, Cook busied himself in putting together the necessary materials for the narration of his experiences, but being soon occupied with still more important matters, he placed them in the hands of Dr. Hawksworth, who was to superintend their publication. At the same time, the observations he had taken on the transit of Mercury, in concert with Mr. Green, his calculations and astronomical solutions were submitted to the consideration of the Royal Society, and that learned body at once recognized his merit. In one respect, however, the important results obtained by Cook were incomplete. He had not perfectly proved the impossibility of an Antarctic continent, the chimera was still dear to the hearts of scientific men. 
although obliged to admit that neither New Zealand nor Australia made part of such a continent, and that the endeavor had navigated in latitudes in which it might have been found, they still affirmed that it would be found still more south, and reiterated all those advantages which its discovery would entail. The government determined to settle a question which had been discussed for so many years, and to dispatch an expedition for the purpose. Its commander was easily selected. The nature of the voyage demanded vessels of peculiar construction. As the endeavor had been sent to the Falkland Islands, the Admiralty gave orders for the purchase of two suitable vessels for the purpose. Cook was consulted, and insisted that the ships should be solidly built, draw the little water, and possess capacity for carrying provisions and ammunition in proportion to the number of the crew and the length of the voyage. The Admiralty accordingly bought two vessels constructed at Whitby by the same shipbuilder as the Endeavour. The larger was of 462 tons burden and was named the Resolution. The second was only of 336 tons and was called the Adventure. Cook received command of the Resolution, and Captain Tobias Ferno, second lieutenant of the Wallace, was raised to the command of the Adventure. The second and third officers and several of the crew had already served in the endeavor. It may readily be imagined that every possible care was taken in the equipment of these ships. Lord Sandwich and Captain Palliser themselves superintended every detail. Each of the ships was stocked with provisions of every kind for two years and a half. Very extraordinary articles were provided at the instance of Captain Cook, who claimed them as anti-scorbutics. For instance, malt, sauerkraut, salted cabbages, soup slabs, mustard, and saloop, as well as carrot marmalade and thickened and unfermented beer, which was tried at the suggestion of Baron Storch of Berlin and Mr. Pelham, secretary to the commissariat department. Equal care was taken to ship two small boats, each of twenty tons, intended to carry the crew in case of shipwreck. William Hodges, a landscape painter, two naturalists, John Reinhold Forster and his son George, two astronomers, W. Wales and W. Bailey, accompanied the expedition, provided with the best instruments for observation. Nothing that could conduce to the success of the adventure was neglected. It was to return with an immense amount of collected information, which was to contribute to the progress of the natural and physical sciences and to the ethnology of navigation and geography. Cook says, I received my instructions at Plymouth dated 25th June. They enjoined my immediate departure for the island of Madeira, to ship wine there and thence to proceed to the Cape of Good Hope, where I was to let the crew have a spree on shore and obtain the provisions and other stores I needed, to advance southwards and endeavor to find Circumcision Cape, which was said to have been discovered by M. Bouvet in the 54 degrees southern parallel, and about 11 degrees 20 minutes east longitude, reckoning from Greenwich. If I found this cape, to ascertain whether it was part of the continent or an island, should it prove the former, to neglect no opportunity of investigating its possible extent to collect facts of every kind which might be useful to navigation and commerce, or would tend to the progress of the natural sciences. I was desired to observe the spirit, temperament, character, and means of the inhabitants, should there be any, and to use every fair means of forming friendly alliances with them. My instructions proceeded to enjoin me to seek discoveries in the east or west, according to the position in which I might find myself, and advised my nearing the South Pole as much as possible, and as long as the condition of the ships, the health of the crew, and the provisions allowed of my doing so, to be careful in any case to reserve sufficient provisions to reach some known port, where I might refit for my return to England. In addition, I was ordered if I found Circumcision Cape to be an island, or if I did not succeed in finding it, in the first case to take the necessary bearings, and in both to sail southward as long as I still hoped to find the continent, then to proceed eastward to look for this continent, 
and to discover the islands which might be situated in this part of the southern hemisphere. To remain in high latitudes and to prosecute my discoveries, as had been already said, as near the pole as possible, until I had completed the navigation of the world, and finally to repair to the Cape of Good Hope, and from thence to Spithead. Cook left Plymouth Harbor on the 13th of July, and on the 29th of the same month he arrived at Funchal, in Madeira. Here he took in provisions and continued his route southwards, but being shortly convinced that his supply of water would not hold out until he reached the Cape of Good Hope, he determined to break the voyage by putting in at Cape Verde Islands, and on the 10th of August he anchored in Praia Port, which he left four days later. Cook availed himself of his stay in this port, as he usually did, to collect every fact which might be useful to navigators. His description is the more valuable now, as these parts have completely changed in character, and the conditions of a stay in port have been greatly modified by the improvements accomplished there. On the 23rd of the same month, after violent squalls which had driven everyone on deck, Cook, aware of the pernicious effect of the damp of warm climates, and always on the alert to keep his crew in good health, gave orders to aerate, renew the air, in between decks. He even had a fire lighted in order to smoke it and dry it quickly, and not only took the precautions advocated by Lord Sandwich and Sir Hugh Palliser, but also those which the experience of his last voyage suggested to him. Thanks to all these efforts at prevention, there was not a single sick case on board the Resolution when she arrived at the Cape of Good Hope on the 30th of October. Cook, in company with Captain Furneaux and Messrs. Foster, went to pay a visit to the Dutch governor, Baron de Plettenberg, who placed all the resources of the colony at his disposal. There he found the two French ships which had left the island of Mauritius in March, had touched at the Cape before proceeding to the southern seas, where they were to prosecute discoveries under command of Captain Marion. During this stay in port, which was longer than they expected, Forster met the Swedish botanist Sparman, a pupil of Linnaeus, and engaged him to accompany him by promising him large pay. It is difficult to praise Forster's disinterestedness under these circumstances too highly. He had no hesitation in admitting a rival, and even paid his expenses in order to add completeness to the studies in natural history which he wished to make in the countries he was about to visit. Anchor was weighed on the 22nd of November, and the two ships resumed their course southwards in search of Cape Circumcision discovered by Captain Bouvet on the 1st of January, 1739. As the temperature would rapidly become colder, Cook distributed the warm clothes furnished by the Admiralty to his sailors. From the 29th of November till the 6th of December, a frightful tempest prevailed. The ships, driven out of their course, were carried to the east to such a degree that they were forced to resume the search for Circumcision Cape. Another consequence of the bad weather, and of the sudden change from heat to extreme cold, was the death of all the animals embarked at the Cape. And lastly, the sailors suffered so much from the damp that it was necessary to increase the rations of brandy to stimulate them to work. On the 10th of December, in 50 degrees 40 minutes southern latitude, the first ice was met with. Rain and snow succeeded each other uninterruptedly. The fog became so dense that the crews did not perceive a floating iceberg until they were a mile past it. One of these, says the narrative, was not less than 200 feet high, 400 wide, and 2,000 long. Taking it as probable that this piece was of absolutely equal size, its depth beneath the water would have been 1,800 feet, and its height about 2,000 feet, and from the dimensions just given its entire bulk must have contained 1,600 million cubic feet of ice. As they proceeded further south, the icebergs increased. The sea was so rough that the waves climbed these glacial blocks and fell on the other side in fine impalpable dust. 
The scene filled the observers with admiration, but this was soon succeeded by terror upon the reflection that if the vessel struck one of these enormous masses, she must be dashed to pieces. The presence of danger soon, however, produced indifference, and more thought was bestowed upon the sublime beauty than upon the strife with this terrible element. Upon the 14th of December, an enormous iceberg, which closed in the horizon, prevented the two vessels from proceeding southwards, and it became absolutely necessary to skirt it. It did not present an unbroken surface, for hillocks were visible on it, similar to those met on the previous days. Some thought they distinguished land under the ice. Even Cook for the moment was deceived, but as the fog lifted, the mistake was easily rectified. Next day, the vessels were driven before a strong current. The elder Forrester and Wales, the astronomer, embarked in a small boat to ascertain its swiftness. Whilst thus engaged, the fog became so dense that they completely lost sight of the ship. In this miserable boat, without instruments or provisions, in the midst of the wide ocean, far from any coast, surrounded by ice, their situation was dreadful. They left off rowing, lest they should get farther from the ship. They were losing all hope when the sound of a distant bell fell upon their ears. They rowed swiftly in the direction of the sound. The adventure replied to their shouts and picked them up after several hours of terrible suspense. The generally received opinion was that the ice floats collected in the bays or mouths of rivers. The explorers, therefore, imagined themselves near land, which would prove to be situated in the south behind the vast iceberg. They were thirty leagues to the west of it before they found an opening in the ice which might lead to the south. The captain then determined to steer an equal distance to the east. Should he not find land, he at least hoped to double the iceberg and penetrate in advance of it to the pole, and thereby settle the doubts of all the physicists. But although it was the middle of summer in this part of the world, the cold became daily more intense. The sailors complained of it, and symptoms of scurvy appeared on board. Warmer clothes were distributed, and recourse was had to the remedies usual in such cases, malt and lemon juice, which soon overcame the malady, and enabled crews to bear the severity of the temperature. On the 29th of December, Cook ascertained positively that the iceberg was joined to no land. He therefore decided to proceed eastward as far as the parallel of Cape Circumcision, that is, if no obstacle prevented him. He had scarcely put this resolve into execution when the wind became so violent and the sea so rough that navigation in the midst of floating ice which crashed with a fearful noise became most perilous. The danger increased when a field of ice extending beyond the range of vision was seen to the north. There seemed every prospect of the ships being imprisoned for many weeks, hemmed in, to use the expression of whalers, if indeed they did not run the risk of being crushed at once. Cook neither tried to run to the east or west. He steered straight for the south. He was now in the latitude attributed to Cape Circumcision, and seventy leagues south of the position assigned to it. Hence he concluded that if land existed, as stated by Bouvet, which is now known to be a fact, it could only be an inconsiderable island, and not a large continent. The captain had no further reason for remaining in these latitudes. In 67 degrees 15 minutes southern latitude, a new ice barrier running from east to west closed the passage for him, and he could find no opening in it. Prudence enjoined his remaining no longer in this region, for two-thirds of the summer were already past. He therefore determined to seek, with no further delay, the land recently discovered by the French. On the 1st of February, 1773, the vessels were in 48 degrees 30 minutes south latitude and 38 degrees 7 minutes west longitude, very nearly the parallel attributed to St. Maurice Island. After a fruitless cruise, productive of no results, they were forced to conclude that if there really were land in these latitudes, it could only be a small island, otherwise it could not have escaped their search. 
On the 8th of February, the captain found to his dismay that the adventure was no longer sailing with him. He waited in vain for two days, firing at close intervals and keeping great fires upon the deck all night. The resolution had to continue her voyage alone. On the morning of the 17th of February, between 12 and 3 o'clock, the crew witnessed a magnificent spectacle then first seen by European eyes. It was an aurora borealis. The officer of the watch, says the narrative, noticed that from time to time rays left in spiral and circular forms, and that then its brilliancy increased, which gave it an extremely beautiful appearance. It appeared to have no particular bearing, but remained motionless in the heavens, which it filled entirely from time to time by throwing its light to all parts. After another attempt to pass the Arctic Circle, an attempt which the fogs, the rain, the snow, and the ice blocks forced him to relinquish, Cook resumed his course to the north, convinced that he left no large land behind him, and regained New Zealand, which he had agreed upon with the adventure as a rendezvous in the event of separation. On the 25th of March, he cast anchor in Dusky Bay, after 170 consecutive days of sea, in which he had not made less than 3,660 leagues without one sight of land. As soon as he could find suitable anchorage, the captain hastened to avail himself of the resources for feeding his crew, which the country furnished in fowls, fish, and vegetables, whilst he himself, generally with a plumb line in his hand, traversed the environs of the bay. He met only a few natives with whom he had little intercourse, but one family, becoming somewhat familiarized, established itself a hundred yards from the landing place. Cook gave a concert for them, in which the fife and coronet were lavished on them in vain. The New Zealanders awarded the palm to the drum. On the 18th of April, a chief came on board with his daughter. But before entering the ship, he wrapped her sides with a green wand he held in his hand, and addressed an harangue or invocation in modulated accents to the strangers, a very general custom with the islanders of the southern sea. Scarcely was his foot on deck when he offered the captain a bit of cloth and a green talc hatchet, an unprecedented act of generosity for a New Zealander. The chief visited every part of the ship. In order to testify his gratitude to the captain, he plunged his fingers into a bag at his waist, and offered to anoint his hair with the tainted oil it contained. Cook had much difficulty in escaping from this proof of affection, which had not been very pleasing to Byron in the Strait of Magellan, but the painter Hodges was forced to submit to the operation to the amusement of the entire crew. The chief then departed to return no more, taking with him nine hatchets and thirty pairs of carpenter scissors which the officers had given him, Richer than all the New Zealanders put together, he no doubt hastened to stow away his treasures in the fear that someone would deprive him of them. Before leaving, Cook landed five geese, the last of those he had brought from the Cape, thinking that they would multiply in this little inhabited spot, and he had a plot of land cleared in which he planted kitchen garden seeds. Thus he worked at the same time for the natives, and for the future navigators who should find precious resources here. End of section 15。section 16 of celebrated travels and travellers。volume 2。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information。or to volunteer。Please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the 18th Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 4, Part 1, Captain Cook's Second Voyage, 1B. When Cook had completed the hydrographical survey of Dusky Bay, he started for Queen Charlotte Sound, the rendezvous assigned to Captain Furneaux. On the 17th of May, the crew witnessed a magnificent spectacle. Six waterspouts, one of them 60 feet wide at its base, 
were visible a hundred feet from the ship in succession, drawing the clouds and sea into communication by their powerful suction. This phenomenon lasted three quarters of an hour, and the first feeling of fear which it awakened in the breasts of the crew was soon merged into one of admiration, the greater as at this time such marvels were little known. Next day, just as the resolution entered Queen Charlotte's Sound, the adventure was seen, and proved to have been waiting for six weeks. Furno, after reaching Van Diemen's Land on the 1st of March, had coasted it for 17 days, but he was forced to desist before ascertaining whether it was, as he supposed, a part of New Holland. The refutation of this error was reserved for the surgeon Bass. On the 9th of April, after reaching Queen Charlotte's Sound, the captain of the adventure had profited by his leisure to lay out a garden and to open relations with the natives, who had furnished him with irresistible proofs of their cannibalism. Before he continued his voyage of discovery, Cook followed the same line of conduct as at Dusky Bay. He landed a ram and a sheep, a goat and a she-goat, a pig and a sow. He also planted potatoes, which only existed upon the more southerly of the two islands, which formed New Zealand. The natives resembled those of Dusky Bay, but they appeared more thoughtless, ran from room to room during supper, and devoured everything that was offered to them. It was impossible to induce them to taste wine or brandy, but they were very partial to sugar and water. Cook says, they laid hands on all they saw, but they gave up anything so soon as we made them understand by signs that we could not or would not give it to them. They particularly admired glass bottles, which they called Taha, but when the durability and use of iron was explained to them, they preferred it to glassware, ribbons, or white paper. Amongst them were several women, whose lips were covered with little holes painted a bluish black, whilst vivid red formed of chalk and oil covered their cheeks. Like the natives of Dusky Bay, they had small legs and bodies, but thick knees, which proves that they take little exercise and sit cross-legged. The almost perpetual squatting in their pirogues no doubt also adds to these peculiarities. The color of their skin is clear brown, their hair is very black, their faces are round, their nose and lips are somewhat thick but not flat, their eyes are black and bright enough and tolerably expressive. Placed in a row, the natives took off their outer garments and one of them sang a rough sort of song, the others accompanying him with gestures. They stretched out their hands and alternately struck their feet against the ground with frantic contortions. The last words they repeated in chorus, and we easily distinguished a sort of meter, but I am not sure that there was any rhyme. The music was wild and monotonous. Some of the New Zealanders begged for news of Tupia, and when they heard of his death, they expressed their grief by a kind of lamentation, plainly artificial. Cook did not recognize a single native whom he had met on his first voyage. He naturally concluded that the natives, who in 1770 inhabited the Sound, had been chased out or had gone elsewhere of their free will. The number of inhabitants, too, was reduced by a third. The Pa was deserted, as well as a number of cabins along the coast. The two ships being ready to return to sea, Cook gave instructions to Captain Furno. He wished to advance southward between 41 degrees to 46 degrees south latitude, up to 140 degrees west longitude, and if he found no land, to steer towards Tahiti, which was appointed as the place of rendezvous. He then proposed to return to New Zealand and survey all the unknown parts of the sea between that island and Cape Horn. Towards the end of July, after a few days' hot weather, scurvy again broke out on board the adventure, the resolution escaped the scourge, owing to the precautions from which Cook had never departed for a single day, and the example which he himself set of constantly eating celery and scurvy grass. On the 1st of July, 
the two vessels were in south latitude twenty five degrees one minute and one hundred and thirty four degrees six minutes was longitude the situation which carteret attributed to pitcairn island cook endeavored to find it but to his great regret the illness on board the adventure shortened his cruise he was anxious to verify or rectify the longitude of this island and by so doing that of all the surrounding lands discovered by Carteret, which had not been confirmed by astronomical observations. But having no longer any hope of finding an Antarctic continent, he sent sail for the northwest, and soon reconnoitred several of the islands seen by Bougainville. The outlying islands with which the Pacific Ocean abounds between the tropics, he says, are on a level with the waves in the low parts, and raised only a rood or two above them in the others. Their shape is often circular. In the center they contain a basin of sea water, and the depth of water all around is not to be sounded. They produce little. Coconuts appear to be the best of their productions, yet in spite of this sterility and of their small extent, most of them are inhabited. It is not easy to conceive how these little settlements were peopled, and it is not less difficult to determine from whence the highest islands of the southern sea drew their inhabitants. On the 15th of April, Cook reconnoitred Osnaburg, or Myria Islands, discovered by Wallace, and set off for Otaitipia, where he intended to embark as many provisions as possible before reaching Matavai. At daybreak, says Forster, we rejoiced in one of those beautiful mornings which poets of every country have tried to paint. A light breeze brought a delicious perfume from the land and ruffled the surface of the water. The forest-capped mountains elevated their majestic heads, over which the rising sun shed its beams. Close to us we saw a ridge of hills, of gentler ascent, but wooded like the first and pleasantly intermixed with green and brown tints. Below a plain adorned with breadfruit trees and a quantity of palms in the background, overshadowing the delightful groves. All seemed still asleep. Dawn was just breaking, and the country was wrapped in peaceful darkness. Yet we could perceive the houses amid the trees and the pirogues on the shore. Half a mile from the beach the waves broke over a reach of rocks level with the sea, and nothing could equal the tranquillity of the interior flow of the harbor. The day star shed its luster on the plain. The natives rose and by degrees added life to this charming scene. At the sight of our vessels, several launched their pirogues in haste and paddled toward us, as we were happily watching them. We little thought that we were going to run into great danger, and that destruction would soon threaten the vessels and their crews on this fortunate coast. Skillful the writer, happy the painter, who knew how to find such fresh and varied colors. This enchanting picture is conveyed in a few words. One regrets not having accompanied this bold sailor, the scientist who so well understood Dame Nature. Unfortunately, we could not visit these innocent and peaceful inhabitants in that age of gold to which our own century offers a painful comparison. The vessels were half a league from a reef, when the wind fell. In spite of every effort, the ships were driven upon the rocks, in the very sight of the much-coveted land, when a clever maneuver of the captains, ably seconded by the tide and the land breeze, came to their rescue. They had, however, received some injuries, and the adventure lost three anchors. The ships were surrounded by a crowd of pirogues, and every variety of fruit was exchanged for glass beads. Still the natives offered neither fowls nor pigs. Those that were seen near the cabins belonged to the king, and they had no right to sell them. Several of the Tahitans begged for news of Banks and the companions of Cook's earlier voyage. Some also inquired for news of Tupia, but they spoke no more of him when they had learned the circumstances of his death. Next day the two vessels anchored in the roadstead of Otaitipia, two cable links from the shore, and were besieged by visitors and traffickers. Some profited by the crush to throw the merchandise they had already sold into their canoes, that they might sell it over again. To put a stop to this trick, 
Cook drove the perpetrators away after having flogged them, a punishment which they accepted without complaining. In the afternoon, the two captains landed to examine the watering place, which they found very convenient. During their absence, a crowd of natives came on board and amply confirmed the unenviable reputation they had acquired in the early records of Bougainville and Cook. One of the officers, standing on the quarter-deck, says the narrative, desiring to give a child six years old in one of the pirogues some glass beads, let them fall into the sea. The child at once jumped into the water and dived until he recovered them. To reward his skill, he threw other trifles to him, a generosity which tempted a crowd of men and women who amused us by their surprising agility in the waves, their easy attitudes in the water, and the suppleness of their limbs made them like amphibious animals. But the Tahitans, who came on board, were detected in several acts of theft. One of them, who remained for the greater part of the day in Cook's bedroom, hastened to jump into the sea, and the captain, enraged by his conduct, had shots fired over his head. A boat sent to take the pirogues of the robbers was assailed with stones until it reached the shore, and it was only after a discharge of shot that the assailants determined to retreat. These hostilities led to no result. The natives came on board as if nothing had occurred. Cook learned from them that the greater part of his old friends from the neighborhood of Matavai had fallen in a battle between the inhabitants of the two peninsulas. The officers made many excursions on land. Forster, animated by an ardor for botanical research, missed none of them. In one of these he witnessed the method employed by the Tahitans in preparing their stuffs. We had gone but a few paces, he says, when a noise from the forest struck upon our ears. Following the sounds, we reached a little tent where five or six women sitting upon either side of a large square piece of wood were thrashing the fibrous bark of mulberry trees to fabricate their stuffs. For this purpose they used a bit of square wood with long parallel grooves more or less hollowed according to the different sides. They paused a moment to enable us to examine the bark, the hammer, and the beam which served them for a table. They also showed us a kind of gum water in a large coconut which they used from time to time to join the various bits of bark together. This glue, which appears to us to be obtained from the hibiscus esculentus, is absolutely needful in the fabrication of the stuff, which being occasionally two or three yards wide and fifty long, are composed of small pieces of the bark. The women employed at this work wore very old and ragged clothes, and their hands were hard and knotted. The same day Forrester saw a man with very long nails, of which he was immensely proud, as proving that he was not obliged to work for his bread. In Annam, in China, and other countries, this singular and ridiculous fashion is common. A single finger is kept with a shorter nail, being the one used to scratch with, a very frequent occupation in the extreme east. In another of his walks, Forster saw a native who passed his days in being fed by his wives, quietly lying on a carpet of thick shrubs. This melancholy person, who fattened without rendering any service to society, recalled Sir John Mandeville's anger at seeing, quote, such a glutton who passed his days without distinguishing himself by any feats of arms, and who lived in pleasure as a pig which one fattens in a sty, end quote. On the 22nd of August, Cook, having learned that King Wahitua was in the neighborhood, and being desirous of seeing him, landed with Captain Furneaux, the Foresters, and several natives. He met him advancing towards him with a numerous suite, and recognized him at once as he had seen him several times in 1769. This king was then a child, and was called Te Are, but he had changed his name at the death of his father, Wahitua. He made the captain sit down on his stool, and inquired solicitously for the various Englishmen he had known on the former voyage. Cook, after the usual compliments, presented him with a shirt, a hatchet, 
some nails, and other trifles. But of all his presents, that which appeared most precious to him, and which excited the most cries of admiration from his followers, was a tuft of red feathers mounted upon iron wire. Wahitua, king of little Tahiti, was about seventeen or eighteen years of age. Tall and well made, his appearance would have been majestic but for a look of fear and distrust. He was surrounded by several chiefs and noble personages, remarkable for their height, and one of whom, tattooed in a peculiar manner, was enormously stout. The king, who showed him great deference, consulted him every moment. Cook then learned that a Spanish vessel had put into Tahiti a few months previously, and he afterwards ascertained it was that of Domingo Buenichea, which came from Callao. Whilst Ite, the king's confidant, conversed with some offers upon religious subjects, and asked the English if they had a god, Wahitua amused himself with the captain's watch, astonished at the noise it made, and venting his surprise in the words, It speaks! He inquired of what use it was. It was explained to him that it told the time, and in that respect resembled the sun. Wahitua gave it the name of the little sun, to show that he understood the explanation. The vessel sailed on the morning of the 24th, and were followed for a long time by numbers of pirogues bearing coconuts and fruit. Rather than lose this opportunity of obtaining European commodities, the natives parted with their wares very cheaply. A dozen coconuts could be obtained for one glass bead. The abundant fresh provisions soon restored the health of all on board the vessels, and most of the sailors, who on reaching Osnaburg could scarcely walk, could get about well when they left. The resolution and adventure reached Matavai Bay on the 26th. A crowd of Tahitians soon invaded the deck. Most of them were known to the captain and Lieutenant Pickersgill, who had accompanied Wallace in 1767, and Cook, two years later, received a warm welcome from them. Cook had tents erected for the sick, the sailmenders, and the coopers, and then left with Captain Furno and the two foresters for Oparie. The boat which took them soon passed a marae of stones, and a cemetery known as the marae of Tutaha. When Cook called it by this name, one of the natives who accompanied him interrupted him by saying that since Tutaha's death it was called Otu. A fine lesson for princes, who thus in their lives are reminded that they are mortal, and that after their death the earth which contains their corpse will not be their own. The chief and his wife removed the upper garments from their shoulders as they passed, a mark of respect which natives of all ranks exhibit before a marae, as they appear to attach a particular idea of sanctity to these places. Cook soon gained admittance to the presence of King Otu. After many compliments, he offered him all that he thought he had which would please him, because he appreciated the advantage this man's friendship would be to him for his every word showed timidity of disposition. Tall and well made, the king was about thirty years old. He inquired after Tupia and Cook's companions, although he had seen none of them. Many presents were distributed to those of his cortege, who appeared the most influential. The women sent their servants to find large pieces of their finest stuffs, tinted scarlet, rose, and straw color, and perfumed with the most odiferous oil. They placed them over our outer clothing, and so loaded us that we could scarcely move. Otu paid the captain a visit on the morrow. He only came on board after Cook had been enveloped in a considerable quantity of the most costly native stuff, and he dare not go below until his brother had first done so. The king and his suite were seated for breakfast, at which the natives went into ecstasies over the usefulness of chairs. Otu would not taste anything, but his companions were far from following his example. He greatly admired a beautiful spaniel belonging to Forster, and expressed a wish to possess it. It was at once given to him, and he had it carried behind him by one of his lords-in-waiting. After breakfast, the captain himself conducted Otu to his sloop, and Captain Furno gave him a pair of goats. Upon an excursion to the interior, Mr. Pickersgill met the aged Oberea 
who appeared to have lost all her honors, and she was so poor that it was impossible for her to give a present to her friends. When Cook left on the 1st of September, a young Tahitian named Poreo begged to accompany him. The captain consented, hoping that he might prove useful. The moment he lost sight of land, poor Poreo could not restrain his tears. The officers comforted him by promising to be like fathers to him. End of section 16「Section 17 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Rose. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part Chapter 4, Part 1. Captain Cook's Second Voyage, 1C. Cook directed his course to Huahin Island, which was only 25 leagues distant, and anchored there at 3 in the morning. The natives brought quantities of large fowls, which were the more acceptable, as it had been impossible to obtain any at Tahiti. Pigs, dogs, and fruit were in the market, and were exchanged for hatchets, nails, and glassware. This island, like Tahiti, showed traces of earlier volcanic eruptions, and the summit of one of its hills that resembled a crater. The appearance of the country is similar to that of Tahiti, but is on a smaller scale, for Huahin is only seven or eight leagues in circumference. Cook went to see his old friend Orea. The king, dispensing with all ceremony, threw himself on the captain's neck and shed tears of joy. Then he presented him to his friends, to whom the captain gave presents. The king offered Cook all his most precious possessions, for he looked upon this man as a father. Orea promised to supply the English with all they needed, and most loyally kept his word. However, on the morning of the 6th, the sailors who presided over the traffic were insulted by a native covered with red, in war dress and holding a club, who threatened everyone. Cook, landing at this moment, threw himself on the native, struggled with him, and finally possessed himself of the weapon which he broke. The same day another incident occurred. Sparman had imprudently penetrated to the interior of the island to make botanical researches. Some natives, taking advantage of the moment when he was examining a plant, snatched a dagger, which was the only weapon he carried, from his belt, gave him a blow on the head, and rushing upon him tore some of his clothes. Sparman, however, managed to rise and run toward the shore, but, hampered by the bushes and briars, he was captured by the natives, who cut his hands to possess themselves of his shirt, the sleeves of which were buttoned, until he tore the wristbands with his teeth. Others of the natives, seeing him naked and half dead, gave him their clothes, and conducted him to the marketplace, where there was a crowd assembled. When Sparman appeared in this plight, they all took flight without waiting to be told. Cook at first thought they intended to commit a theft. Undeceived by the appearance of the naturalist, he recalled the other natives, assured them that he would not revenge it upon the innocent, and carried his complaint straight to Aurea. The latter, miserable and furious at what had occurred, loaded his people with vehement reproaches, and promised to do all in his power to find out the robbers and the stolen things. In spite of the prayers of the natives, the king embarked in the captain's vessel, and entered upon a search for the culprits with him. The latter had removed their clothes, and for a while it was impossible to recognize them. Aurea, therefore, accompanied Cook on board, dined with him, and on his return to land was received by his people, who had not expected his return, with lively expressions of joy. One of the most agreeable reflections suggested by this voyage, says Forrester, is that instead of finding the inhabitants of this island plunged in voluptuousness, as had been falsely affirmed by earlier navigators, we remark the most humane and delicate sentiments among them. There are vicious characters in every society, but we could count fifty more sinners in England or any other civilized country than in these islands. 
As the vessels were putting off, Aurea came to announce that the robbers were taken, and to invite Cook to land and assist in their punishment. It was impossible. The king accompanied Cook half a league on his way, and left him with friendly farewells. This stay in port had been very productive. The two vessels brought away more than three hundred pigs, and quantities of fowl and fruits. Probably they would not have procured much more, even had their stay been prolonged. Captain Furneaux had agreed to take a young man named Omai on board. His conduct and intelligence gave a favorable idea of the inhabitants of the Society Islands. Upon his arrival in England, this Tahitian was presented to the king by Earl Sandwich, First Lord of the Admiralty. At the same time he found protectors and friends in Banks and Solander. They arranged a friendly reception for him among the first families of Great Britain. He lived two years in this country, and upon Cook's third voyage he accompanied him and returned to his native land. The captain afterwards visited Ulitea, where the natives gave him the most appreciative welcome. They inquired with interest about Tupia and the English they had seen in the endeavor. King Oreo hastened to renew his acquaintance with the captain, and gave him all the provisions his island produced. During their stay, Poreo, who had embarked in the resolution, landed with a young Tahitan girl, who had enchanted him, and would not return on board. He was replaced by a young man of seventeen or eighteen years of age, a native of Bola Bola, named Oedidi, who announced his wish to go to England. The grief evinced by this native on leaving his native land spoke well for his good heart. The vessels, laden with more than four hundred pigs, and also with fowls and fruit, left the Society Islands on the 17th of September and steered for the west. Six days later, one of the Harvey Islands was sighted, and on the 1st of October, anchor was cast off Eoa, called Middleburg Island by Tasman and Cook. The welcome by the natives was cordial. A chief named Tai Wan came on board, touched the captain's nose with a pinch of pepper, and sat down without speaking. The alliance was concluded and ratified by the gift of a few trifles. Tai Wan guided the English into the interior. The newcomers were surrounded by a dense crowd of natives, offering stuffs and mats in exchange for nails as long as the walk lasted. The natives often even carried their liberality so far as to decline any return for these presents. Tai Wan conducted his new friends to his dwelling, agreeably situated in a beautiful valley in the shade of some sad hex. He served them with a liquor extracted from the juice of the ayaba, the use of which is common to the Polynesian islanders. It was prepared in the following manner. Pieces of a root, a species of pepper, were first chewed and then placed in a large wooden vase over which water was poured. As soon as this liquor was drinkable, the natives poured it out into cups made of green leaves, shaped into form, and holding about half a pint. Cook was the only one who tasted it. The method of preparing the liquor had quenched the thirst of his companion, but the natives were not fastidious, and the vase was soon emptied. The English afterwards visited several plantations or gardens separated by intertwined hedges, which were connected by doors formed of planks, and hung upon hinges. The perfection of culture and the fully developed instinct of property showed a degree of civilization superior to that of Tahiti. In spite of the reception he met with, Cook, who could procure neither pigs nor fowls, left this island to reach that of Amsterdam, called Tonga Tabo by the natives. Here he hoped to find the provisions he needed. The vessel soon anchored in the roadstead of Van Diemen, in eighteen fathoms of water, a cable's length from the breakers which border the shore. The natives were friendly and brought stuffs, mats, implements, arms, ornaments, and soon afterwards pigs and fowls. Oedidi bought some red feathers of them with much delight, declaring they would have a high value at Tahiti. Cook landed with a native named Atago, who had attached himself to him at once, during his excursion, he remarked a temple similar to a marae, 
which was called by the generic name of Phytoka. Raised upon an artificial butt, 16 or 18 feet from the ground, the temple was in an oblong form and was reached by two stone staircases. Built like the homes of the natives, with posts and joists, it was covered with palm leaves. Two wooden images, coarsely carved two feet in length, occupied the corners. As I did not wish to offend either them or their gods, says the captain, I dared not touch them, but I inquired of Otago if these were a tuas or gods. I do not know if he understood me, but he instantly handled them and turned them over as roughly as if he had merely touched a bit of wood, which convinced me that they did not represent a divine being. A few thefts were perpetrated, but they did not interrupt cordiality, and a quantity of provisions were procured. Before leaving, the captain had an interview with a person who was treated with extraordinary respect to whom all the natives accorded the rank of king. Cook says, I found him seated with a gravity of deportment so stupid and so dull that in spite of all they had told me, I took him for an idiot whom the people adored from superstitious motives. I saluted him and talked to him, but he made no reply and paid no attention to me. I was about to leave him when a native made me understand that it was without doubt the king. I offered him a shirt, a hatchet, a piece of red stuff, a looking-glass, some nails, metals, and glassware. He received them, or rather allowed them to be placed upon his person or beside him, losing nothing of his gravity, and speaking no word, not even moving his head to the right or left. However, next day this chief sent baskets of bananas and a roast pig, saying that it was a present from the Ariki of the island to the Ariki of the ship. Cook called this archipelago the Friendly Islands. They had formerly received various names from Shuton and Tasman as Coconut Islands, Traitor Islands, Hope Islands, and Horn Islands. Cook, not having been able to obtain fresh water, was obliged to leave Tonga sooner than he wished. He found time, however, to make a few observations as to the productions of the country and the manners of the natives. We will mention the most striking. Nature had showered its treasures with a liberal hand upon Tonga and the Oa Islands. Cocoa nuts, palm trees, breadfruit trees, yams, and sugar canes are most plentiful there. As for edible animals, pigs and fowls alone were met with, but dogs, if not existing there, are known by name. The most delicate fish abounds on the coast. Of much the same form as Europeans, and equally white, the inhabitants of these islands are well proportioned and of pleasant features. Their hair is originally black, but they are in the habit of tinting it with powder, so that white, red, and blue hair abounds, which produces a singular effect. Tattooing is a universal practice. Their clothes are very simple, consisting of one piece of stuff rolled around the waist and falling to the knees. The women, who at Tonga, as everywhere else, are more coquettish than men, make aprons of coconut fibers, which they ornament with shells and bits of colored stuffs and feathers. The natives had some singular customs, which the English had not noticed before. Thus they put everything that is given them on their heads, and conclude a bargain with this practice. When a friend or relation dies, they slash their limbs, and even some of their fingers. Their dwellings are not collected in villages, but are separate and dispersed among the plantations. Built in the same style as those of the Society Islands, they differ from them only in being raised higher above the ground. The adventure and resolution sailed on the 7th of October, and the following day reconnoitred Pilestart Island, discovered by Tasman. On the 21st, anchor was cast in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. Cook landed a certain number of animals, which he wished to acclimatize, and set sail again to enter Queen Charlotte's Sound, but being caught in a great gale, he was separated from the adventure, and did not meet her again until he reached England. On the 5th of November, the captain repaired the damages of his vessel, and before undertaking a new voyage in the southern seas, 
he wished to ascertain the extent and quality of his provisions. He reckoned that 4,500 pounds of biscuits had been entirely spoiled, and that more than 3,000 pounds were in scarcely better condition. During his stay here, he obtained a new and still more convincing proof of the cannibalism of the natives of New Zealand. An officer had brought the head of a young man, who had been killed and eaten, and some natives seeing it wished very much for a piece. Cook gave it to them, and the avidity with which they threw themselves upon this revolting food proved the pleasure that these cannibals took in eating food which they have difficulty in procuring. The resolution left New Zealand on the 26th of November, and entered the glacial regions which she had already traversed. But the circumstances attending her second voyage were distressing. The crew, though in good health, were overcome by fatigue and less capable of resisting illness, the more so that they had no fresh food on board. The resolution had lost her consort, and the world was convinced that no Antarctic continent existed. It was, so to say, a platonic voyage. It was necessary to prove beyond the possibility of doubt that no new land of any importance was to be discovered in these latitudes. The first ice was encountered on the 12th of December, and farther to the south than in the preceding year. From this date, the usual incidents of navigation in these latitudes were repeated day by day. Oididi was quite astonished by the white rain, as he called the snow which fell on his hand, but the sight of the first ice was still a greater marvel to him. He called it white earth. His mind had been struck by a phenomenon in the torrid zone, says the narrative. As long as the ships remained in these latitudes, we had scarcely any night, and he had seen that we could write at midnight by the light of the sun. Oyidi could scarcely believe his eyes, and he assured us that his fellow countrymen would put him down as a liar if he talked to them of petrified rain and a perpetual day. The young Tahitan had time to become accustomed to this phenomenon, for the ship advanced as far as 76 degrees south amidst floating ice. Then, convinced that if a continent existed, the ice made access to it impossible, Cook determined to proceed to the north. General dissatisfaction prevailed. No one on board was free from severe colds or from an attack of scurvy. The captain himself was seriously affected by bilious sickness, which kept him in bed. For eight days his life was in danger, and his recovery was likely to be equally painful and slow. The same route was followed until the 11th of March, when with the rising of the sun the joyful cry of land, land, arose. It was the Easter Island of Rojewine's Davis Land. Upon nearing it, the navigators were struck with astonishment, as the Dutch had been, by the enormous statues erected on the shore. Cook says that the latitude of Easter Island answers very closely to that marked in Rojewine's manuscript journal, and its longitude is only one degree wrong. The shore, composed of black broken rock of ferruginous appearance, shows traces of violent subterranean eruption. A few scattered plantations were perceived in the center of the island. Singular coincidence! The first word spoken by the natives as the strangers approached the shore was to ask in the Tahitan tongue for a rope. This again suggested that the origin of both races was the same. Like the Tahitans, they were tattooed and clothed in stuff similar to those of the Society Islands. The action of the sun on their heads, says the narrative, has forced them to find different means for protecting themselves. The greater number of men wear a circular head covering about two inches thick, twisted with grass from one side to the other, and covered with a great quantity of those long black feathers which adorn the frigate bird. Others have enormous hats of brown gull's feathers, almost as large as the wigs of European lawyers, and many have a simple wooden hoop surrounded with white gull's feathers, which wave in the air. The women wear large and wide hats of neat plates, which come to a point in front, with a ridge along the top, and two great lobes on either side. 
The country was a picture of desolation. It was surveyed by two detachments and was found to be covered with black and porous stones. The entire vegetation which could thrive in this mass of lava consisted of two or three kinds of rugose grass which grew on the rocks, scanty bushes, especially the paper mulberry, the hibiscus, and the mimosa, and some plantains. Close to the landing place is a perpendicular wall, constructed of square stones, compactly and durably joined in accordance with art rules, and fitting in a style of durability. Further on, in the center of a well-paved area, a monolith is erected representing a half-naked human figure, some twenty feet high, and more than five wide, very roughly hewn. The head is badly designed, the eyes, nose, and mouth scarcely indicated, but the ears are very long, as is the fashion in this country, and are better finished than the rest. In the earlier editions of the French translation of Cook's Voyages, Paris, 1878, seven quarto volumes, the height of this statue is given as two feet, evidently by a typographical error. We now correct this mistake, which has been repeated in all subsequent editions. These monuments, which are numerous, do not appear to have been erected or hewn by the race the English found, or this race had degenerated, for these natives paid no respect to the statues, although they treated them with a certain veneration and objected to anyone's walking on the pavement near them. It was not only the seashore that these enormous sentinels were seen. Between the mountains and the fissures of rocks, others existed, some erect or fallen to earth through some convulsion, others still imperfectly separated from the block from which they were being cut. What sudden catastrophe stopped the works? What do these monoliths represent? To what distant period do these testimonies of the industry of a race long disappeared, or the recollection of whom has perished, seem to point? This problem must remain forever insoluble. Traffic proceeded easily. It was only necessary to repress the marvelous dexterity of the natives in emptying pockets. The few possessions which had been obtained had been very useful though the want of drinkable water prevented Cook remaining long in Easter Island. He directed his course to the archipelago of the Marquesas of Madonna, which had not been visited since 1595, but his vessel had no sooner been put to sea than he was again attacked by the bilious fever, from which he had suffered so severely. The sufferers from scurvy relapsed, and all who had undertaken long walks across Easter Island had their faces burnt by the sun. On the 7th of April, 1774, Cook sighted the Marquesas group, after seeking them in vain for five consecutive days in the different positions assigned to them by geographers. Anchor was cast at Tauwati, the Santa Cristina of Madonna. The resolution was soon surrounded by pirogues, the foremost of which was full of stones, every man on board having a sling around his hand. However, friendly relations were formed, followed by barter. These natives, says Forrester, are well made, with handsome faces, yellowish or tan complexions, and marks all over their bodies, which gives them an almost black appearance. The valleys of our harbor were filled with trees, and tallied in every particular with the description given by the Spaniards. We saw fire across the forest several times, very far from the shore, and concluded that the country was well populated. The difficulty of procuring food decided Cook upon a hasty departure, but he had time to collect some interesting facts about the people, whom he considered the handsomest in Oceana. These natives appear to surpass all others in the regularity of their features. The resemblance in their speech, however, to that of the Tahitans, appears to point to a common origin. The Marquesas are five in number, Magdalena, San Pedro, Dominica, Santa Cristina, and Hood Island, the latter so called after the volunteer who first discovered it. Santa Cristina is divided by a chain of mountains of considerable elevation, to which the hills that rise from the sea lead. 
deep, narrow, and fertile valleys, filled with fruit trees and watered by streams of excellent water, intersect this mountain isle. Port Madre de Dios, called by Cook Resolution Harbor, is about the center of the eastern coast of Santa Cristina. It contains two sandy creeks into which two streams flow. End of section 17. Recording by Bob Rose. Section 18 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Rose. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 4, Part 2. Captain Cook's Second Voyage, 2A. A Fresh Visit to Tahiti and the Friendly Islands. Exploration of New Hebrides. Discovery of New Caledonia and Pine Island. Stay in Queen Charlotte's Sound, South Georgia. Accident to the Adventure. After leaving these islands on the 12th of April and sailing for Tahiti, Cook fell in five days later with the Pomantu Archipelago. He landed on the Teoyukea Island of Byron. The inhabitants who had cause to complain of earlier navigators received the advances of the English coldly. The latter could only obtain about two dozen coconuts and five pigs, which appeared plentiful in this island. In another settlement, a more friendly reception was met with. The natives embraced the newcomers and rubbed their noses in the same fashion as the New Zealanders. Oedidi bought several dogs, the long and white hair of whose skins serves as an ornament for caresses in his native land. Forster relates, The natives told us that they broke up scurvy grass, mixed it with shellfish, and threw it into the sea on the approach of a shoal of fish. This bait intoxicated the fish for a time, and when they came to the surface it was easy to take them. The captain afterwards saw several other islands of this immense archipelago, which were similar to those he had left, especially the pernicious islands, where Rajawine had lost his sloop, the African, and to which Cook gave the name of Polisair Islands. He then steered for Tahiti, which the sailors, certain of the good will of the natives, regarded as a home. The resolution cast anchor in Matavai Bay on the 22nd of April, and their reception was as friendly as had been anticipated. A few days later, King Otu and several other chiefs visited the English and brought them a present of ten or a dozen large pigs and some fruit. Cook's first idea was to remain in this spot only just long enough for Mr. Wales, the astronomer, to take observations, but the abundance of provisions induced him to prolong his stay. On the morning of the 26th, the captain, who had been to Opare with some of his officers to make a formal visit to the king, observed a fleet of more than 300 pirogues drawn up in order on the shore. They were all completely equipped. At the same time, a number of warriors assembled on the beach. The officers' suspicions were excited by this formidable armament, collected in one night, but they were reassured by the welcome they received. This fleet consisted of no less than sixty large double pirogues, decorated with flags and streamers, and a hundred and seventy smaller ones, intended for the transport of provisions, and the flotilla was manned with no fewer than 7,760 men, warriors, or paddlers. The sight of this fleet, says Forrester, increased our ideas of the power and wealth of the island. The entire crew was astonished. When we reflect upon the implements possessed by this people, we can but admire the patience and toil necessary to cut down these enormous trees, separate and polish the branches, and then to carry the heavy constructions to such perfection. 
These works are produced by them by means of a stone hatchet and saw, a piece of coral, and the hide of whales. The chiefs, and all who occupied a prominent fighting rank, were dressed in military style, that is to say, in a quantity of stuffs, turbans, helmets, and breastplates. The height of some of the helmets was most embarrassing to the wearers. The entire equipment appeared more appropriate for scenic effect than suitable for a battlefield. But, in any case, it added to the grandeur of the display, and the warriors did not fail to show themselves with a view to the most striking effect. Upon reaching Matavai, Cook learned that this formidable armament was destined for attack upon Emio, whose chief had revolted against the Tahitan yoke and become independent. During the following days, the captain was visited by some of his old friends. All showed a desire to possess red feathers, which were of considerable value. One only attached more importance to a glass bead or a nail. The Tahitans were so impressed that they offered in exchange the strange mourning garments, which they had refused to sell during Cook's first voyage. These garments are made of the rarest productions of the islands and the surrounding sea, and are worked with care and great skill, and no doubt are of great value to themselves. We bought no less than ten, which we brought to England. Oedidi, who had taken good care to procure some feathers for himself, could indulge in any caprice he liked. The natives looked upon him as a prodigy, and listened eagerly to his tales. The principal personages of the island, and even the king, sought his society. He married a daughter of the chief of Matavai, and brought his wife on board. Everyone was delighted to make him a present. Finally, he decided to remain at Tahiti, where he had found his sister married to a powerful chief. In spite of the thefts, which more than once caused unpleasantness, the English procured more provisions on their stay in this port than ever before. The aged Oberia, who was like a queen in the islands during the stay made by the Dauphin in 1767, herself brought pigs and fruits in the secret hope of obtaining red feathers, which had so great a success. Presents were liberally given, and the Indians were amused with fireworks and military maneuvers. Just before he left, the captain witnessed a curious naval review. O2 ordered a sham fight, but it lasted so short a time that it was impossible to observe the movements. The fleet was to commence hostilities five days after Cook's departure, and he would have much liked to have waited for it, but, fearing the natives might suspect him of an attempt to overcome both conquered and victors, he determined to leave. The resolution had scarcely left the bay when one of the gunners, seduced by the delights of Tahiti, and possibly by the promises of King Otu, who no doubt thought a European might be of use to him, threw himself into the sea, but he was soon retaken by a boat launched by Cook in his pursuit. Cook very much regretted the fact that discipline obliged him to act in this way. The man had no relations or friends in England, and, had he requested permission to remain in Tahiti, it would not have been refused. On the 15th, the resolution anchored in Owera Harbor, in Huahin Island. The old chief Orea was one of the first to congratulate the English upon their return, and to bring them presents. The captain presented him with red feathers, but the old chief appeared to prefer iron, hatchets, and nails. He seemed more indolent than upon the previous visit. His head was weaker, no doubt owing to his immoderate love for an intoxicating drink extracted from pepper by the natives. His authority was evidently despised, and Cook sent in pursuit of a band of robbers who had not refrained from pillaging the old king himself and who had taken refuge in the center of the island. Aurea showed himself grateful for the consideration the English had always shown him. He was the last to leave the vessel before she sailed, on the 24th of April, and when Cook said that they should never meet again, he shed tears and replied, Send your children here, we will treat them well. On another occasion, Aurea asked the captain where he should be buried. 
at stepney said cook Orea begged him to repeat the word until he could pronounce it then a hundred voices cried at once stepney morai no toot stepney the grave of cook in giving this reply the great navigator had no prevision of his fate or of the difficulty his fellow countrymen would have in finding his remains oididi who at the last moment had accompanied the english to huahine had not met with so cordial a welcome as at tahiti his riches had strangely diminished and his credit suffered in consequence the narrative says he soon proved the truth of the proverb that a man is never a prophet in his own country he left us with regrets which proved his esteem for us and when the moment of separation arrived he ran from cabin to cabin embracing every one it is impossible to describe the mental anguish of the young man when he left he gazed at the vessel burst into tears and crouching in despair in the bottom of his pirogue we saw him again stretching out his arms to us as we left the reef cook reconnoitred hove island so called by wallace on the sixth of june it is named mohipa by the natives a few days later he found several uninhabited islets surrounded by a chain of breakers to which he gave the name palmerston in honor of one of the lords of the admiralty upon the twentieth a steep and rocky island was discovered crowned with large woods and bushes the beach was narrow and sandy and several natives of very dark complexion were seen upon it they made menacing demonstrations and were armed with lances and clubs as soon as the english landed they retired champions however advanced and endeavored to provoke the strangers assailing them with a storm of arrows and stones sparman was wounded in the arm and cook just escaped being struck by a javelin a general volley soon dispersed these inhospitable islanders and the uncivil reception which was thus accorded well deserved the name bestowed upon their land of savage island four days later cook reached the tonga archipelago once more he stopped this time at namuka called rotterdam by tasman he had scarcely cast anchor before the ship was surrounded by a crowd of pirogues filled with bananas and every kind of fruit which were exchanged for nails and old pieces of stuff this friendly reception encouraged the naturalists to land and penetrate to the interior in search of new plants and unknown productions upon their return they enlarged upon the beauty of this picturesque and romantic country and upon the affability and cordiality of the natives in spite of it however various thefts continued to take place until a more important larceny than usual obliged the captain to resort to severity a native who opposed the seizure of two pirogues by the english as hostages until the stolen arms were restored was wounded severely by a gunshot during this second visit cook bestowed the name of friendly islands upon this group no doubt with a sarcastic meaning nowadays they are better known by the native name of tonga the indefatigable navigator continued his route in a westward direction passed in succession le Pru, aurora with sunday and malicolo islands to which archipelago bougainville had given the name of the grand cyclades cook gave his usual order to enter into friendly and commercial relations with the inhabitants the first day passed quietly and the natives celebrated the visit of the english by games and dancing but on the morrow an incident occurred which led to a general collision a native who was refused access to the ship prepared to launch an arrow at one of the sailors his fellow countrymen at first prevented him at the same moment cook appeared on deck his gun in his hand his first step was to shout to the native who again aimed at the sailor without replying the native was about to let his arrow fly at him when a shot anticipated and wounded him this was the signal for a general discharge of arrows which struck on the vessel 
and did but little damage. Cook then ordered a gun to be fired over the natives' heads with a view to dispersing them. A few hours later, the natives again surrounded the ship and returned to their barter as if nothing had happened. Cook took advantage of these friendly indications to land an armed detachment for wood and water. Four or five natives were collected on the beach. A chief, leaving the group, advanced to the captain, holding in his hand, as Cook also did, a green bough. The two branches were exchanged, and peace thus concluded. A few slight presents helped to cement it. Cook then obtained permission to take wood, but not to go far from the shore, and the naturalists who were anxious to prosecute their investigations in the interior were brought back to the beach in spite of their protestations. Iron implements had no value for these people. This made it extremely difficult to obtain provisions. Only a few agreed to exchange arms for stuffs and exhibited an honesty in their transactions to which the English were unaccustomed. The exchanges continued after the resolution had set sail, and the natives hurried in their pirogues to deliver the articles for which they had received the price. One of them, after vigorous efforts, succeeded in gaining the vessels, carrying his weapons to a sailor who had paid for them and forgotten it. It was so long ago. The native refused the recompense the sailor would have given, making him understand that he had been paid already. Cook gave the name of Port Sandwich to this harbor of refuge, which he left on the morning of the 23rd of July. He was most favorably impressed by the moral qualities of the natives of Malikolo, but by no means in regard to their physical powers. Small and badly proportioned, bronze in color, with flat faces, they were hideous. Had Darwinian theories been in vogue in those days, no doubt Cook would have recognized in them that missing link between man and monkey, which is the despair of Darwin's followers. Their coarse, crinkly black hair was short, and their bushy beards did not add to their beauty. But the one thing which made them most grotesque was their habit of tying a cord tightly across the stomach, which made them appear like great emmets tortoiseshell earrings, bracelets made of hog's teeth, large tortoiseshell rings, and a white flat stone which they passed through the cartilage of their nose constituted their ornaments. Their weapons were bows and arrows, spears and clubs. The points of their arrows, which were occasionally two or three in number, were coated with the substance which the English thought was poisonous, from observing the care which the natives drew them out of a kind of quiver. The resolution had only just left Port Sandwich, when all the crew were seized with colic, vomiting, and violent pains in the head and back. Two large fish had been caught and eaten by them, possibly whilst they were under the influence of the narcotic mentioned above. In every case, ten days elapsed before entire recovery. A parrot and a dog, which had also eaten of the fish, died next day. Quiros' companions had suffered in the same way, and since Cook's voyage, similar symptoms of poisoning have been noticed in these latitudes. After leaving Malikolo, Cook steered for Ambrim Island, which appeared to contain a volcano, and shortly afterwards discovered a group of small islands, which he named Shepherd Islands, in honor of the Cambridge professor of astronomy. He then visited the islands of Two Hills, Montague, Hinchinbrook Islands, and the largest of all, Sandwich Island, which must not be mistaken for the group of the same name. All the islands, lying among and protected by breakers, were covered with rich vegetation and were largely populated. Two slight accidents interrupted the calm on board. A fire broke out, which was soon extinguished, and one of the sailors falling overboard was at once rescued. Coromango was discovered on the 3rd of August. The next day Cook reached its shore, hoping to find a watering place and facility for landing. 
the greater part of the sufferers from the poisonous fish had not yet recovered their health, and they looked forward to its speedy re-establishment on shore. But the reception accorded to them by the natives, who were armed with clubs, lances, and arrows, seemed wanting in sincerity. Cook was on his guard. Finding that they could not lure the English into landing, the natives endeavored to force them. A chief and several men tried to snatch the oars from the sailors. Cook wished to fire his musket, but the priming would not go off. The English were immediately overwhelmed with stones and arrows. The captain at once ordered a general volley. Fortunately, half of the shots missed, or the slaughter would have been terrific. Forster says, these natives appear to be of different race to those living in Malikolo. They speak a different language. They are of medium height, but well shaped, and their features are not disagreeable. They were bronze in complexion, and they paint their faces black or red. Their hair is somewhat woolly and curly. The few women I saw appeared very ugly. I have seen no pirogues on the, any part of the coast. They live in houses covered with palm leaves, and their plantations are in straight lines and are surrounded by a hedge of reeds. It was useless to make a second attempt to land. Cook, having bestowed the name of Cape Trader upon the scene of the collision, reached an island which he had seen the previous evening, and which the natives called Tana. The highest hill of the same range is of conical shape, says Forrester, with a crater in the center. It is reddish-brown and composed of a mass of burnt stones, perfectly sterile. From time to time it emitted a thick column of smoke like a great tree, increasing in width as it ascended. The resolution was at once surrounded by a score of pirogues, the largest of which contained twenty-five men. The latter sought to appropriate everything within their reach, buoys, flags, the hinges of the rudder which they tried to knock off. They only returned to the shore after a four-pounder had been fired over their heads. The vessel made for the shore, but all the trifles that were distributed could not induce the natives to relinquish their attitude of defiance and bravado. It was clear that the smallest misunderstanding would lead to bloodshed. Cook imagined these people to be cannibals, although pigs, fowls, roots, and fruits abounded. During this day, prudence prevented anyone leaving the shore. Forster, however, ventured a little way and discovered a spring of water, so hot that he could not hold his finger in it longer than a second. In spite of all their wishes, the English found it impossible to reach the central volcano, which emitted torrents of fire and smoke as high as the clouds, and projected enormously large stones into the air. The number of extinct volcanoes in every direction was considerable, and the soil was decidedly subject to volcanic eruptions. By degrees, though without losing their reserve, the Tanians became more at home with the strangers, and intercourse was less difficult. These people, says Cook, showed themselves hospitable, civil, and good-hearted, when we did not excite their jealousy. We cannot blame their conduct greatly, for after all, from what point of view can they have judged us? They could not possibly know our real intentions. We entered their country, as they dared not oppose us. We endeavored to disembark as friends, but we landed and maintained our superiority by force of arms. Under such circumstances, what opinion could the natives form of us? it doubtless appeared far more plausible that we came to invade their country than that which we visited them as friends. Time only and intimate relations could teach them our good intentions. However that might be, the English were at a loss to guess why the natives prevented their penetrating to the interior of the country. Was it owing to a naturally shy nature, or possibly because they were threatened with constant inroads from their neighbors? Their address in the use of arms and their bearing supported this idea, but it was impossible to know with any certainty. As the natives did not value anything the English offered, they did not bring any great quantity of fruits and roots the latter longed for. They would not consent to part with their pigs, 
even for hatchets, the utility of which they had proved. The productions of the island included breadfruits, coconuts, a fruit like a peach called pare, yams, potatoes, wild pigs, nutmegs, and many others of which Forrester did not know the names. End of section 18. Recording by Bob Rose. Section 19 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Rose. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 4, Part 2, Captain Cook's Second Voyage, 2B. On the 21st, Cook left Tana, discovered successively Aromam and Anatom Islands, and coasted Sandwich Island. He passed Malikolo and Kiros Land of the Holy Spirit, where he easily recognized St. James and St. Philip Bays, and left the archipelago after having named it New Hebrides, by which appellation it is now known. A new discovery was made on the 5th of September. No European foot had ever trodden the soil he now sighted. It was the northern extremity of New Caledonia. The first point recognized was called Cape Colnet, after one of the volunteers who saw it first. The coast was bordered by a chain of breakers, behind which two or three pirogues appeared to be paddling, so as to reconnoitre the newcomers. But at sunrise they brailed their sails and were seen no more. Having cruised for two hours along the outer reefs, Cook perceived an opening which he thought would enable him to draw near. He steered for it and landed at Balade. The country appeared sterile and uniformly covered with a whitish grass. Some trees with white trunks, like the willow in shape, were seen here and there. They were in the alleys. At the same time, several houses like beehives were perceived. No sooner was anchor cast than fifteen or more pirogues surrounded the vessel. The natives had sufficient confidence to approach and begin traffic. Some of them even entered the ship and inspected all the various parts of it with extreme curiosity. They refused to touch the dishes offered them, stewed peas, beef, and salt pork, but they voluntarily tasted the yams. They were most surprised at the goats, pigs, dogs, and cats, which were so strange to them that they had no words to designate them. Nails, all iron implements, and red stuffs appeared precious to them. Tall, strong, and well-proportioned, with curly hair and beard, and of dark chocolate color, they spoke a language which bore no resemblance to any which the English had hitherto heard. When the captain landed, he was received with joyful demonstrations and with the surprise natural to people who are brought face to face with objects of which they had no previous idea. Some of the chiefs, enjoining silence, made short harangues, and Cook began the usual distribution of ironmongery and hardware. His officers mixed with the crowd to make observations. Many of the natives appeared afflicted with a kind of leprosy, and their arms and legs were greatly swollen. They were all but naked, wearing merely a cord tightened to the figure, from which hung scraps of stuff made from the fig tree. A few wore enormous cylindrical hats, open on two sides, like the hats of the Hungarian hussars. They hung tortoiseshell earrings, or rolls of leaves of the sugar cane in their ears, which were pulled out and split. The English soon perceived a little village above the mangroves, which bordered the shore. It was surrounded by sugar cane plantations, yams and banana trees, and watered by little canals cleverly diverted from the large river. Cook soon discovered that he need expect nothing of this race but permission to survey the country. These natives, he says, 
taught us a few words of their language which bore no resemblance to that of any other tribe. They were mild and peaceable in character, but extremely lazy. If we addressed them, they replied, but if we continued our way, seldom joined us in our excursions. If we passed their cabins without remark, they took no notice of us. The women were slightly more curious, and hid themselves in the bushes to look after us, but they would only approach in the company of the men. They appeared neither vexed nor alarmed when we shot birds. Indeed, if we were near their huts, the young people would point them out to us, for the pleasure of seeing us fire. They appeared to have very little to do at this time of year. Having tilled the ground and sown roots and bananas, they awaited their crops next summer. Perhaps in this fact lay the explanation of their having no provisions to offer in traffic, for in other respects we found them fully alive to the hospitable instinct which more particularly commends the islanders of the South Seas to navigators. Cook's assertion of the indolence of the New Caledonians is perfectly true, but his stay amongst them was too short to enable him to appreciate their character thoroughly, and he certainly never suspected that they indulged in the horrible practice of cannibalism. He noticed no birds living in a wild state there, excepting quails, turtle doves, pigeons, turkeys, ducks, teal, and a few smaller ones. He could not ascertain the presence of any quadrupeds, and he entirely failed in his endeavors to procure provision. At Balade, the captain made several excursions into the interior, and climbed the mountains to gain a general view over the country. From the summit of a rock he clearly saw the two coasts, and ascertained that New Caledonia in this part was only ten leagues in width. In its general features the country resembled various portions of New Holland, which is in the same latitude. The productions of both appear to be the same, and there is an absence of brushwood in the forests of both. Cook also observed the presence of minerals on the hills, and his discovery has been verified in late years by the proved existence of gold, iron, copper, coal, and nickel. A few of the crew met with a similar adventure here to that which had almost been fatal to them in the neighborhood of Malikolo. Cook relates it thus. My secretary brought a fish which had been harpooned by a native and sent it to me on board. This fish was of an entirely new species and resembled that known as sunfish. It was of the order called Tetrodon by Linnaeus. Its head was hideous, wide and long. Never suspecting that it might be poisonous, I ordered it to be served at table the same evening. Fortunately, so much time was consumed in drawing and describing it, that no time was left for the cooking, and only the liver was served. The two foresters and myself partook of it, and towards three in the morning we experienced a sensation of weakness and want of power in our limbs. I all but lost the sense of touch, and could no longer distinguish light from heavy objects when I desired to move them. A pot full of water and a feather appeared to me equally heavy. We first resorted to emetics, and afterwards we succeeded in inducing perspiration, which relieved us greatly. In the morning, a pig which had eaten the entrails of the fish was found dead. When the natives came on board and saw the fish hanging up, they made us understand that it was unwholesome. They showed their disgust of it, but neither in selling it, or even after being paid for it, had they given the slightest hint of such aversion. Cook next proceeded to the survey of the greater part of the eastern coast. During this excursion, he met with a native as white as a European. His complexion was attributed to illness. This man was an albino, like those already met with in Tahiti and the Society Islands. The captain was anxious to acclimatize pigs in New Caledonia, but he had the greatest difficulty in inducing the natives to accept a hog and a sow. He was forced to insist upon their usefulness, the facility of breeding them, and to exaggerate their value before the natives would consent to their being landed. 
Cook describes the New Caledonians as tall, robust, active, polite, and peaceable. He gives them the rare character of honesty. But his successors in this country, more especially Dion Trecasteau, discovered to their detriment that they did not perceive this quality. Some of them had the thick lips, flat nose, and general appearance of the negro. Their naturally curly hair added to the resemblance. If I were to guess, said Cook, at the origin of this people, I should take them to be an intermediate race between the people of Tana and the Friendly Islands, or between those of Tana and New Zealand, or possibly between all three, for their language is in some respects a sort of mixture of that of these different countries. The frequency of war amongst them is indicated by the number of their offensive weapons, clubs, spears, lances, slings, javelins, etc. The stones used for their slings are smooth and oval. Their houses are built on a circular plan, most of them being like beehives, with the roof of considerable height and terminating in a point. They always have one or two fires alight, but as there is only one outlet for the smoke, through the doorway, no European could live in them. They subsided entirely upon fish and roots, such as yams, and the bark of a tree, which was but little succulent. Bananas, sugar canes, and breadfruit were rare and coconuts did not flourish so well as in the island previously visited by the English. The number of inhabitants appeared considerable, but Cook justly remarked that his arrival had brought about a general reunion of all the tribes, and Lieutenant Pickersgill decided during his hydrographical excursions that the country was sparsely populated. The New Caledonians buried their dead. Many of the crew visited their cemeteries, and especially the tomb of a chief, which was a kind of mound decorated with spears, javelins, arrows, and darts, which were stuck around it. Cook left the harbor of Belade and continued to coast New Caledonia without finding fresh provisions. The aspect of the country was universally sterile, but quite to the south of this large land, a smaller one was discovered, to which the name of Pine Island was given, on account of the number of pine trees upon it. They were a species of Prussian pine, very appropriate for the spars needed for the resolution. Cook accordingly sent a sloop and some men to choose and cut the trees he needed. Some of them were twenty inches in diameter and seventy feet high, so that a mast could have been formed of one had it been needed. The discovery of this island had a certain value, as, with the exception of New Zealand, it was the only one in the entire Pacific Ocean which produced wood fit for masts and poles. In steering southward toward New Zealand, Cook sighted a small uninhabited island on the 10th of October, upon which the botanists reaped a plentiful harvest of unknown vegetables. It was Norfolk Island, so named in honor of the Howard family. It was afterwards colonized by a part of the mutineers of the bounty. The resolution anchored again in Queen Charlotte's Sound. The gardens so anxiously planted by the English had been entirely neglected by the New Zealanders. But in spite of this, several plants had grown marvelously. The natives were very shy of appearing at first, and seemed to care little for any intercourse with the strangers. But when they recognized their old friends, they testified their delight most extravagantly. When asked why they had been so reserved at first, they evaded a reply, and there was no doubt that they were thinking of murder and combats. This aroused Cook's apprehensions for the fate of the adventure, of which he had heard nothing since his last stay in port, but he could obtain no reply to the questions he put. He was only to learn what had occurred in his absence when he reached the Cape of Good Hope and found letters from Captain Furneaux. After once more landing some pigs, with which he wished to endow New Zealand, the captain set sail for Cape Horn on the 10th of November. After a vain cruise, he at last sighted the eastern shore of Tierra del Fuego, near the entrance to the Straits of Magellan. The portion of America which now met our view, says Cook, was dreary enough. 
it seemed to be cut up into small islands which though by no means high were very black and almost entirely barren in the background we saw high ground covered with snow almost to the water's edge it is the wildest shore i have ever seen and appears entirely composed of mountains and rocks without a vestige of vegetation the mountains overhang horrible precipices the sharp peaks of which arise to great height probably there is nothing in nature which prevents so wild an appearance the interior mountains are covered with snow but those bordering the sea are not we imagine the former to belong to tierra del fuego and the latter to be ranged over small islands in such a way as to present the appearance of an uninterrupted coast the captain still thought it better to remain some time in this desolate region to procure fresh victuals for his crew he found safe anchorage in christmas sound where as usual he made a careful hydrographical survey several birds were shot and mr pickersgill brought three hundred seagulls eggs and fourteen geese on board i was thus enabled says cook to distribute them to the entire crew a fact which gave the greater satisfaction as it was near christmas without this timely supply they must have contented themselves with beef and salt pork some of the natives belonging to the nation called pecherice by bougainville came on board without any pressing cook's description of these savages recalls that of the french explorer they preferred the oily portions of the flesh of the seals upon which they lived a taste which cook attributed to the fact that the oil warmed their blood and enabled them to resist the intense cold if he adds the superiority of a civilized to a savage life could ever be called in question a single glance at one of these indians would be sufficient to settle the question until it is proved that a man perpetually tortured by the rigor of climate is happy i shall never give in to the eloquent declamations of those philosophers who have never had the opportunity of observing human nature in all its phases or who have not felt what they have seen the resolution at once set sail and doubled cape horn the strait of la mer was then crossed and staten island reconnoitred here a good anchorage was found quantities of whales abound in these latitudes it was now their pairing season and seals and sea lions penguins and garnets appeared in shoals dr sparman and myself says forster narrowly escaped being attacked by one of these sea monsters upon a rock where several of them were assembled appearing to wait the upshot of the struggle the doctor had fired at a bird and stooped to pick it up when the sea lion growled and showing his tusks seemed disposed to attack my companion from where i was posted i shot the animal stark dead and at the report of my gun the herd seeing their companion fall fled along the coast several of them threw themselves into the sea with such haste that they jumped ten or fifteen roods straight upon the pointed rocks but i do not think they hurt themselves much for their skin is very hard and their fat is so elastic that it is easily compressed after leaving staten island cook set sail on the third of january for the southeast to explore the only part of the ocean which had hitherto escaped him he soon reached southern georgia seen in sixteen seventy five by la roche and again by m gaillot du clos in seventeen fifty six when in command of the spanish vessel the leon this discovery was made on the fourteenth of january seventeen seventy five the captain landed in three places and took possession in the name of king george the third of england bestowing his name upon the newly found country possession bay is bordered by pointed rocks of ice exactly similar to those which had been met with in the high southern latitudes the interior of the country says the narrative is no less savage and frightful the summits of the rocks are lost in the clouds and the valleys are covered with perpetual snow not a tree or even the smallest shrub is to be seen 
After leaving Georgia, Cook penetrated further to the southeast amidst floating ice. The continual dangers of the voyage overcame the crew. Southern Thule, Saunders Island, and Chandelure Islands, and finally Sandwich Island were discovered. These Stur Island deserted archipelagos have no value for the merchant or geographer. Once certain of their existence, it was unnecessary to remain, for to do so was to risk in exploring them the valuable records the resolution was taking to England. Cook was convinced by the discovery of these isolated islands, quote, that nearer the pole there is a stretch of land where the greater part of the floating ice spread over this vast southern ocean is formed. End quote. This ingenious theory has been confirmed in every particular by the explorers of the 19th century. After another fruitless search for Cape Circumcision, mentioned by Bouvet, Cook decided to regain the Cape of Good Hope, and he arrived there on the 22nd of March, 1775. The adventure had put into this port, where Captain Furneaux had left a letter relating all that had happened in New Zealand. Captain Furneaux arrived in Queen Charlotte Sound, on the 13th of November, 1773, and took in wood and water. He then sent one of his boats under Lieutenant Rowe to gather edible plants. As the lieutenant did not return on board either in the evening or the next morning, Captain Furneaux, feeling sure that an accident had happened, went in search of him. The following is a short account of what he learned. After various useless searchings, the officer in command of the sloop came upon some traces as he landed upon the shore near Grass Creek. Portions of a boat and some shoes, one of which had belonged to an officer of the watch, were found. A sailor, at the same time, noticed a piece of fresh meat, which was taken to be the flesh of a dog, for it was not known then that the people of this place were cannibals. We opened, said Furneaux, about eight baskets which we found on the beach, tightly corded. Some were full of roast flesh, and others of roots used by the natives for bread. Continuing our search, we found more shoes, and a hand which we recognized as that of Thomas Hill, because T.H. was tattooed upon it in the Tahitan fashion. At a short distance, an officer perceived four pirogues and a number of natives assembled round a large fire. The English landed and fired a regular volley, which put the Zealanders to flight, with the exception of two, who left with the greatest sang Freud. One of them was severely wounded, and the sailors advanced up the beach. A frightful scene was soon presented before our eyes. We saw the heads, hearts, and lungs of many of the crew upon the sands, and at a little distance dogs were devouring the entrails. The officer had not a sufficient force with him, being backed by only ten men, to meet this fearful massacre with fitting vengeance. The weather, too, became bad, and the savages collected in large numbers. It was necessary to regain the adventure. I do not believe, says Captain Furneaux, that this butchery was premeditated on the part of the natives, for in the morning Mr. Rowe said that he observed two vessels pass us and remain all the forenoon in sight of the ship. The bloodshed was most likely the result of a quarrel which was instantly fought out, or possibly as our men took no measures for their own safety, their want of caution tempted the Indians. The natives, having heard one discharge, were encouraged by observing that a gun was not an infallible instrument, that it sometimes missed fire, and that once fired it was necessary to reload before firing again. In this fearful ambuscade, the adventure lost ten of her best sailors. Furneaux left New Zealand on the 23rd of December, 1773, doubled Cape Horn, and put into the Cape of Good Hope, and reached England on the 14th of July, 1774. 
After Cook had taken in provisions and repaired his vessel, he left False Bay on the 27th of May, put into St. Helena, Ascension Island, and Fernando de Noronha at Fayal, one of the Azores, and finally at Plymouth on the 29th of July, 1775. During his voyage of three years and eighteen days, he had only lost four men, that is to say, without reckoning the ten sailors who were massacred at New Zealand. No former expedition had reaped such a harvest of discoveries and hydrographical, physical, and ethnological observations. The learned and ingenuous investigations pursued by Cook elucidated many of the difficulties of earlier navigators. He made various important discoveries, amongst others, that of New Caledonia and Easter Island. The non-existence of an Antarctic continent was definitely ascertained. The great navigator received the fitting reward of his labors almost immediately. He was nominated ship's captain nine days after his landing, and was elected a member of the Royal Society of London on the 29th of February, 1776. End of section 19 Recording by Bob Rose Section 20 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 5, Part 1. Captain Cook's Third Voyage, 1A. Search for the lands discovered by the French. Kerguelen Islands. Stay at Van Diemen's Land. Queen's Charlotte's Strait. Palmerston Island. Great Rejoicings in the Tonga Islands. At this date, the idea which had sent so many explorers to Greenland was in full force. The question of the existence of a northern passage between the Atlantic and the Pacific, by way of the Asiatic or American coasts, was eagerly discussed. And should such a passage exist, was it practicable for ships? The attempt had quite lately been made to discover this outlet in Hudson or Baffin Bays, and it was now determined to seek it in the Pacific. The task was an arduous one. The lords of the admiralty felt that it was essential to send out a navigator who had experience of the dangers of the polar seas, and one who had shown presence of mind in the face of danger, one, moreover, whose talents, experience, and scientific knowledge might be of use in the powerful equipment then in course of preparation. In Captain Cook alone were all the requisite qualities to be found. The command was offered to him, and although he might have passed the remainder of his days in peace at his post in the Greenwich Observatory, in the full enjoyment of the honour and glory he had gained by his two voyages round the world, he did not hesitate for a moment. Two ships, the Resolution and the Discovery, were placed under his command. The latter was under the orders of Captain Clerk, and the equipment of both was similar to that of the last expedition. The instructions given to the commander of the expedition enjoined his reaching the Cape of Good Hope and steering south in search of the islands recently discovered by the French in 48 degrees of latitude towards the meridian of the island of Mauritius. He was then to touch at New Zealand, if he thought well, to take in refreshments at the Society Islands and to land the Tahitan Mai there, then to proceed to New Albion to avoid landing in any of the Spanish possessions in America and from thence to make his way by the Arctic Ocean to Hudson and Baffin Bays. In other words, he was to look in an easterly direction for the northwest passage. This once effected, after a stay at Kamchatka, he was to make another attempt to reach England by the route he might judge most productive of good results for geography and navigation. The two vessels did not start together. The resolution set sail from Plymouth on the 12th of July, 1776, and was rejoined at the Cape of Good Hope by the Discovery on the 10th of the following November, she having left England only on the 1st of August. 
the two ships were detained at the cape until the thirtieth of november by the repairs needed by the discovery much damaged by tempest she required caulking the captain profited by this long delay to buy livestock which he intended to land at tahiti and new zealand and also to stock his vessels with the necessary stores for a two years voyage after steering southwards for twenty days two islands were discovered in forty six degrees fifty three minutes south latitude and thirty seven degrees forty six minutes east longitude the strait which separates them was crossed and it was found that their steep sterile coasts were uninhabited they had been discovered with four others from nine to twelve degrees further east by the french captains marion du fresne and crozet in seventeen seventy two on the twenty fourth of december cook found the islands which m de kerguelen had surveyed in his two voyages of seventeen seventy two and seventeen seventy three we will not here relate the observations made by cook upon this group as they agree in every particular with those of m de kerguelen we can reserve them until we relate the adventures of that navigator and content ourselves with remarking that cook surveyed the coasts carefully and left them on the thirty first of december the vessels were enveloped in a thick fog which accompanied them for more than three hundred leagues anchor was cast in adventure bay in van diemen's land on the twenty sixth of january it was the same spot at which captain furneaux had touched four years later the english were visited by a few natives who received the presents offered to them without showing any satisfaction the narrative says they were of ordinary height but rather slightly built their skin was black and their hair of the same color and as woolly as that of the negroes of new guinea but they had not the thick lips or flat noses of african negroes there was nothing disagreeable in their features and their eyes struck us as beautiful so did their teeth but they were very dirty most of them anointed their hair and beards with a yellow ointment and some even rubbed their faces with the same stuff concise as this account is it is not the less valuable the race of tasmanians is extinct the last of them died a few years ago cook weighed anchor on the thirtieth of january and took up his station at his usual point in queen charlotte's strait the vessels were soon surrounded by pirogues but not a single native ventured to go on board they were so fully persuaded that the english had come to avenge their murdered comrades once convinced that the english had no such intentions they banished their mistrust and reserve the captain soon found out by my interpretation he understanding the zealand language the right cause of this terrible catastrophe it appeared that the english had been seated on the grass taking their evening meal when the natives committed several thefts one of them was caught and struck by a sailor at his cry his companions rushed upon the sailors of the adventure who killed two of them but unfortunately succumbed to numbers several of the zealanders pointed out to cook the chief who had directed the carnage and urged cook to kill him but to the great surprise of the natives and the stupefaction of mai the captain refused mai remarked in england they kill a man who assassinates another this fellow killed ten and you take no revenge before he left cook landed pigs and goats hoping that these animals might at length become acclimatized to new zealand mai had a wish to take a new zealander to tahiti two offered to go and cook agreed to receive them warning them at the same time that they would never see their native land again but no sooner had the vessels lost sight of the shores of new zealand than they began to weep sea-sickness added to their distress but as they recovered from it their sadness disappeared and they soon attached themselves to their new friends an island named mangea was discovered on the twenty ninth of march at mai's representations the inhabitants decided to come on board small but vigorous and well proportioned they wore their hair knotted upon the top of the head they wore long beards and were tattooed in all parts of their bodies cook could not carry out his earnest wish to land as the people were too hostile a new island similar to the last was discovered four leagues further on the natives appeared more friendly than those of mangea and cook profited by this fact and landed a detachment under lieutenant gore with mai as interpreter anderson the naturalist an officer named barnes and mai landed alone and unarmed running the risk of being maltreated 
they were received with solemnity and conducted through a crowd of men with clubs on their shoulders to the presence of three chiefs whose ears were adorned with red feathers they soon perceived a score of women who danced in a grave and serious fashion paying no attention to their arrival the officers were separated from each other and observing that the natives hastened to empty their pockets they began to entertain fears for their safety when mai reappeared they were detained all day and forced several times to take their clothes off and allow the natives to examine the color of their skin but night arrived at last without the occurrence of any disagreeable incident the visitors regained their sloop and coconuts bananas and other provisions were brought to them the english may have owed their safety to the description mai had given of the power of their weapons and the experiment he made before them of setting fire to a cartridge mai had recognized three of his fellow countrymen in the crowd on the beach these tahitans had started in a pirogue to reach ulitea island and had been driven out of their course by contrary winds as they expected a short voyage they had not provided themselves with food famine and fatigue had reduced their number to four men all of them half dead when the pirogue capsized the unfortunate wretches managed to seize the side of their boat and support themselves in the water until they were picked up by the inhabitants of this island waterloo it was now twelve years since fate threw them upon this shore more than two hundred leagues from their native island they had contracted family ties and friendly alliances with these people whose manners and language were not unlike their own they refused to return to tahiti cook says we may find in this incident a better explanation of the way in which detached portions of the globe and particularly the islands of the pacific have been peopled than in any other theories especially in regard to those which are far from any other continent and at a great distance from each other waterloo island is situated in twenty degrees one minute south latitude and two hundred and one degree forty five minutes east longitude the two vessels afterwards reached a neighboring island called wenoa upon which m gore landed to get fodder although the ruins of houses and tents were seen it was uninhabited on the fifth of april cook arrived in sight of harvey island which he had discovered during his second voyage in seventeen seventy three at this time it appeared to him deserted he was therefore astonished to see several pirogues leave the shore and approach the ships but the natives could not find courage to go on board their fierce appearance and noisy offers did not promise well for their friendly intentions their language was still more like that of tahiti than that of the last island they had visited lieutenant king was sent in search of good anchorage but could not succeed in finding a suitable harbor the natives armed with spears and clubs appeared disposed to resent any attempts at landing cook in his great need of wood and water determined to reach the friendly islands he was sure of finding refreshments for his men and forage for his beasts there the season was too far advanced and the distance between these latitudes and the pole too great to allow of anything being attempted in the southern hemisphere the wind obliged him to relinquish his idea of reaching middleborough or eoa as he had at first intended he therefore directed his course towards palmerston island where he arrived on the fourteenth of april and where he found birds in abundance scurvy grass and coconuts this island was merely a collection of nine or ten islets very slightly raised appearing almost like the points of reefs belonging to one coral bank the english reached comango island on the twenty eighth of april and the natives brought them quantities of coconuts bananas and other stores they then proceeded to anamoka which is also part of the tonga or friendly archipelago on the sixth of may a chief of tonga tobou named finaou visited cook he called himself king of all the friendly islands i received says cook a present from this great personage of two fish which were brought to me by one of his servants i paid him a visit after dinner he came to meet me as soon as he saw me land he appeared some thirty years of age tall and of slender form and i have met no countenance in these islands so european in type when all the provisions of this island were exhausted cook visited a group of islets called hapae where his reception was friendly owing to the orders given by finaou and where he procured pigs water fruits and roots 
some of the native warriors exhibited their skills in various singular combats with clubs and boxing what most surprised us says the narrative was to see two great women enter the lists and attack each other with their fists without the least ceremony and with as much skill as the men their fight lasted about half a minute when one of them declared herself beaten the victorious heroine received as much applause from the assembled multitude as is usually accorded to a man who has overcome his rival by his skill and address there was no cessation of the fetes and games a dance was executed to the sound of two drums or rather of two hollow trunks by a hundred and five performers supported by a vocal choir cook reciprocated these demonstrations by putting his soldiers through their artillery exercises and letting off fireworks which produced indescribable astonishment in the minds of the natives not wishing to be outdone in the attempt at display the natives gave a concert and then a dance executed by twenty women crowned with china roses this magnificent ballet was followed by another performance by fifteen men but we shall never end if we attempt to give an account of the wonders of this enthusiastic reception it justly gained for the tonga archipelago the name of friendly islands on the twenty third finao who had represented himself as king of the entire archipelago came to inform cook of his departure for the neighboring island of vavao he had excellent reasons for this as he had just heard of the arrival of the real sovereign named futta faih or Paulahu. cook at first refused to recognize the newcomer in this character but he soon had irrefutable proof that the title of king belonged to him Paulaho was extremely stout which with his short height made him look like a barrel if rank is proportioned to size in these islands he was without exception the greatest chief the english had met with intelligent grave and dignified he examined the vessel and everything that was new to him in detail put judicious questions and inquired into the motives of the arrival of these vessels his followers objected to his descending below decks saying that it was taboo and that it was not allowed for any one to walk over his head cook however promised through the interpreter mai that no one should be allowed to walk over his cabin and so paulaho dined with the captain he ate little and drank still less and invited cook to land with him the marks of respect lavished upon paulaho by all the natives convinced cook that he had been entertaining the real sovereign of the archipelago End of section twenty.